All right, I'm going to mute everybody if that is okay. Okay. Morning, everybody. Thank you so much for joining on a Saturday morning. I appreciate very, I appreciate it very, very much. My name is Dr. Ishani Rao, and I will be your host for today of a brilliant, hopefully, a brilliant conference called Conversations in Conservation. So this um, project has been brewing for a couple of months and I've been approaching people um, internationally to see if people could showcase some of their projects. And we do have an array of incredible speakers today. There's about eight people speaking in half an hour slots. So that will be um, the setup of today. We've got Mr. Cox starting at 10. So about eight minutes. So I'll give you a little bit of preamble um, and a bit of a intro as to how the day will run. So yes, thank you so much for joining. I appreciate that everybody is so busy on a Saturday as it's coming up to summer. Everybody's got their own projects and jobs. So any time that you can give today um, is much appreciated. Uh, all of the money that we're donating and fundraising today will be going to Steve Allnott's project, which is the Sussex Seabed Restoration Project. If this goes well today um, and we can manage to pull this off, then I do hope to make it a more regular thing. I think that education is the way forward. Anything that we can do to showcase other people's projects and to get people involved and to make this really accessible and inclusive um, is exactly what I want to do. So let's get the day started. So this is a bit about me. My name is Dr. Rao. I am a final year NHS GP trainee. I trained at King's College London and qualified in 2017. Since then, I found my calling, which is conservation and humanitarian medicine. I'm a conservation scuba diver with a small charity called Buckets of Love, and we do fun things like this. I'm also a regular author for Vegan Food and Living magazine. So if anybody wants any of my articles, um, then please just ask. I write some about mental health, about sustainability different bits and bobs like that. So my passion is in the sea and I hope to move towards uh, creating artificial reefs alongside my job as a GP. So these are some of the organizations that I work with and work for and I'm really proud to support. So here we've got plant-based health professionals and the founder is gonna do a talk today. Worldly Wise is an amazing mentoring scheme. Ecomedics does brilliant sustainability projects across the NHS. And I'm also a spokesperson for Doctors for Extinction Rebellion and will be uh, attending their meetings in the next couple of weeks. So that's coming up in April. Some of the previous talks that I've done are 10 talks now for the NHS about sustainability in the workplace. I also speak regularly at Vegan Camp Out, which is an incredible, I think the biggest vegan uh, festival in the world. I do talks for Ecomedics as well. And I've spoken at a few animal sanctuaries and retreats and I can't wait for the summer because we've got a few more talks coming up with them. So these are a few of my dates. If anybody wants to join, um, the more company, the better. And all of these events are open to the public. We've got um, VegFest Brighton, which is also a huge festival coming up at the end of Brighton. I think at the end of um, April in Brighton. I think the tickets are actually free this year, which is absolutely amazing because it's a brilliant event. We've got National Animal Rights Day and um, the retreat, which is an incredible animal sanctuary in Ashford. So I'm really happy to be speaking back there this year. And then I've got a couple of more uh, professional clinical talks coming up at Health Education England later in the year. Today's speakers. OK, so who have we got today? Let me pull up. I've got a couple of bios which I've written down and I'll just run through people really quickly. So we've got already here starting in a couple of minutes is I'm sure he's going to tell you a whole lot better than I do is the wonderful Leif Cox, who is the founder of the Orangutan Project, which is a non-profit registered Australian organization which raises funds to support the conservation and protection of orangutans and the preservation and rehab of their forest habitats. So I'm really, really excited about that talk because I know he's been out on adventures in the field recently. So I can't wait to hear about that. 
Dr. Shireen Kassam, who's a consultant hematologist and lecturer at King's College Hospital. She's a certified lifestyle medicine physician and is passionate about promoting the benefits of a plant-based lifestyle for the, for the prevention of chronic disease. She's the founder of Plant-Based Health Professionals, whose mission it is to provide evidence-based education on healthy plant-based diets. We've then got Luke, Luke Marsh, who's a long-term volunteer at Sardana Forest, which is a reforestation project and sustainable living community with a focus on reforestation, water conservation, and food management in Auroville in Tamil Nadu. They also do amazing work in Kenya and Haiti. Then we have Carlos Mayo Molina, who I met a few years ago when we were building artificial reefs in Thailand, and they've got an incredible setup there. It's going super well. So he's a conservation scuba diver with a background in engineering, and he's the founder of InOceana, a global marine conservation organization that preserves the ocean for future generations by empowering coastal communities through access to education. And we've got the wonderful Margaret Clotworthy, who I actually met at Jane Goodall's event relatively recently. She's the founder of the rabbit rescue sanctuary Tanglewood Warren, but she's also a human tissue biologist. She's the founder and CEO of Biobanks for Human Tissues, which are invaluable resources for pharmaceutical research and provide information about disease pathophysiology. Then we have me doing a bit of a talk about activist mental health. And it's actually a talk that I did recently for Animal Rebellion, and I plan to do it for PETA and for Viva as well. Um, but I've adapted it to make it for all sorts of activists and environmentalists and people um, who are interested in uh, promoting environmental sustainability. So I hope to just give you some of my knowledge that I've learned during my time in psychiatry and um, as a doctor with a specialist interest in mental health. And we've got a bit of a break, but I'm gonna stick around. So if anybody wants to stay and chat or has any questions or just wants to talk about their projects or has any ideas, then I'll be there from one to 1.30. And we've got one of my best friends, Patty Grills, who's a freelance book editor with a special interest, I quote, in children's books, archaeology, concrete and fat pets. She's manager of BT Batsford Bookshop, which is a gorgeous independent East London bookshop specialising in textile, arts, crafts, architecture and design, heritage and chess. Then we have the lovely Dominic Thompson. He's one of my old flatmates, and he's also a Berlin-based environmental manager at the German Federal Criminal Police Office with a background in hospitality and sustainability. He's previously done international work and research in ecotourism. Then last but not least, we have the wonderful Steve Allnut, who was described last week by The Guardian as the NHS worker single-handedly rewilding kelp forests in Sussex. Originally a physiotherapist, Steve has taken on the responsibility of regrowing kelp and planting it back onto the seabeds using his own incredible and unique system, which I hope we will be able to have a look at today. And we will be wrapping up the day with a chat about buckets of love, our current projects, our future projects and how you can get involved. And please go ahead and donate today because all of the money is going towards uh, rewilding the Sussex coast and Steve is doing an incredible job. So anything that we can do to try and help um, his individual efforts would be absolutely incredible. So any, any donation, as much or as little as you like, I can greatly appreciate, but if you can't, then don't worry. And please just join for the free education. And thank you so much. With that, shall I hand it over to Mr. Cox? Hello. Hi. How are you? How are you going? Good, thank you. Good. Okay, I'm going to try to share share my slides. I'm not a native to um, Zoom, um, so I'll see how I go. Post the disabled attendee screen sharing. There we go. First hurdle. <laughs> <laughs> no, don't worry. I'm an absolute technophobe, so this is all new for me. So anything that we can do is brilliant. Let's call this the trial run. <laughs> okay, okay. Uh, still disabling my sharing. So I'm just pressing screen share down at the bottom. Yes. Yeah, yeah. Let's see if I can do anything else. Or mm -hmm. Do you want to just email that over to me? I've, I've emailed it to you, actually. Oh, yes. So you, sh you should have it in the inbox. Perfect. Let me um, grab that. Just in case. I'm just going to have to obviously 
give you the verbal signal, I guess. Yeah, sure absolutely fine. Let me pull that up. But it certainly um, might work getting somebody in the background to solve the issue for the future. Um, um, yeah, that's fine. Yes. Where are you currently at the moment? Are you settled back? Uh, I'm in Perth. Um, yeah, okay. So I came back, came back from Sumatra last week. Lovely. And what were you doing there? Um, I was in Boca Tikapula, which which is an area I'll um, I'll just touch on yeah. um, a little bit in the in the quick presentation, um, where we're trying to preserve a two hundred thousand hectare ecosystem and re-establish a population of orangutans that went extinct in the eighteen thirties. They went extinct in the eighteen thirties. Mm. Wow, mm. what are your methods yeah. with that? I mean, I'm sure you're going to tell us about it, but just while this mm -hmm. loads, um, how did you find it? Was that was there positive engagement? Oh, look, it, it's like cons all conservation. It's, it's a real mixed bag, you know, between complete disaster to, yeah. you know, you know, wonderful um, things which are happening. And so it's, it's a matter of dealing and managing, you know, that whole range of, of things. Um, across conservation, but also even in particular areas. Yeah, yeah. People must, um, it must all be very new to people that are, uh, that are native there and that are living there, but I guess people are understanding more about the importance of conservation now, so might be more, more open to it. I, I hope so, but it's, it's a slow process to change people's view. Yeah. Um, yeah. Even a realization or understanding or acceptance of conservation and things like climate change, it doesn't mean action is immediately because you know as humans we have a huge capacity for cognitive dissonance, ignoring or, you know, or modifying information to meet our pre-existing ideas. Yes, um, and and of course a, a vast capacity for hypocrisy. Um, yes, is, you know, one of the stages humans often will have to go through to get to action. Yeah, and it's so difficult. I mean, I think it's really, uh, my, the presentation is just downloading now, but I think it's really well touched on in the documentary um, Racing Extinction that talks about how to mm -hmm. make it more culturally congruent rather than us just coming and putting our ideas and just engaging with people to find out what would benefit them as well, um, rather than just coming in and saying, you know, this is what we need to do. It's, it's finding that balance, isn't it? Mm -hmm. Okay, play from start. Let's me. Okay. I think you can see my screen again now. Uh, yep, there you go. Perfect. Perfect, thank you. That's all right. Okay, dokey. Well, I guess that's just the um, beginning slide. So we're already kind of introduced. So um, we'll, we'll, we'll move straight on. And I'm grateful to be here. Just tell you just quickly about the orangutan project. It's actually the parent organization is Wildlife Conservation International. And our main project in 1998 was the orangutan project. But as I say, orangutans may be the center of my love, but not the boundary. And the mission was always to bring all the other biodiversity, other megafauna and humans but in indigenous communities through this extinction crisis. But we found out that not all were being able to fit under the umbrella of orangutan conservation, i.e. we didn't have to start a squirrel project or a gibbon project, um, but the elephants and tigers needed specific action. Um, and also the people did need specific action um, to support the indigenous communities. So we started the International Tiger, International Elephant Project and Frost for People to bring the conservation of all the beings that we um, care to um, conserve uh, and help in the rainforest ecosystems under the one umbrella. Um, next slide. And to do this, we, we, we have... Um, created and, um, and with many joint companies and foundations with other organizations. So we seek to work with partners rather than go alone because we're far more um, effective together and we can be far more efficient. So this is just some of the joint organizations and companies that we um, work with um, and have founded to affect the meaningful conservation outcomes. Next slide. 
and we have oh, and we have many partners uh, yeah and so again it's not about us we we don't want to start another project and compete and get another and me sit here and tell you that my project's better than their projects we give to me because it's more important that's not the way to achieve meaningful action so we will partner with all bona fide organizations to achieve the outcome and this is um some of the great organizations we partner with to make that meaningful change on the ground next yeah. But some organizations can be just doing good work that um, if they weren't doing it, we'd probably want to do it ourselves to complete the, the whole um, ecosystem of a conservation action. And so these are the list of the organizations um, that we, we actually um, provide funding for under contracts to, to provide meaningful, accountable conservation action. Next slide. And just very briefly, um, it's just to tell a little bit about myself. Um, that seems to be always a, a requirement with these things. I've had the privilege of working for 30 years with orangutans, um, raising them, being them with the, at the birth, I'm just caring for them when they're sick, um, breeding them, and eventually um, taking them all the way from birth all the way to uh, being free in a while again. But the main a point of is that um, although I've had the privilege of um, being very working closely with these self-aware persons, the most intelligent beings that show our planet, it may not necessarily be the most important work that we do. All the other fundraisers, accountants, um, rangers, veterinarians, technicians, and so many other people use all our different skills um, to contribute to this outcome. I just had the privilege of um, known these beautiful um, beings and being able to communicate that um, um, to people like yourselves. Thank you. Next slide. So our vision is that one day all orangutans will live in the wild in secure viable populations. Uh, and we, we're intending to save each of the different species and subspecies because we don't believe self-aware persons such as elephants and orangutans do do well in captivity, they don't, just as we don't do well in captivity. And also conservation of megafauna in zoos is not possible despite the rhetoric. Um, so it may be difficult to save them in the um, wild, but it's impossible in captivity. So for those reasons, welfare and conservation is about saving um, the populations, but we only got the next 10 years to do that. And I'm not saying there's not gonna be rainforest in 10 years, nor am I saying there's not gonna be lots of rain tanks in 10 years. But if we don't do what we need to do in the next 10 years, the rainforest will not be big enough to sustain itself and it will collapse um, to, yeah, to the feedback loops and the orangutan populations will be too small fragmented to survive. Next slide. Yeah, so I actually plan that the main game is secure up to eight ecosystems that are right type shape inside the rainforest. And that's all very important. You just can't conserve any rainforest. And, and um, to bring all the types of orangutans and all the other biodiversity indigenous communities through the extinction crisis. And I'll explain that a bit further now. Next slide. Yeah. And so, yeah. So when I mean um, right type, shape and size, I mean, th there's kind of two reasons often um, governments will um, conserve um, areas and forests. And it's really for water catchment and it's not really viable to put a, a monoculture on it, such as palm oil or pulp paper or rubber because it's too hilly. But orangutans, tigers and elephants and indigenous communities need the lowland forests to, to survive. So unless we can secure the lowland forest before it's too late, and it's all been logged before, it's not primary forest anymore, secure it and restore it, they will all go extinct, including the indigenous population will, will lose their native lands and culture. Next slide. Yeah. Just a quick look, this is the orangutan distribution. And the first thing you, um, you want to uh, just point out is, yes, it, it is slowly disappearing. So we've had a huge destruction, uh, especially over the last 20 years. So now 80% of orangutans, tigers and elephants live, have, have lost their habitat, live outside of protected areas. Yeah. Um, in fragmented populations. So only 20% live in protected areas. And so they're fighting for 
survival in the lowland secondary forests, which we need to conserve before too, too late. Next slide. Now, unfortunately, there isn't an orangutan. There's actually three species of orangutans. And, the, and the, for example, and the Borneo orangutans are divided up into several subspecies. And these subspecies really matter because they've become adapted to particular environments. So just saying the generic orangutan is not work. They can't interbreed and produce successful young between different species. And subspecies really matter because they have genetic adaptations to their particular forest and all the forests are not the same. So this is why we have to save up to eight ecosystems before too late in order to make sure all these species and subspecies that can survive the genetic units can survive the extinction crisis. And next slide. Yeah. And just to um, focus down to, to make a point, this is East Kalimantan, the area for the Pongo Pigmas Morio Bornean subspecies. Now, the very large area on the, on the top um, right of your screen, um, you see, well, there must be lots of orangutans there, but that's the site of the, one of the largest um, open cut coal mines destroying forests for low-grade coal. That's stupid upon stupid, of course, in, 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 in what that, that's what they're doing. So there's very few orangutans there, fragmented in a small patch of the forest, and they will all be killed um, over time and, uh, and eventually go extinct. Um, in, this, in the south, north, uh, sorry, in the south um, west, you can see a, an area there, and that's Kutai National Park. Now, it's just below the, the minimum 2,000 orangutans we, we target to, to have a viable population, about 1,200, 1,500 orangutans there. And we want to protect that. Um, but some of the climate change models are showing these lowland coastal peat swamps where orangutans exist in the highest numbers will be inundated by sea level and destroyed. So just conserving those lowland peat swamp areas may not be the, the best case scenario. We have to do something more to that. You see other fragmented areas, but they also represent areas where orangutans are existing, um, but not in viable numbers and eventually go extinct. And if not, because of the edge effect, the poaching and the, and the um, effect of people and on a very small fragmented forest will eventually be killed as our experience. So the area in the middle there, in, in basically in the northeast, is the Busong ecosystem, which um, we are now trying to conserve um, an ecosystem uh, to, of the right type, shape and size of rainforest to um, protect the remaining orangutans there, but it's not a viable population, it's too small, and, and then reintroduce those orangutans and create this arc of um, biodiversity and Pongo Pig and Mario to, um, to prevent the extinction of the subspecies. Next slide. And this just focuses a little bit further down into that ecosystem. So we have um, just leased um, 200,000 hectares. We, we have joined our partner, PP Roy, which has another 50,000 hectares. We have the highland area, the highland, which you know, the, the government conserves the, the hills, which are not the best for orangutans or any of the wildlife, but it connects it. And then we have a community forest. And so we're piecing together and, we, and um, developing a, a conservation strategy to save the orangutans in a 700,000 hectare to 800,000 hectare ecosystem. It's about 780,000 hectares. And then um, to supplement the remaining population there to provide a genetic viability, we're rescuing the other Pongo Pigamos Mori and they're going to be released in this area to secure a viable um, population in this area. Next slide. Yeah, and, and this, this is just a picture of the wonderful um, team there um, who are helping rescue those orangutans, which are in isolated packs of forest and, and are going to be killed. Um, rehabilitation, quarantine, health checks, and then eventually released at our, the release site there. Next slide. As another example of what we're doing, just give an ex a piece together that the conversation that I'm trying to put together. This is a Book of Tigapula ecosystem, which I um, were mentioning earlier in the chat. And this is one we've been working for some time. The, again, the, the, the national park, which is a dark green area, is all the hills. In fact, Book of Tigapula virtually actually meant 30 hills. However, 
uh, that alone, um, the orangutans can't survive um, because they need a lowland river run for us for long-term survival. So our joint company, PT Allen Booker Tigapula with WWF Indonesia and Frankfurt Zoological Society had leased the, the light green areas. Um, we're working um, with the local um, forestry department and Frankfurt Zoological Society to conserve the area to the east of the park. Um, Michelin um, tires have logged and destroyed the whole area to the south there you see in the pink and actually cynically is selling it off to the green rubber as a conservation effort after they destroyed the whole area and, and removed the indigenous communities. That's how, that's how cynical these companies are. They, they not only destroy the environment, but they sell it to us as, as green. But we want to put enough pressure on them um, to them to re-release an area there. And I'll explain why we want that area particularly released, not only for lowland, but for other reasons. Um, next slide. Yeah, and this gives you the whole ecosystem area. Um, focus, let's go next slide, we're right about the time. And yeah, and this just focuses on one of those areas and um, it just shows you the areas which, um, the yellow areas got um, burnt in the 2015 fires. you might have heard of those, and they're just being regenerated and recovering, that's fine. Um, the red areas, uh, basically deforestation from the indigenous community, the Talat Mullet community already practicing slash and burn agriculture. And we're also looking after here the, the area for a rang member, the hunter gatherers that live in this area. Now and the point I want to make here is the Talat Mullet have a, had a total sustainable system of slash and burn agriculture for centuries. Now the reason it's not sustainable anymore, not because of them, it's because the big multinationals have taken their land from them. So now if they practice slash and burn agriculture, they eventually destroy the remaining rainforest because they don't have time to regenerate. So we're working with them to develop agriculture systems under rainforest canopy, such as shade cocoa, shade coffee, vanilla, jungle rubber, as several examples, so they can prosper and become affluent, not just subsist, but become affluent. And we're also feeding the school children and giving them um, scholarships to high school and universities. And, um, and yeah, and before we started, they didn't name the children until they're six years old because they probably die. Now they name them at birth. So it's really about looking after people and, uh, and their rights as, as well as the environment. Um, next slide. Now, I, I talked about why we want this lowland area that connects our, um, the two ecosystems. This is the elephants. We have 120 elephants here. And they need the lowland area to cross from one concession to another because they can't move into the hills. And, and, and what happens, they, they go in there and they get killed and they have human elephant conflict. So this is why we want a pressure mission to give up that land to protect the elephants. Now, having a sustainable population of orangutans is possible if we can do it in the next 10 years. But that train has left the station now for elephants and tigers. We only hope to conserve them in subpopulations and then transfer males between populations every generation. And we're already starting doing this. Because, for example, in here, we look after those 120 elephants and we, we do that in several ecosystems. And when the males leave, because they want to find a new herd and they normally get killed before we started, now we put them on trucks and transfer them to the next ecosystem to find the females. So that's been very successful. It's, it's our cross between Uber and Tinder to make sure we can maintain a mega population of Sumatran elephants. Next slide. And what we're doing, we're developing with some wonderful scientists, the bioacoustics where elephants signal. So we don't have the radio column, hopefully in, in a few years time, that we can actually um, triangulate and recognize individuals from the subsonic calls and therefore provide better protection for the elephants. Just to give you some of the idea of the science that we're involved in. Next slide. And it's just a beautiful Sumatran orangutans, most wonderful, beautiful beings on the planet. We should hold them and talk about how wonderful these guys are. Next slide. And this quick up, this is the Boar um, Rescue and Reintroduction Center that we're building to rescue the orangutans. And this one, the next slide, I'll just quickly explain. Some of the orangutans are unable to go back to the wild for disease, um, injury, mental health issues. 
And what we're doing right now is we're building rainforest enclosures so you don't have to live in cages, they can live in rainforest, but be fed and supported. And then they'll be allowed to breed and their offspring will, will join the reintroduction program. So we get maximum benefit, they're living in dignity and you know, in, in the rainforest but you're supported and their genes are not lost because when you have a critically endangered species, every individual genes matter for the survival species. Next slide. Yeah, and this is the SRA. So these were done with our Indonesian partners, Centre of Rangtang Patient OYC, wonderful partners. We joined together to, um, for skills and resources for maximum outcome. Next slide. And thank you. So I, I went one minute over, I'm sorry, because of the, um, we started a bit late. And so I, I wanted to respect your time. But um, I understand we've got 10 minutes of Q&A. So as I did rush through to make sure um, we did catch up that time, I'm happy to answer any questions and clarify anything that I've discussed. That's brilliant. Thank you so much. I've been so excited to hear that talk because I've been following you on social media for years now. And um, so I've been really, really interested to see actually how you put this into action. So we've got a couple of comments here. Um, mm -hmm. My lovely friend Lauren says, Uber and Tinder with a laughing face. So much admiration to you. Mm -hmm. The world needs more you. So I think we all um, did laugh at that, but that is a brilliant description of what you've been doing. Anybody, if anybody wants to put any questions in the box, then please do. But I do have a couple of questions um, from that. So well, a few things, so much of that was absolutely incredible and really stood out to me and was new to me. Um, mm -hmm. So peat forests, what is it about the peat forest? That surprised me quite a lot. Why are they, why are orangutans so specialized to the peat forests in particular? And are there mm -hmm. any other environments that can kind of replicate, replicate this with the changing of, of the seasons, I guess? Mm -hmm. um, well, it's, it's lowland and peat. I mean, these are, these, are, these are two good things for orangutans and swampy. And, and, and the reason being is nutrients flow downhill Right, so the hilly areas and high areas, mm. um, all the nutrients flow downhill. So you get lower fruit productivity. So it's not just true for orangutan, but all animals. And in humans, that's why we, we farm in the valleys because <laughs> that's the fertile land and it's next to the river for waters. And for the same reason, humans need want these low land river on areas, the orangutans need them too. Um, Peter, and now the rainforest soil is relatively poor because in, in, in alluvial soil, because it just sucks up all the nutrients. So anything dies, it just gets taken away and put up into a tree. So when you knock down the trees, you often, people are surprised how poor the soil is. It's, it's often just sandy like. But in these peat swamps, because it's anaerobic, because of, yeah, it, it doesn't rot. And so um, you get a lot of um, leaf litter building up over centuries. And so right. it becomes far more fertile. And, and that, in fact, they're the carbon, one of the carbon stores of the planet. And so it's, it's fight of, not only fighter for orangutans, but for um, for climate change. And also some, to finish up your question, because it's quite complex, yeah. is orangutans need to survive all through the year and all through many years. And fruiting trees, some of them fruit once a year, some of them fruit every seven or eight years with the El Nino cycle. So it's the it's it food sources which are there all year round and really determine the population density. And the classic example there is a fig tree that lives on by the rivers, which provide all round food for the orangutans. So all these things combined into the ecology, if that makes sense, means that peat swamps are ideal habitat for them. Unfortunately, what we're seeing is, you know, these feedback loops, destroying the rainforest is causing climate change, climate change coming around and, and destroying rainforest. And, and therefore, you know, we have to even take that into account if we're going to, um, take these ecosystems through this extinction crisis. Yeah, that's fascinating to me because I think my preconception was, you know, they live really high up. I, I mean, I've been to, I got stuck in Borneo um, during COVID time. So I'd been to a couple of the rehab centers. Um, so just seeing the work is incredible. You touched on this. I wrote this question before you actually went into what you guys were doing in terms of the vanilla reforestation and trying to give the government initiatives um, to try and improve their awareness and their, their incentive to preserve the environment. So my initial question 
question was, what is the best way to encourage governments? But you've spoken about life expectancy and about how to make them richer in terms of resources. Um, what were the other things you mentioned? You mentioned vanilla, maybe cocoa was that, or coffee? Yeah, I, I mentioned a range now. I mean, just to put it in context, like um, all monocultures are unsustainable by their very nature. It doesn't matter whether you're in England or America, right? And, and it's doubly true in, in let's say, Indonesia and Malaysia because the soil is, in most of the time, is relatively poor. Um, and so palm oil plantations, rubber plantations, they'll, they'll destroy the environment eventually. So 50, yeah. 60 years time, they just leave a barren wasteland. And they, and they just, you know, they cause floods and droughts and all sorts of temperature rise, all sorts of other problems in between while they eventually destroy the environment. Yeah. And so... And that's fine if you want to exploit, you know, if you're, you're exploiting money out of these nations and, you know, and yeah. living in an economic environmental basket case, Short that works profit. well. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. Um, but you, only want to, you need polycultures. And so it has to be diverse. Now, that doesn't work for the multinational big businesses, but it's fantastic for local communities. They done? become really prosperous. Yeah, yeah. Oh, I'm so sorry. Thank you. Sorry. Sorry, I'm back. Um, yeah, so so what we do is we, we want, so it, uh, my main issue is not wildlife versus people, environment versus economy. It's a win-win situation. We yeah. can actually ha have a beautiful ecosystem where wildlife yeah. is, you know, is, is tolerated and managed and look after the people and allow them to become prosperous, you yeah. know, and that's what we're trying to do. We, you know, so it's not excluding people. You know, it, it, yeah. it's, it's, it's making it best for people. The people that we can't satisfy are rich, greedy people who want more and more money and want to pass the true cost of production onto the powerless, the indigenous communities, the orangutans, and future generations. Orangutan project. Um, that, that, those people we can't satisfy. Um, but we can build a better world for everybody, including for them, um, by working with people. Yeah, that's absolutely brilliant. It's about um, allowing people to consider the repercussions on the next generation and realising that actually this short term profit is not long term gain. My last question, we've got a couple of minutes, is um, I've, you've spoken about the initiatives now for governments and about um, looking at uh, ways that we can uh, encourage uh, kind of rotations and permaculture and uh, reducing monoculture. Are there any incentives for poachers? to reduce mm -hmm. their, their activity? Um, no, no, I mean, what poachers actually, it's kind of interesting, you know, poachers and drug traffickers and terrorists are actually pretty much the same people. Mm. <laughs> the skill sets <laughs> are transferable. So what yeah. we're dealing with here is not, you know, um, in, in most cases, let's say with our targets, you know, with elephants are different, it's human elephant conflict that, you know, where the, both two self-aware persons are fighting to survive in this shrinking forest. And then, and what we can do is work with both elephants and people so they can live in harmony and safely. Um, but tigers, for example, with your classical poachers, they're criminal syndicates. You know, they're, they're criminals um, coming in. And um, yeah, so there, there's, you know, they just need to be, need to be stopped through um, law enforcement. Yeah. Yeah, that's absolutely brilliant. Thank you so much for your time today. I appreciate it so very much. I think it's been you, so You're awesome. most welcome. Thank Bye. you, everybody. Take care. Have a great day. Bye. 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 Okay, so we've got a couple of questions coming in, just uh, general questions here. Um, I think before Shireen joins, uh, I think she's here actually, but let me just run through this question. Are we allowed to network here and uh, everyone here activists or a mis mix of government and businesses this is a mix of everybody I've just kind of networked this to uh, my friends colleagues uh, I've got loads of activists on my Facebook and on my social media pages and you are a hundred percent allowed to network here that is the point of it to bring people together to share ideas to get involved with other people's um, projects and to share your projects and to build on your projects so you're a hundred percent allowed to network um, hopefully everybody has their contact details 
and uh, feel free to reach out and to just use the chat box. If I'm not looking at it, that's just because I'm scribbling things down, uh, but I will try and catch up on it. And if there's anything that you do want to kind of email uh, later on in the day, then that's absolutely fine. And I will share out the recording so that you don't have to sit and be scribbling things uh, the way that I am. So yes, it's completely a networking event and we want to be sharing ideas and brainstorming in order to protect um, the environment and uh, conservation projects. So yeah, go for it. So if I can hand it over to the absolutely wonderful Dr. Shireen Kassam. Are you here? I am. Yeah, I am. Hello, thank you. Hi. Thank you for joining. Um, How are you? Yeah, I'm well, thank you. It was nice to catch um, the first talk as well. So um, thanks for that. Um, I don't have the ability to share my screen yet. Absolutely fine. How am I going to, I think, Steve... Just make co-host or something. Yes. Let's see more. Make host. That's brilliant. just make co-host. Don't make me host. Okay. Otherwise, you'll lose <laughs> lose your ability. Mm, I've only got the option to make host. This is a problem. Oh, okay. Well, make host and then I'll make host it. for a bit. Yeah, absolutely fine. I will sit and drink my coffee. I'm more than happy for you to be host for twenty minutes. <laughs> I trust you entirely. No, no, no. If there's any problems with it, you can just bounce it back to me. But let's give it a go. Okay. I'm still not enabled. <laughs> There we go. Okay, it's happening now. Perfect. Great. Cool. So are you okay for me to kick off? Oh, yeah, please do. I've been so excited to talk as always. Oh, thank you. Well, you know it all, but hopefully some of this information might be new to some of your audience who I probably haven't met before. So it's great to have the opportunity um, to be here. And I've titled my talk, Plant-Based Diets for a Sustainable Future. Um, and just a little bit about me and my disclosures, I work as an NHS consultant in haematology and I'm also a certified lifestyle medicine physician, but um, you'll understand why I hope that my passion lies in promoting and educating people on the power of plant-based diets for um, really addressing our health and planetary crises. Um, I'm founder of, a, of two community interest companies and today I'm here as Plant-Based Health Professionals UK and I'll pop the link to our website which is full of free resources into the chat after my talk um, and I work at the University of Winchester which I'll come back to the, at the end and always good to declare one's um, diet pattern I've been vegan since 2013 so coming up to my um, 10 years anniversary and I'm still here alive and well. Um, so today I'm going to talk about the evidence supporting plant-based diets for individual and planetary health um, hopefully show you how these um, guidelines on plant-based diets are embedded into international consensus. And if you haven't done already, uh, make a pledge to take action. So this is my take on the food system. The food system currently um, in the UK and globally is at the centre of a number of interrelated crises. Um, we'll talk about the climate, biodiversity and health crises. What I won't be covering, but I'm equally passionate about is the crisis of ethics we face. Um, you know, we're in, we have a food system globally that slaughters 80 billion land animals and 2 trillion fish every year, yet nearly a billion people globally remain hungry, despite the fact that we produce enough food to feed two planets. So there's something very wrong in what we're doing. But I'll start with the biodiversity crisis and how the farming system is really driving this. So animal agriculture is the leading cause of biodiversity loss, whether it be destruction of the Amazon or whether it is loss of our natural habitats here in the UK. Um, and that's because we have turned the planet into a farm. Um, the global mass of farm animals now is 20 ti 22 times the weight of all wild animals. Um, and when you look at percentages of mammals, 60% of farm animals, 36% humans, and we've left and squeezed out wild animals to just be 4% of all man mammals. When you think of birds, um, which is not included in this, um, there are three times the number of um, chickens or poultry um, in the farming system being raised for food compared to wild birds. When you think of the UK, 85% of land that feeds the UK is used to graze animals or produce food 
for animals to eat. Um, but when you actually think about what we need to be eating, we need to be eating predominantly healthy plant foods as they are associated with good health. And we don't need all this animal food. And I'll, I'll hopefully persuade you of that. And despite the fact that we think our animals are raised in this wonderful green pastures, the reality is um, that 70% or more of the food we buy in the UK that's come from animals is raised um, or animals are raised in factory farms. Um, and we're losing out on the biggest potential to use our land to capture carbon and to reduce greenhouse gas emissions, which I'll come to in a minute. Um, so we have turned our farmland in the UK into grazing land for animals rather than using it to rewild and bring back natural habitats. Um, and what about the greenhouse gas emissions? Um, you know, the farming system not only emits carbon, but also methane and nitrous oxide. Um, and overall, um, eating higher up the food chain makes your diet and the food system a greater contributor to the carbon footprint. So you can see here from Our World and Our Data, which is a great website for all of this type of information, um, that eating um, animal foods, regardless of the way it's farmed or transported, has a greater carbon footprint than any other um, plant foods, again, regardless of transport and regardless of the farming um, methods. And of course, ruminant animals are the worst culprits because beef and lamb and such like um, not only um, add to the carbon footprint, but also are great emitters of methane. Um, and our system is so inefficient. So to raise um, uh, beef um, or raise cows, I should say, to turn into beef, we need to feed um, a cow 25 kilograms of, um, uh, uh, of um, food to produce one kilogram of beef. So it's hugely inefficient. So not only do we use most of our farmland to um, raise animals for food, this because of this inefficiency, it only provides 18% of calories and 30% of the, um, the protein supply, whereas we could be going directly to the plant sources and freeing up 75% of farmland back to restore habitats. So overall, the animal agricultural industry is having a massive negative impact on the environment we live in and the animals that we share this environment with responsible for 91% of animal de uh, Amazon destruction. And now the Amazon forest is an emitter of carbon, which is shocking really, because that's the area of the world we rely on to um, really mop up the carbon. Um, and we're polluting waterways um, and our land because of the um, excretions and the feces from the animal agriculture um, system. So it's not good enough um, to only get rid of fossil fuels. We think about fossil fuels and um, talk about this incessantly, but even if fossil fuels um, um, were, were removed today and we stopped using them, we would not move, meet our global targets um, for warming because of the emissions from the food system. So that's a really stark and sobering thought that we really can't meet our nature and climate targets without addressing food. And again, a big paper published in the Nature Journal is looking just purely at emissions from the food system. And when you just think of methane emissions, um, that alone could stop us um, meeting our um, warming targets of 1.5%. And most of this comes from meat, dairy and rice. As healthcare professionals, so certainly for, for me and Ashani, we see antibiotic resistant infections affecting our patients on a daily basis. And globally, antibiotic resistant infections um, kill 1.3 million people. And this is leading to more deaths in HIV infection and ma malaria combined being the 12th leading cause of death. And the reason it's important is because the vast majority of antibiotics are used in animal agriculture. And so we could eliminate this as we eliminate animals from our food system. Um, and we don't need to remind you all of pandemic risks, but actually three out of four new infections emerge from our treatment of animals, whether it's the destruction of their habitats and bringing these animals closer to us as humans, 
or from factory farming. Um, and the current threat, um, I, I have no doubt, is going to be a new and deadly bird flu. So H5N1 has already killed the first human, 11-year-old uh, girl in Cambodia. And this is running rife in our bird populations and has led to millions of birds um, and chickens being slaughtered in the UK for no reason at all other than our planet palette pleasure. So what if today we went to a fully plant-based um, meal plan for ourselves and a plant-based diet? Does it really make a difference? Well, this um, unique paper looked at the life cycle analysis of various different meals, 13 different meals made in different ways. And I've just shown you the example of a beef lasagna. But overall, it showed that vegan meals have a 14 times lower impact on the environment um, than meat-based. Um, and, and even vegetarian meals are three times higher the environment environmental impact than um, vegan meals. And it's even better if you leave away the processed foods and go whole using minimally processed fruits, vegetables, whole grains, beans, nuts and seeds. So I'm going to move on to health because this is obviously important for every single one of us in the audience and for, for our families and communities. Unhealthy diets are now responsible for one in four deaths globally and a third of premature deaths in, in Europe. Um, and this problem is only getting worse. And the reason our diets are so unhealthy, regardless of where we are in the world, is because they're too high in sodium, which is a reflection of pre um, the consumption of prepackaged and processed foods. And in the UK, we have a major problem with this, with nearly 60% of what we put in our shopping baskets being classified as ultra processed. But after this, the main issues are we are not eating enough of the healthy foods that are associated with good health. So fruits, vegetables, whole grains, beans, nuts and seeds. And instead, we're eating too much of the animal source foods and ultra processed foods. And this is leading to excess deaths. Um, from cardiovascular disease, cancer and type 2 diabetes, and this is certainly true of the UK. So if we wanted to think of a diet that would not only be healthy for us, but would keep the food system within planetary boundaries, well, the hard work has been done by, uh, for us. This is the planetary health plate published by the Eat Lancet Commission, who asked just this question um, back in 2019. And what they came out with was with a plate that is 85% plant-based, um, because those are the foods associated with good health, and I've shown you how they have a lower environmental impact as well. If you are going to continue to eat animal foods and it makes it clear that it's not necessary, then this should be limited to one portion of red meat a week, two portions of poultry, three portions of egg. And you can see how small the wedges are. And this um, type of diet is estimated to save the 11 million premature deaths per year that are occurring annually due to an unhealthy diet. So what if today we all made a pledge to go vegan, 100% plant-based? Well, we know from all the major dietetic associations around the world that a well-planned vegan diet can support healthy living in people of all ages, cradle to grave. How do we know this? Well, some basic information comes from populations that live the longest and healthiest lives. Um, and there are five um, regions coined um, the blue zones by the demographer Dan Butner. And if you haven't watched the Channel 4 documentary yet called How to Live to 100, it's really good. It follows three blue zones um, and Jon Snow and provides a great um, narrative. Um, and basically the words vegan and vegetarian come up in the first couple of scenes. Um, but in these five zones, they share in common um, a, a diet that is predominantly, if not completely plant-based. They go whole, so they don't rely on processed foods. A daily dose of beans is key to this area, mostly water for thirst, snack on nuts, go easy on the fish, eliminate eggs, slash the sugar, reduce the dairy, retreat from meat. So pretty much like the planetary health plate. What about the health of long-term vegans? Well, we've got a lot of information from studies from the US, and here in the UK, the Epic Oxford study, they've been following people for decades. And from these cohorts, around a third are vegetarian or vegan. And there's been dozens of studies published, but just for purposes of time, some headline information, vegans um, and vegetarians certainly are able to manage risk factors for all our chronic conditions much more easily. You're much more likely to be a healthy BMI um, eating a vegan diet. You slash your risk of type 2 diabetes by 50%. 
you slash your risk of hypertension by 63% and much more likely to have a healthy cholesterol because of a diet that's um, low in saturated fat, does not have cholesterol and is high in fiber. And overall, this leads to a reduction in um, heart disease risk. You know, heart disease globally is still the biggest killer of men and women. What about non-white populations? Well, the sushi study based in Taiwan following Buddhists who again, a third are vegetarian and vegan, you have much better health outcomes. And interestingly, about a 15% less expenditure on healthcare, that's outpatient costs and medication costs. Back here in the UK, the UK Biobank study, nearly a a half a million participants followed for um, just over 11 years looking at cancer risk and meat free diets led to a reduction in cancer of 14% with greater reductions for breast cancer and prostate cancer. And then we have the COVID, um, Zoe COVID study app, which I'm sure um, you have all contributed to this study. And they looked at the impact of diet on the outcomes in um, the first part of the COVID pandemic. And they showed that a healthy plant-based diet centered around fruit, vegetables, whole grains, beans, nuts, and seeds resulted in a 10% reduction in the risk of getting COVID, but more importantly, a 40% reduction in severe COVID. Um, so what do the international guidelines show? Well, so for someone like me and um, Shani, who are practicing lifestyle medicine, the founding college, the American College of Lifestyle Medicine, um, describe a healthy diet as one that is predominantly based around minimally processed fruits, vegetables, whole grains, beans, nuts, and seeds. Again, depicted in this plate, half fruits and vegetables, half um, a quarter whole grains, and a quarter plant protein from nuts and seeds and um, chickpeas and pulses and tofu and, um, um, per, um, and, and such like. You can obviously include other foods, but they need to be kept to a minimum because they're not com contributing to our health. And this has been put into national dietary guidelines. Um, so you've got the Canadian guidelines, which look very similar. Half fruits and vegetables, a quarter whole grains, eat protein foods. And they say at least half um, should be from plant sources, make water your drink of choice. And you'll see that there's no section for dairy anymore. It's been eliminated. And because 70% of the global population are lactose intolerant, it's not needed for good health and environmentally it's totally unsustainable. The latest country-based guidelines that I've seen are from Denmark, eat plant rich, varied, not too much. And although our UK um, Eat Well guide hasn't been updated since 2016, it's pretty much um, plant-based, very easy to convert to a plant-based plate. But um, we've had guidance um, under um, the uh, publication of uh, um, our health, um, healthy um, living guidelines. And we've got two documents from the UK government, Climate and Health and Healthy Eating, which clearly states that the foods most damaging to our health also damage the environment and that a diet rich in plant foods is essential for meeting our um, environmental um, uh, 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 goals and also will benefit our health. And they acknowledge that some people will choose to limit consumption of animals and it's um, very easy to get nutrients from a very balanced plant-based diet. So this is where we are. This is what I think as health professionals, if you are health professionals, but if you're not, then everyone else should be demanding from our government policymakers that we transition away from animal agriculture and move to a plant based food system for our own health, but for the future of the planet as well. So I hope in this very short time, I provided you with um, persuasive evidence that plant-based diets um, are not only healthy for us, but are necessary for the future of our planet, that national and international guidelines have caught up. We need to really put this in practice with our actions and that we can no longer think of our diet choices without thinking about our individual and community impact on the planet. And so if you're not already plant based, it's really easy to become plant based and Ishani and I can support you to do that. Um, but just think of your favorite plant, um, usual meals that you eat on a daily basis and think how you can make them plant based, you know, um, meat based bolognese to lentil bolognese, your chicken curry to tofu curry. Take a plant based challenge. We're coming up to No Meat May. Um, you know, you can sign up, um, join with a friend and take the challenge. And if you're healthcare professionals, we really should be asking patients about our diet because I've told you it's the single most um, leading risk factor for their ill health is their diet choice 
Um, I teach this eight week online course at the University of Winchester, which you're welcome to check out and join open to everybody. Um, if you've not watched this movie already, Eating Our Way to Extinction is now free on YouTube and I'll pop the link into the chat. It really goes through everything that I've been talking about in a, in a probably more digestible way. And I've got two books out that you're welcome to check out, Eating Plant-Based, which is a Q&A question covering everything you need to know about plant-based diets, and a textbook aimed at healthcare professionals and um, institutions that are teaching on health and diet and nutrition. So thanks very much for listening, and I'm very happy to take your questions. Thank you so much for that, Shireen. I could sit and listen to you talk for days, months even, and I'm sure you have so much to say, um, and you've, you've just got so much knowledge behind it, and obviously it's all evidence-based and scientific, and that's mm -hmm. so, so very impressive. So thank you for your time and for your expertise as well. Um, I have so many questions, as always. Um, if anybody else does, again, just please pop them in the chat. So... Where can I start? So when did you start writing your books? And also, did you find that as you were writing them, more and more evidence was coming out and things were changing? But how did you manage to adapt with that? <laughs> yeah, so both the books have been a sort of two year <laughs> investment of time and energy. Um, it's crazy how much effort goes into it. But I was um, pleased to be joined by amazing co-authors, my sister for the first book and then second book, um, Lisa Simon, registered dietitian here in the UK. So, you know, team effort as always. But yeah, it's impossible to keep up with the daily onslaught of studies that are just coming up, you know, basically demonstrating what we've actually known for decades, that um, a healthy diet is one that's centered around whole plant plant foods it doesn't matter how you do it you know I do it mainly through a South Asian diet um, but you could be doing it as a Mediterranean diet or you could be making up your own style of cuisine it's so adaptable um, but the evidence is strong I think regardless of whether you're looking for evidence to support positive health outcomes or for planetary health outcomes and as I say you can't think about the two um, independently anymore they're so interrelated um, and that has to influence our, our individual choices and how we support communities as well. Yeah brilliant and then just a bit more of a personal one this was actually wasn't on my list of questions but have you um, do you enjoy cooking and have you always enjoyed <laughs> cooking and um, what's your kind of schedule like in terms of how you eat? <laughs> No, I'm afraid I haven't got a really cheery story to, to <laughs> tell about my, my cooking. Cooking for me is a bit functional, to be honest, and I, I probably am the type of person that could eat the same dish every day forever um, <laughs> like I you know I could eat the same packed lunch um, every day without getting you know worrying about it but no I, I mean it's amazing when you do decide to actively change your diet it does open up a whole new world so what I can say is I've incorporated much more and variety into my um, diet um, since I've become vegan or plant-based. It's been helped by, you know, having a fruit and veg delivery box where you just, you know, accept what turns up. So um, use for that? it's a local um, uh, delivery company where I live in Hampshire, actually. So um, Bryant's food. So they do mainly fruits and vegetables. Um, so, yeah, so that helps um, add to, to variety. Um, and um, yeah, I mean, but it is a bit functional. So I really try and be efficient and I do batch cook at the weekends. I make up all our packed lunches, um, you know, and if I'm cooking a dinner, then it's definitely going to be for, for more than one day. Um, yeah. And so you don't need to be spending too much time because I mean, where's the time? Yeah, I'm <laughs> so, one, it must make meal prep really easy for you if you don't mind eating the same thing every day. Also, <laughs> how do you, it's a bit of a rhetorical question, but how how do you find the time to do all of these things with the it's busy enough being a doctor and then having you know all the side projects and you've got so many as well as being a, a published author multiple times now so just massive congratulations and um, kind of going back to patients we had a bit of a shocking comment on the plant-based health professionals group I mean sometimes there's some amazing stories and some really heartwarming stories and sometimes there's some really shocking things and the thing that I kind of can't stop thinking about I'm a bit obsessed with it is where 
Uh, somebody posted about this hydration day in the nursing homes where they have the the organizers coming in with the coke floats and the ice cream and that's what the elderly patients are being given at the moment so you must see all, things like this all of the time as a practicing doctor and i'm seeing it all the time as a as a general practitioner and it's it's shocking and it's horrifying um obviously we need to incentivize larger organizations and educate them but what is your um, perception on how to best address this individually? Are people motivated by health outcomes? Are people motivated by the environment? Have you got any positive stories about how we can proactively encourage change in patients? Yeah, no, I mean, I think, it, I mean, it's that's such a broad question. And I know we share a passion for changing the food environment in hospitals. And that's what's um, engaged my time in the hospital space quite a lot in the last um, two years. So, I mean, just using that as an example, I think, you know, we've tried to change food for staff and for patients. Um, and I think the things that um, are important is to, um, you know, be inclusive and understand people's motivations to change because ev everyone's motivation is different. Um, but that really is the key. You know, I think with um, patients as well you know they have to be ready for change and it's all about that behavior change and so you can plant some seeds but um, you'll kind of know when people are ready to change but that doesn't stop us as organizations um, and policy or, or sort of you know institutions that should be leading the way to actually make those changes ahead of what we consider patient preferences to be so you know I face the barrier at work that the most popular dish um, on the patient menu is the pork and leek sausage. So they won't get rid of that because it's most popular and they don't want to upset the patients. Yet we did a survey of patients and we, um, about, we had about 120 patients we surveyed at King's and we asked them, well, you know, what would you say if we got rid of processed meat and red meat because of the health and environmental impact? And most people were supportive. So I do think it's about making sure people understand why um, and understanding that we're trying to do the best and be, um, you know, show by, um, teach by example. Now, I think as staff and people, uh, you know, if there's health professionals in this organ uh, in this audience, that we really do have credibility and people listen to what we say. And so it's on us to to really show through action um, that um, we are willing to change. And that's a difficult thing because people I work with really still want to have their fried breakfast that includes bacon and sausage. And so we have to really change that mindset and um, you know, what people do outside of work is different, but as a healthcare organization or running a nutrition and hydration week, we need to be demonstrating the best of the best. Um, and it just takes persistence. And, and you never know until you put yourself out there who you're going to find as allies. So we've been really lucky that the chief financial officer is an ally. And I've just posted in our Facebook group that actually staff catering now, you know, if you organize and catering for your m, &M meeting or audit meeting, it's going to be plant based at King. Things. No. Um, yes. Oh my um, God, that's incredible. Yeah, I know. So, you know, just small changes. It doesn't mean that staff can't go to their, the MS or the Costa and get by what they want, but at least we're just making that gesture and showing people that we mean we, we're willing to put into action these difficult things. So, but it's yeah. taken two years. And so yeah. I think, you know, you have to persist, find your allies, find a group of people, and people will be motivated by different things but we have the evidence to support and I think we just stick to the science and the facts yeah and I think you know people have to listen eventually um they really do we have one uh question from Harry who's an incredible incredible um animal rights activist I don't know again I don't know how Harry has the time to do everything and speak to as many people and he's always out doing outreach and it's absolutely incredible um Harry asks do you think maybe they'd stop serving um, the sausages if they saw footage of pigs in gas chambers or do, would they still think that taste and pleasure takes priority so he talks about some new footage available so essentially that's asking about the role of emotive um em emotive change isn't it and what's the role in in terms yeah. of showing people different types of evidence really what kind of tactics should we be using yeah no uh, thank you harry for all you do i mean you know ultimately um our diet choices are impacting so many non-human animals in an awful way but also humans that have to work in these slaughter factories 
um, slaughterhouse um, factories. So um, the, I've moved away from um, you know, the ethical advocacy in the hospital space. I find that it puts people off. I think if people are open to it, you sort of know, and then you can take it forward. Um, because they come up with those myths of, oh, but I only have dairy and, you know, cows in, in the UK, they, they you know, they live great lives or whatever, you know. Um, so I, I think I wait for that offer. But I have to say, for every talk I give, I mention ethics somewhere along the lines just to plant that seed. And then if people are willing to, to take that forward, it comes up in the in the Q&A. But I think as a doctor, and uh, it's really hard to bring that into the patient conversation unless somebody sort of asks you a bit more about it. Um, and I don't talk about veganism at, um, as, a, as such with my patients. I talk about the health promoting or health benefits of moving away from the current typical British pattern towards eating more healthy plant foods. And I think people know it intrinsically and I think whatever steps they can take. And then as soon as they start looking into that, you can't fail to understand the wider context of ethics and planetary health. That's brilliant. Thank you so much, Shireen. We're going to have to wrap this up. I could talk to you forever. I'll see you in a couple of weeks at the Planetary Health Hub. The last thing I wanted to say to you was yesterday, I had a young student nurse who came in she saw my vegan necklace and I shared her plant-based health professionals and all of your resources she was on the verge of tears she said I didn't know anything like this existed mm -hmm. it's so far removed from what I've been taught and she was so happy and she's going to go and share it so thank you so oh, much for your work thank you so I've put the um, website link into the chat and the link to the movie if people haven't seen it, it's a good one to share with others if you're already the converted and don't need to watch it <laughs> Thank you. Okay, Thank you. Thank you so much. Bye, Shireen. Well, that was absolutely incredible, as always. Much appreciated. And we move on to uh, what are we going to introduce you as? Full time legend, I think we agreed on. Uh, to Over to Luke Marsh. Hello, everyone. Can you hear me? Yes. Hi, Luke. Okay, cool. How are you? Yes, good, thank you. So yeah, uh, hello, my name is Luke. I'm a volunteer for an organization called Sadhana Forest. Uh, we are working in multiple countries around the world and in multiple parts of India uh, to work with local people in reforestation and sustainable living. So I'm here in South India right now. Uh, we live in a community where we have people from all around the world and we're coming together to uh, work on reforestation, water conservation. Uh, but that's just a small part of what we're trying to do. We're trying to create a new culture, um, a environment, a space where we can put compassion into action. So looking at how we can live in a more compassionate way. So just a little bit of history and context of the organization that um, I work with or that I live with. Uh, so Sadhana Forest started in 2003 by a small family. And they came here to live in a sustainable way and start planting trees. And then a volunteer came and another volunteer came and it grew and grew to one of the largest uh, uh, volunteer organized, residential volunteer organizations in the world. So I'm gonna try and share, um, okay. Apparently the host is disabled participant screen sharing. Um, so I can't me, share. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I would like to share just um, a couple of photos just to, so you can see what we're doing and, um, the impact. Um, okay, um, I'm not so good with Zoom, so I think I got it. Um, yeah, it's okay. Definitely. Okay, so can you see this? What I'm sharing, this yeah, photo. Yeah, yeah. Okay, cool. So this is what the place looked like in 2003. So it was a very dry, barren land. There was just a few trees around. Nothing was really growing here. It was basically a desert, and we live in huts, um, like I'm I'm sitting in right now. And as more volunteers came, uh, more trees were planted, more infrastructure was had to be built. And this is what it looks like today. So completely transforming this, this dry barren land uh, where nothing was really growing here into a forest. And as you can see, there is a huge amount of infrastructure here. We have um, our main huts, our dormitory, and all these different huts where long-term volunteers are living in, our solar system, and uh, yeah, this is uh, kind of a little bit about um, Sadhana Forest. So it started in a uh, place called Oroville that's in South India. And um, as they start, more people started to come, they realized that this is a model and this model can be replicated. Uh, so they started a project in Haiti, in uh, Central America. 
and then in 2014 another one in Kenya and 2020 one in the northeast India uh, last year we started another one in South India and uh, we're in the process of starting three new projects in India and in July we're starting one in Namibia and in the next few years one in Romania as well so we are expanding and growing to try and create a global organization uh, to work with local people in reforestation so the idea uh, what we're doing in the countries like Haiti and Kenya and Namibia is basically there's 130 million people in the world today that have large pieces of arid land and they're not doing anything with it and what we and they're suffering from malnutrition and uh, so what we're doing is we're going to these places so these these are some of the most vulnerable communities in the world and looking at how we can work with the local people to plant food producing trees around their homes to give them long-term food security and self-sufficiency so the idea around this is if we can keep planting trees in these barren areas with these people that are suffering from food insecurity, we can uh, uh, plant, uh, feed hundreds of millions of people and plant tens of billions of trees in the process because reforestation, there's a reason um, that trees are being cut down. So the challenging thing is to create this connection with local people to give them the incentive and the, um, to uh, plant the trees to take care of them and look after them. So when trees are fully grown, this is when there's the biggest incentive to cut them down. And uh, But when you're planting food producing trees in areas of places where they're suffering from food insecurity and malnutrition, they have this long-term incentive to look after the trees to take care of them. And this brings up a lot of health benefits for the local people, uh, the environmental benefits as well. It's becoming increasingly clear to people around the world, what's kind of happening due to the, the ecological breakdown. Like you speak to any older people in these regions and they are very familiar and, um, and clear about the, the environmental changes that have been happening over the last few decades. The rates of droughts are becoming more and more common. This, um, relate, this has the effect of um, of um, uh, these droughts can uh, give crop failures and then you have famines and stuff like uh, Kenya, the Samburu tribe that we, we're working with, they've been suffering from drought the last few years and this is becoming a re reality and these are some of the most vulnerable people and these are some of the people that are least responsible for climate change but most affected by it. So what we're trying to do is to, to get more people on board with this organization to, to see how we can continue to expand, to scale up, to work with more local people in uh, reforestation and water conservation work, because uh, water conservation is a super important aspect of ecological restoration. You hear a lot of big people talking about how we need to plant trees, but actually one of the most important things we need to be doing is rainwater harvesting, water conservation to, to create the conditions for uh, the land to revive itself, then trees can thrive. Because in a lot of cases, the land has been degraded due to uh, centuries of deforestation. So when the rain comes, it comes and washes away and it washes any topsoil and anything that was um, created. And then uh, the rain gets washed away and the hot sun comes out and the land just becomes increasingly degraded. So what we're trying to do is do water conservation work with the local people to capture this rain, to create the conditions for trees to be able to thrive. And uh, this is kind of the, the knowledge and experience we can share with people. And we take a lot of time to connect with the local people before we go and start these projects. We're not just going there and saying, okay, we're gonna plant trees. Uh, we, we spend one, two years connecting with the local people to understand how we, uh, what their needs are and to explain to them what, we've, what we do, what we can do and what skills and experience we have and create a understanding and relationship with the local people to see how we can support them and uh, in the end of the day giving them the choice if they would like us to be working with them and to be a part of uh, the organization that we're trying to create so this this is an ongoing process and it's become it we're scaling up a lot right now with within the organization we have uh, more projects starting um, around the world and we need more people on board with this so a little bit of call to action. Um, if there's anyone that is interested in um, volunteering uh, to have a, maybe a little bit of a, a change in direction of their life. Um, I don't know where the demographics of the people we're speaking to today. Um, but yeah, I live in a hut 
in South India. And um, for me, this is luxury. This is paradise. I get to uh, live in a forest. And the birds are a bit quiet today, actually. But I don't know if you can hear the birds in the background. Um, but you can see maybe some of the trees and stuff outside this hut. Um, okay, not so good. My camera's not so good, so not so clear. Um, does anyone have any questions? Anything they would like to ask? Anything they would like to know more about Sadhana Forest, what we're doing, how to help, um, to how to get involved and what our visions are, anything like this? Yeah, I've only got about a million and one questions. Um, yeah, do you want to tell us a bit about like how, what your journey was to getting there? And because I know that you are not from there you're from Ashford uh, so how yeah. did that, how did that happen do you want to tell us about how you ended up where you are today yeah so I think it started off with a very maybe familiar story with a lot of people where I left school um, and I started working and um, in this job I kind of started developing a career path that I felt like I could keep pursuing and um, it was never feeling very connected to my values. I was working just in retail management. And when you start hearing about all the problems going on, on in the world and you start thinking what I can do about it, it can be very intimidating because the problems seem so vast. So for um, a lot of the time I just had in my head, OK, this is the way it is. At least I can just do the best for myself and just kind of see what happens. But as I was continuing on this uh, path, I was becoming more and more disconnected with this kind of way of life and more curious about what I can do as an individual to make a positive impact. So eventually I got to, to the point where I really couldn't live in Ashford anymore in, in the UK and um, wanted to, I was so curious about uh, what else there is out there. So I set out on this plan to travel around the world to basically find a better way to live. So I was looking at different um, eco communities and places like this to kind of see what there is out there. And if I couldn't find a better way to live, then I could just go back to Ashford and just continuing the same type of job and just following this path of life that everyone I knew around me was doing. So then the first place I came to was Oroville and that's where I am now. And it's an alternative um, eco community in South India that was started 53 years ago. It's one of the most, uh, probably the most established and kind of longest experimental community there is in the world where it has around 3000 people living here now and lots of different projects and organizations within this place doing amazing things. And um, I want to live in a community. So I came across Sadhana Forest and this was the first stop of my travel around the world. And I came here and basically found a better way to live. And I found a place that was mo so much more than what I was looking for. I was, I just want to live in a community in a sustainable way. Um, but then um, I wasn't connected to many of the values of this place at the time. So uh, we're a completely vegan community. Um, before coming here, I was the largest meat eater in my family. I used to go hunting. And uh, so I connected with veganism a lot. And uh, that's a massive part of my life now. Um, I, I wanted to live in a way without money and so I didn't want to live in a commercial place and this place we, we practice gift economy, the idea of gift culture, so we don't sell anything, we, we just share and we just give and that's very important with how I want to live. It's also a substance free community um, where before I was smoking weed every day for like four years and then came here and really started to enjoy this kind of life where I wasn't having to use any external substances and could just um, yeah live like this. and. It also practices natural learning, also known as unschooling, where we allow children to be free. So we're not forcing children to, to do stuff they don't want to do, learn stuff they don't want to learn, be who they don't want to be. And we simply just ask them, what do you want to do? How do you want to live? What do you want? To, what do you enjoy? And just allowing them to be free and creating a stimulating environment for them to be curious and to, to grow in their own ways and be who they want to be. So this is again, a very important part of my life now when we're, we're a community that doesn't practice competition. We look, work at how we can collaborate, how we can live together. So with competition, you always have a winner, but you also always have a loser. And competition is just such a normalized aspect of um, the outside world, the normal society, uh, where uh, we're competing for so much different things from our uh, attention from our parents to social status, to education, to our work environment, 
our social systems, our political systems, our economic systems, everything's based around the idea of competition. So here we're integrating collaboration. Uh, so these kind of ways of life that this place introduced me kind of um, became a really important part of how I want to live. And one of the challenges with that is there's actually no community in the world that is a vegan community that practices gift culture, that, um, that unschools natural lands, uh, their children, and um, is sustainable as this and doesn't practice and works uh, together on collaboration. So I kind of, um, yeah, it's the, the place I want to live and um, that is good for me. Yeah, it sounds perfect. It sounds perfect. Um, I've got a few questions. Uh, first of all, we, you just mentioned collaboration, which is, you know, the fundamental of being human. And I think we're losing that connection and everything in the Western world is becoming very disjointed. And then that's leading to mental health problems. And it's a vicious cycle. Um, how have you found collaborating with locals was there any friction how do you best manage communication to try and educate communities like what is that dynamic like well actually as an organization the connection with the local people is our biggest priority maybe safety being the biggest and then the connection with the local people being the next biggest thing so it's saying that we put huge amounts of energy and we come with an approach of not telling this is how you should live this is what you should do and all these kind of things and just sharing this is what we we do and do want help and we kind of had the experience in haiti when we started the project there that a lot of people were very skeptical of what we we're trying to do and didn't want to kind of interact with these kind of foreigners that were coming in um doing this work um and then a few people did and and then these trees started producing huge amounts of food and the, the local people around this started to see and um, and then they started wanting trees as well. And a lot of NGOs that go into these uh, kind of environments are very challenging places and they last there for about two to three years, five years maximum. So we've been in Haiti for 13 years now. So it's really creating this long-term relationship. It took us about five years to start creating a, a stronger relationship with the local people where that skepticism and um, disconnect kind of started to fade out. Um, but this is how long most NGOs um are in places like this so i think a big part is this this trust and uh connection that we build over time uh, really nourishing that and um, investing a lot of time and energy into supporting that um but then also the fact that we live in a very simple way so we're not driving around in fancy vehicles staying in fancy hotels we're living in the most simple ways just like them um, eating simple foods and living in huts and stuff like this. And where they see us walk, going out every morning, walking with the trees, the compost, the tools to dig and everything like this. And there's this kind of really sense of kind of understanding and relatability of um, who we are and what we're trying to do with them rather than this massive disconnect. So I think those are two key things that we're doing, this long-term um, uh, connection um and living in a very simple way yeah um i think one thing that probably used to get a good rap but now has such bad rap is um organizations coming in for you know like two three weeks and um building something that the locals probably should have been taught to do and should have been encouraged to do and probably 20 years ago that was the thing to do wasn't it for your gap year or whatever and mm -hmm. now that's got such bad rap they can actually be difficult for organizations that do want to do you know have such good um has have, have such good goals but actually there can be a lot of friction and tensions with the local communities so actually perseverance to break those barriers and finding the right way of being culturally congruent is so valuable and I think so many organizations miss out on that so what you guys have done with that is completely is completely different and is is amazing that you've managed to do it not in one place but in multiple places as well are there some similarities in terms of the setups between Kenya Haiti and Tamil Nadu like is it a similar kind of um similar kind of project that's going on in each place it's it's similar in the sense of the values are all very connected and living in the kind of the sustainable ways uh, but the needs of the local areas are different so the one in haiti and kenya is based around food security working with the local people to uh, plant, plant food producing trees with them same with what we're going to be doing in namibia um, in megalia in the northeast of india the three projects that we started there megalia is the rainiest place in the world so what we're doing is we're working with the local people in water conservation work to capture the rain, uh, to allow it to percolate into the ground, because in the rainiest place in the world, uh, massive amounts of this area is turning into desert. 
because the rain just comes and just washes everything away up, um, after the trees have all been cut down. There's nothing to hold the soil and everything together. So it's being desertified. Um, here in Tamil Nadu in South India, um, the biggest key here is um, not the so much rain, the, the problem of so much rain, but such little rain. So um, it's becoming a dry state. Um, the, the capital Chennai and the other major cities here um, are going to become dry cities in the next decade. And the most important thing for this area is to bring back the native forest because pre-colonization, there was a huge forest across South India. But the more than 99% of it was cut down, it was pushed almost to extinction. So the focus here is to bring back that native forest, uh, create this biodiversity and uh, restore the ecosystem. Yeah, so the needs of the local local at the areas are different, but the, the setup, the model, the values um, is all very similar. Yeah, yeah, brilliant. Um, and again, that comes back to identifying the needs of local populations and engaging with them uh, to try and work out what's going to be best for them. Do you think people are realising um, in terms of communities uh, about how to become more sustainable in the long term rather than like on a short term day to day basis? Is that something you kind of in the first talk we were talking about how um, and in that film, Racing Extinction, right, the leads of the local mm -hmm. communities often focuses on like surviving day to day because it's yeah. not like they are the richest people in the world with an abundance. Yeah, yeah. They really have to struggle. Do you think people are realizing that there's kind of there should be more of long term efforts to preserve the environment? Is that something that you've kind of come across now or is that still difficult? It's something that's very difficult. So that's why we have to to have the approach of how to support their needs. So their needs is food security. And if you can um, to communicate that and show how they can plant food producing trees that are drought resistant. So in times of drought, it's a reality there that a lot of people are going to die. Um, I, I went, um, I was speaking to uh, just a child when I was in Haiti, uh, the project there, he said to, I said to him, like, what, what happens when the rain doesn't come? And they say, oh, like a lot of the crops die out. And I said, then what happens? And he says, a lot of people die. And then he just kept on walking and I'm just kind of stuck there like, it's so crazy how that's such a normalized reality for them. So yeah. they know when the rain doesn't come, there's going to be big, big problems. So once and the other side, people... when there's too much rain, like when I was in um, when I was in Kerala, when there's too much rain, people are drowning. So they've just kind of accepted that. That's yeah, 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 drowning, and then then crops also fail when there's too much rain so with this imbalance in weather patterns. So um, we're we're creating this kind of resilience with the local community. Uh, so um they start to see that and so when we're planting drought resistant trees these trees will still give uh, food in terms of drought and to, uh, to support their kind of basic needs that they have and it's haiti is very um the, is we're working in a village that's on the coast it's very reliant on fishing but the fisheries have been, de been depleted over the last few decades mm -hmm. and so that food source is becoming more scarce so instead of telling them as a vegan organization okay don't eat fish blah 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 we create a plant-based alternative for them that gives them long-term food security because these trees will give food for more than a hundred years. So yeah. creating yeah. that um, that generational um, approach and then they can see that this this these trees will feed their families for future generations. So, and again, so it's very hard to talk to them about- time to show them. Yeah, it's very hard to talk to them about sustainability, but if you can connect with them with the problems that they face and show how this can be a solution, then they connect with it much easier. Brilliant, brilliant. Um, so three quick questions. One, do you want to tell us about your vegan forest festival that you guys absolutely smashed recently? <laughs> How did that go? How long did it take to organize? Um, it's a big event and you guys pulled it together. So just tell us a little bit about that because people might want to join it in the future. Yeah, we we wanted to create an um, like Santa Forest is about creating actually social change. A lot of what we what I've been talking about, it seems like the physical change that we're trying to create through reforestation, water conservation, but that's actually a small part of Sadna Forest. The biggest part is the social change that we can create in the process of doing these things. So we're trying to create a culture of how we can show things can be done differently. So we were at some festivals in the UK uh, last year, recruiting volunteers, and it kind of inspired us to say, okay, we can actually do something like that, but we can um, to connect with uh, the Sadna Forest way of doing things. So we created a uh, completely free festival where there was no entry fee um, and then we cooked for everyone so 500 people across three days completely for free and we we have a kitchen where we feed ten, tens of thousands of free vegan meals a year so cooking for big quantities like uh, 200 people 300 people were quite common for us 
500 people was new and to do that for three days was a logistical nightmare to organize but we we pulled that off um and there was no selling or advertising or anything commercial at this whole festival it was just a space that people can come all over the world all over india to just come and give and share and it was we realized that all the infrastructure that we have here was like ideal to create a festival so we didn't have to put any ecological footprint in the infrastructure in this space we had to actually only build four new toilets um uh, because we had 14 um, and we thought, okay, 18 would be a good number. Um, so that was the only kind of infrastructure that we had, had to buy. We had to buy a few more big pots for our kitchen and things like this. So the ecological impact of it was so small and we're a solar powered community. Uh, so this was a very interesting aspect of it. And then also to create a substance free space where there was no drinking, um, smoking, drugs or anything like this, where people can just come and a safe space for everyone, families and everything to just kind of enjoy themselves and not being a space where it's kind of focused on intoxicating, but to focus on this intention that of this environment, this culture that we're trying to create in this space. Uh, so yeah, it was actually a massive success. It was so much to organize and there's so much that we learned from it and it's going to be much easier next time. Are you feeling confident about it next year now? Because I know you're a bit stressed with it all. Yeah, 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 yeah. We, we've got an amazing team here. Like our biggest strength as an organization is the people that we have. Um, and actually some of the people that we don't think we could have pulled it off without them were people that we found in the, the festivals that we went to in the summer. Like um, a few of the chefs that was cooking were from these festivals. We we had a sound engineer come like a week before um, who without him, like all the sound stuff, we wouldn't have been able to pull off. So like, um, yeah, different, loads of different people came uh, together to, to create a, an environment of space where people can experience something different. And the feedback that we were getting from the people were just amazing. They, they said there's just nothing like this that they've ever experienced. And yeah. that's what Sadhana Forest wants to be, a, a space where we can show things are different. Like if you said to anyone, we're going to do a festival that's going to be 100% vegan, 100% substance free and 100% free, um, no cost of entry or food for the whole three days, and um Probably like super sustainable, sustainable festival in the world yeah 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 yeah, yeah. like um the, the sustainability the footprint of it was like so insanely small um that they said yeah it wouldn't be possible and we well, we showed it was possible and it's actually something that we can scale up we can do even bigger and make it better and so much potential so again creating these environments for change to happen Yay, amazing well um yeah that is the point of uh being alive isn't it is creating meaningful connection and it sounds like you guys managed to do that really well and um it's getting the ball rolling and you learn from each event and you troubleshoot mm -hmm. and life is a learning experience yeah yeah, yeah, so, yeah, so yeah. Well um then two more questions i can't remember the last one but do you want to tell us about your uh, mobile reforestation unit which is relatively new what's happening with that yeah yeah so in um another space in south india we basically transformed a 50-seater bus into a living space for a team of four people where we have four beds and then we have um, toilet shower and a kitchen then under the bus we have like storage for all the equipment and we basically uh, the team are traveling around working with uh, local people uh, that are suffering from malnutrition in some of the driest parts of Tamil Nadu and planting food producing trees around their homes that so we spend about four to six months in each village and then we go to the next village and um, just kind of showing the power that an impact that a small group of people can be and if you think about and there are just four volunteers there and if you think about the uh, the cost of um, a organization to buy land, to build infrastructure, um, to have salaries for people and everything. The way that we're doing it by not having to buy land, just having a bus and transforming that and just having volunteers live in there. We can do a huge amounts of work um, to reach a uh, huge amounts of people with a very small team at a very low cost. So it's a model that we really want to replicate to, to have these buses traveling all around India, all around the world, where it's people just living them in a sustainable way, planting trees with local people and doing mass amounts of reforestation in the process. Amazing. It's mobile education, the dream. Uh, my last yeah, question, yeah. we've got a couple of minutes, is um, in an ideal world, you know, everybody would move to an eco community and live super sustainably. And we've got to realize that it might not be practical for everybody and people might be able to drop in and drop out. As I know, you know, some of our friends do come for a while. Um, how can we 
promote these messages to people who might not be able to cut, drop everything and move to somewhere? What kind of messages would you be able to uh, tell people to focus on to live more sustainably? I think, again, it's just going to the heart of it, of creating social change, and you're doing it in your ways uh, through this that is reaching out to a huge amount of people. And to, to realize the power our voice has, like even no matter what space or environment we're in, we can create this social change within ourselves. Uh, we can educate, we can learn more, and then we can practice it. And then people will be curious about how we're practicing. So, um, and then the change will just start happening. And uh, like we often talk a lot about changing the system, uh, creating a new system, whatever, uh, revolution, all these kind of things. But if we can start creating a revolution in our minds, and, and I think um, spirituality is a massive part of this, that is another whole topic um, to kind of go deeper, uh, kind of within ourselves. And this will start transforming the social change that we see in the world. And like sadhana is um, a focus of discipline towards a spiritual path and practice. And this is kind of our path, path but people can practice sadhana in all their types of um, walks of life that they're taking and just putting this kind of focus or discipline towards this uh, work they're trying to do with the intention of creating positive change. And yeah, there's many different ways people can do that. Amazing. Um, yeah, so I remember my last question, but I don't have time for it. And I could probably talk to you about it for like hours. And it was about compost toilets. But I'm going to leave uh, it at that. Yeah. And I really appreciate your time. Um, and it's nice to see you. So thank you so much. And thank you for the work that you're doing, as always. Thank you. Bye. Thank bye, you. Lee. Thank you. So oh, that was incredible, as I expected. And with that, I will move it over to uh, the wonderful Carlos, who's going to speak to us about his project in Oceana and what we can do um, to create a better environment for the sea and marine life. So uh, thank you, Luke, and welcome, Carlos. Thank you, Isani. How are you? Hi. So good. How are you? I am very good. I was thinking so much about Kodao and when I met you. So, yeah. Oh, we had the best time. It was incredible. The lectures, like that is my perfect life, is waking up for lectures, education, learning, sitting. And then when we're tired of lectures, having a fruit smoothie and having some, you know, vegan food that somebody cooked. And then we just go out diving, beach cleanups, litter picking. It was magical. How are you? Yeah, no, I want to say thank you so much for the invitation and, and congratulations for organizing all of this. And uh, yeah, I'm here to, to give a little bit of a presentation of what has been my life for the last five years, actually, from the moment I met you in Kotao. Uh, so I have a little presentation, if I can share it. Please, yeah, yeah, let me make you a host. Yeah, and you know that since then I've done my paddy scientific divers, conservation. I just want that to be my future. So I will be messaging you about uh, job ops with Inociana once I finish this GP training for sure. Great, perfect. So, okay, I'm gonna, I have two things. I have a little presentation here and then I have a little video. So hopefully it's gonna be inspiring enough and, and you're gonna enjoy how much I am enjoying the ocean for the last, day, the last years of my life. Okay, so, I start then. So, well, my name is Carlos Mayo and I am the CEO and founder of a marine conservation organization called InOceana. InOceana stands by innovation in the ocean. And actually what I've been trying to do with this organization is to start new conservation projects and new initiatives that make the difference. Um, right now we are in three countries. We are in Spain, especially in the Canary Islands. We are also in um, Costa Rica, where we have a marine conservation and education center, and we are in California. Um, we have projects that go from education to, part, to um, storytelling. We do a lot of projects with, um, with a, a lot of research projects. And finally, we focus in participation, trying to involve people in the ocean uh, to come with us to the ocean. Our final mission is we want everyone to fall in love with the with the ocean and what is under under it, and especially we are looking for scuba divers or people who who really want to enjoy the ocean and go to the next level. So this presentation is basically about how um, how I changed my life, and I want just to give a like maybe encourage people that are thinking, okay, maybe this is too difficult, this is impossible, like how I'm going to quit my job and start something because. It's not easy, but the truth is that it's possible. It's just a matter of um, it's just a matter of trying, and it's a matter of of working hard to make it happen. 
So um, there is this very, very good uh, sentence about the ocean that says that this is the worst of the times, but it's also the best of the times because we still can change the, the, the situation. This is from Sylvia Earle that probably some of you know her. She's uh, one of the most famous um, oceanographers, uh, marine biologists. She's from um, California. Well, she lives in California and she has uh, another organization called Mission Blue that we are actually partners and we, we have been working with them in different projects. But that's the, that's the truth. Like the ocean is not good. Actually, this morning I went to the ocean here in, I, I am in Barcelona at the moment and it's, it's polluted. It's really bad. But the truth is that there is, there is time to change that. And if people start like really um, paying attention and, 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 and feeling what is the ocean and, and why it's important the ocean, they will start like really making a difference. And by working together, we can do it. So, but this was me actually something like eight or nine years ago. I don't remember exactly. So I was working in as a civil engineer in the construction industry. So I was in charge of major construction projects like this bridge. This bridge is in the Canary Islands. So where uh, now I have a team of people working in marine conservation. So my life changed a lot. Actually, from this project, I moved to England and I was working for the HS2, the high-speed train. So I was living in London for, for one year, living in Birmingham for another two years. And that was when I went on holidays to Kotao, actually, in Thailand. And I was like, hold on, like, am I happy with my life? Am I actually doing what I love? And I discovered I wasn't. So I was, okay, well, I mean, the world is full of opportunities. Let's try something. So I put together some money and I quit my job. I quit my life in England and I went to, to work um, in marine conservation in, in a small center of um, marine conservation in, 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 in the south of Thailand, in, in, Kota, in an island called Kota. And that's where everything started. And from that moment, I have the experience of saving uh, two humpback whales in Costa Rica with my own hands, actually, I have like something that I'm gonna remember the rest of my life is uh, how I save this whale that you see in this picture. So you see all the entangled, the, 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 the fishing lines that the, the whale was entangled in. And yeah, I mean, if I wouldn't change my life, I would have never been doing this, this experience or, or this, um, this magical experience. And um, this took me a whole day of jumping in the water with knives and with other people. And we were like finally uh, rescuing this humpback whale, but along the along this way, I, I rescue some sea turtles, I rescue some other animals. So at the end of the day, is I feel fulfilled what I'm doing. And this is, of course, some of the things that is very easy to show, but my day a day is not this. I'm not rescuing animals all the time. I am mostly in my computer creating projects or like thinking ways of, um, of save the ocean. Another uh, cool thing that I've done in these last five years is create this center. So this is the first marine and conservation and education center. That's why it's called MCEC. So it's Marine Conservation and Education Center within Oceana. So we are the owners of this center that we are um, bringing all of the communities in Costa Rica, especially the young people, to learn about the ocean. We create documentaries, we show them, we bring them to the water in our boat. We are uh, going to build soon a hospital for sea turtles because there is a lot of sea turtles that require um, and that require at attendance. So basically, we are doing like really so many projects in this center, and it's the first marine and conservation education center focused on the underwater world in Costa Rica. So if you ever go to Costa Rica, contact me. We are in the South Pacific side. Um, another cool thing that. I don't, and this is probably the one that touched me the most. This is the south of Tenerife. And three years ago, there was an announcement from the government saying that they were going to build a new port. This new port was called El Puerto de Fonsalía. And I was, um, funny enough, in my previous job as an engineer, I was going to be working to build this, this port. So just to give you a bit of context, this port or mega port was going to be built in an area that is a marine protected area, is a hope spot of biodiversity, a hot spot of biodiversity, and also a sanctuary of whales. So basically, the construction of this was going to be really disruptive for the environment. Plus, in this area I know it like better than the living room of my house because I've been diving here like over a thousand times. So when this was announced by the government three years ago, I was okay, no, like I studied how to build this and now I changed my life to actually do something different. So I, I joined a movement to stop the construction on the port. At that point, it was like 
it was feeling almost impossible to stop this. Like in Spain, when there is a big project that the government wants to do, it, it then adds, uh, like the government build it and destroys everything. And then sometimes they, they finish the project and it's never used. So I put all of my energy as an engineer to do the opposite as I was what I was doing the previous year. So I, I work a lot to stop this port. So I started uh, creating new environmental impact assessments. I started working with the politicians and going to visit all of the politicians in the Canary Islands in person, explain them that I am not a guy that is going against everything, that I am an engineer, that I created a nonprofit organization in Spain to actually work in these kind of situations. And with the help of other incredible people, two years after this was announced, they are, the government announced that they weren't going to build it. And that was like really a, um, a moment, the moment of my life that uh, makes me feel, okay, makes sense what I'm doing. I'm really making a difference, but also um, I am showing my country the way to stop destroying the ocean. And that's that's the best thing, the, the best thing I've ever done in my life. So it's something that hasn't been very, um, let's say not many people know about did this happen, but I am pushing a lot now to create documentaries, to create stories because it's inspiring. And I really want to, uh, with this story to inspire other governments and other uh, communities to, to take the, this, uh, the, the, the leading on stopping the destruction of the coastline, because this is what is actually ending with the fishes, with the sharks, with the sea turtles. It's like the, 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 lo the loss of habitats. And again, if we create this massive structure here, the loss of habitat is going to be like really insane, super big. Um, so how I done, I just given you a, like a, a little bit of some of the biggest successful situation. I have so many others that weren't that successful. So it's not always easy. But uh, the way I, I understand uh, creating projects is, first of all, you need to have a good project. You need to focus on doing something that is meaningful, creating data, um, creating education portfolios, whatever. Do something that is that you are collaborating with people that know what you are doing and what your people are doing. And then use those projects to educate, because that's something that, in my opinion, sometimes uh, with the universities happens that they do a research project, but then the research project is finished and they, they put all of the papers or, or, or whatever research uh, docu documents in a, in a draw, and then nobody knows about that research anymore. And that's one of the things that I've been working so much to try to, to make a science that is available for everyone, but also that people can understand it. Because if people don't understand what you are doing, nobody's going to... Uh, care about it. The education is so important. That's how we can really inspire new generations, but in general, we can inspire the society to for a change. And the awareness, the awareness, because it's not just about the educate, it's also about showing the actual situation in the world. Like we, when the port was going to be built, we created even document, documents that were showing the how that port was going to be an economical problem for the Canary Islands. And that was important. So awareness and, and to show the people what is the impact of doing something is so important. So these are the three steps that if anybody's thinking, okay, what are the main ingredients that should have um, a nonprofit organization focus on, on marine conservation, for example, for instance, I think these are key. And I built this, this presentation in 2017 and I'm still using it. So I'm really convinced about it. Um, I mean, that, that is light. And just to, to be finishing, um, so that's another humbug whale, by the way, on the right side. This is not exactly the same one I, I rescue, uh, but it's, in the, it's, it's from the same family. So those humbug whales come to Costa Rica every, every July, August. Uh, they are coming from the South Hemisphere and they come back to the South Hemisphere around September, October. So just to finish with the idea of what is in Oceana. In Oceana is a movement or... Yeah, I say always that it's almost a community. I, I, I love using the word community. It's a community of people who love the ocean, but we are composed by engineers, biologists, and professional divers. But we also have lawyers. We have um, people that are good designers. We have just people who are good at, at in the ocean because they are very good at scuba divers, even maybe they didn't study. Doesn't really matter. People who love the ocean. That's the only requirements to be part of Inoceana. And today I have 25 people working full-time for us, um, part of them in Costa Rica, part of them in Spain, and part of them in California. And we are constantly creating new projects and, of course, constantly fundraising, trying to survive economically because the nonprofit world is very challenging and there is a lot of competition. But we are especially like really enjoying what we do because at the end of the day, this is what I say to my team constantly, like, guys, 
number one rule of this is, you know, this is like the fight club. The number one rule of the fight club in our case is to fall in love with the ocean and to, to keep in love with the ocean. So we're an international nonprofit, as I said, we are applying technology to create solutions. That's coming from my um, obsession as in, in the good way as an engineer. I, I, I like technology and I like the application of technology. Sometimes the, the technology is not applied in the good way, like for example, in the words, but sometimes it can be applied in, in a very good way. For, ex, for instance, with the humpback whales, we are applying hydrophones and a lot of acoustic technology to try to understand the language of the, of the humpback whales. And that's such a cool project that uh, hopefully in, in a few years, we will have a, a good data to understand it. We are also restoring seagrass. We are restoring the, the coral reef in, in the South Pacific of, of Costa Rica. So it's about using the technology for, for the good reasons. And of course, we are building awareness constantly through education. We just want everybody to love the ocean one more time. We want people to understand what they see and we want people to jump in the ocean and enjoy it. And don't think that there is gonna be a shark that is gonna kill them because that never happened. I mean, it's much easier to be attacked by a dog than by a shark. And people are super scared of sharks because the film of Joe's. That's, that was Steven Spielberg's <laughs> reality situation. So, and this is so frustrating when people are like really against sharks by no reason because they, they, they never been diving with them. And like in this picture that is in, in my background is in Cocoa Island and I was, I was there Many times that's a, an island in the middle of the Pacific Ocean. And I have the opportunity to be surrounded by sharks, hammerheads, tiger sharks, uh, white tip sharks, all of the sharks that I can imagine. And none of them like really even care about me. Like we are not anything for them. They are not interested. Unfortunately, the human is very interesting on them because uh, in, the, in, the, in Asia, in some countries, they use it, uh, the fins for uh, soup, uh, soup fin shark soup fin and that's a, a huge environmental problem because we need sharks for the regulation of the environment but anyway that's one of the many problems that are happening and many of the disconnections that the humans are are having with with the with the ocean um at the end we are just people and that's for me that's the main slide this is the main slide like we are normal people trying to change the situation so um i think in in different fields there is people doing different things but at the end for me, everything is the same. We are communities of people that love something and want to protect it. And that's what is in Oceana. Um, I think at this point, I'm going to stop. And I think uh, Is Ishani, uh, maybe you have some questions or um, so you can go for it. Perfect. Yeah, I've got so many questions and that was absolutely incredible. Um, shall I stop? If you can end your screen share, if that's okay. Yeah, I will. I will put a little video to finish when oh, you. Oh, perfect. But okay, yeah. lovely. Um, yes, yeah, so that was absolutely amazing, and it's made me really emotional. Actually, it's made me really, really emotional. I'm so impressed with your work and inspired, and I love seeing what you're doing. When I see you on social media, it's one encouraging, two inspiring, three incredible, and four just super motivating to get back in in the ocean with with the sharks. Okay, <laughs> they they're not interested in us, and I want people to understand that as well. It's so beautiful to see one, and it's such a privilege. And um, yeah, do you want? To tell us about how you became interested in in ocean conservation what's your background and story so yeah that's that's a good one so i was born in the north of spain in an area that is called galicia um, so i'm gallego that's how they call hey. the people that area <laughs> <laughs> my dad was a um is a civil engineer and he was building ports so actually i i, I was in, in the middle of the construction site of a huge construction project of a port in galicia and I was going to the beach since I was born, basically. So I think my parents brought me to the ocean so many times that at some point I, I just, I make a click and uh, my life uh, was so connected to it. And then when I study and I finished, I thought I was studying in Madrid and it was so far from the ocean. And during my study time, I was like, I need something. I don't know what it is. So when I finished my university, I, I, I went to Tenerife uh, to start working. And I understood that that was what I was missing. So I think the ocean has been in my DNA from since I was a kid. Mm, amazing, yeah. That's the only, es la única problema con Madrid. Es, es, es que no hay más, donde está yes. más. And <laughs> I feel like that here as well, because you went to Birmingham, is that right? Yes. What did you do in Birmingham? So yeah, I was, I was in Birmingham for two years actually. So I, 
I, I don't know if you heard about the HS2, that is the high-speed train that they are building between, um, well, it goes from London to Glasgow in the future. I don't know if it's going to happen. Yeah. But I was in charge of uh, the um, a section of the train between London and Birmingham. So I was in charge of one of those sections, especially the environmental part. So I was driving a team of like 150 surveyors, taking data of Great Crested Newts, Badgers, a lot of animals, the bats. <laughs> So I, I, I spent two good years of my life in Birmingham that were very, very amazing years. But first, it was very, very far from the ocean. And second, the weather was very bad. So yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, I thought of you because my brother is actually his second year in Birmingham now. And it's a brilliant, brilliant city. Pero no hay mar. Um, so, <laughs> so, OK, then talking about um, your, your work is just incredible. And you must have seen a lot of change since you started. Um, what, what has that change been in your opinion? Is there any positives that you've seen? Obviously, there must be so many negatives. How do you how do you balance all of that? Yeah, so that's uh, that's interesting. Um, I haven't seen a positive change, unfortunately, since I started this because uh, there is not enough investment. So yeah. the players that I am participating or we are creating are not big enough to see a big change, a big positive change. But the problem is that development is still happening. So mm -hmm. in an area that maybe there is some, let's talk about Kotao, for example. The, mm -hmm. Kotao, this, the guys in Kotao were doing an amazing uh, work there, but all of that coral reef that it was being restored, there was a huge monsoon. And after the monsoon, it was all destroyed. So the, the storm pretty much destroyed. In the Canary Islands, the areas that I used to dive in the past, uh, there was a lot of seagrass. Mm -hmm. And in the last 20 years, 50% of the seagrass of the Canary Islands has been has, has disappeared. Uh, whereas because of global warming, because of the warming. And it's, a big, it's a big, it's, it's a, it's a big mix of things. Um, global warming is one, acidification is another one. But as I say, construction in the coastline, sedimentation, um, anchoring from the boats, um, just sometimes it's just water pollution. It's a mix of, of situations, but the, the reality is that I know some uh, seagrass patches that I used to dive when I was diving in the Canary Islands back to 2015, and they are not anymore. So wow. in Costa Rica, um, in Costa Rica, probably is one of the places that I've seen some of the most inspiring changes because so there are some areas- a diverse place in the world. Yes, yeah, exactly. And some areas, uh, for example, there was uh, on the coast, an area that was open to the tourism and there was so many tourists going and walking on the rocks for uh, for many years. And we make a we, 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 we make a project there and we told to the government, OK, I, we believe that you should close this area because all of the tourists walking there are, are killing all of the crustaceans, are killing all of the invertebrates. They yeah. close it and now you come back there and you see how all of the animals, all of the invertebrates are coming back and are growing on the rocks. So yeah, I see also some positive change, but if I have to say the biggest positive change, uh, positive change that I see along the way is all of the people that I've seen that have changed in a in a better way their lives. So it can be like they are more sustainable now, or maybe they quit their jobs. In in Oceania, I have people that were direct the, um, the directors in in Sony, like big people in big companies in Amazon, and they quit their jobs, and now they are like by a very small salary, just working in Oceania and enjoying what they are doing. So it's it's that's the biggest change for me. That's incredible because you are connecting the most incredible people and it's brilliant. You know, every once in a while you put these posts with a bit of a bio about what people are doing and just seeing their backgrounds and actually how they got there because it's people with such a shared interest but that come from so many different walks of life. And I think that's absolutely incredible what you're doing, connecting people with, with, the, with the intention of making the oceans more sustainable and just a better place to live. So I've got a few questions. We just touched on um, marine protected areas. Obviously, there's a lot of uh, political work that has to be done in that. There is obviously a lot of positive. How are you working about um, engaging governments to show that marine protected areas are beneficial? How is that? How, how are those communications going? Yeah. So, for example, I'm going to focus on Costa Rica. In Costa Rica, we designated uh, with Mission Blue. Um, we, we made a hope spot with them. So it's the area where we work. Mm -hmm. And um, since 2017, 2018, we started to gather data and show the government, okay, here we found this huge garden of gorgonias, or here we found a new species that has never reported before. We found the Mokaran uh, hammerhead, that is the great hammerhead. That is very difficult to see. Or here, like uh, we've seen a lot of fishing in this area that shouldn't be happening because they are taking these this species that are in danger. 
So it has been a, a bunch of um, initiatives and projects, but so far the government is, is really willing into, into the direction of protecting that area. And I hope that in some years, the government is going to create a by law an MPA. Brilliant, brilliant, because they must be realizing that their biodiversity is what attracts a lot of tourists. And if they lose that, they're going to lose a massive proportion of their income. So it's, it's business, that long term. Exactly. Long -term it's the business job. model. I, I always tell the government, you have a business model that you're going to lose if you don't do anything. Brilliant. Yes. And it's about making them realize that. That's incredible. And it can be it can be much more difficult in poorer communities that are trying to survive on a day to day basis, as we discussed before. But exactly. I, I, I would love to schedule a conversation with you to discuss all of this at length, because this is what I want my future to be. Um, with regards to, I think, with regards to diving, there uh, for me now there is no such thing as a recreational drive. Recreational dive, it doesn't exist. A rec dive doesn't exist. Like there has to be some kind of, some kind of structure, some kind of purpose. You know, it's like if you go out for a walk, you have to pick up some rubbish. There's no such thing as a rec walk now. As divers, what can we be doing in order to be more aware, more sustainable, and in order to 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 promote marine health? Yeah, I think. That, that's um, I agree with you. I have the same problem. Now I cannot go just diving. I want to, to know more. Uh, we, actually, in Costa Rica, we do what we call diving with a purpose because it's exactly that. It's like, let's do something more. And it's what we were doing in Cotao. So I think as divers, we have a responsibility uh, to tell people, hey, I want to know more. So if, you, if we tell to the, to the dive centers, but I want to know about this, I, maybe they don't tell you, but they will start hearing it and they were, oh, okay, there is a business model here. So I think as divers, our responsibility is like when you go to a bar and they put you a straw, a plastic straw, you say, I don't want it. At some point, they are going to stop doing it. So it's yeah. the same. It's just about telling to the dive centers and the, the instructors, hey, what is this? What is that? Or what can I do? And then they will start offering uh, different things that can be what we want. <laughs> Brilliant. That's absolutely brilliant because um, obviously the structures that we saw in Kotal, um, amazing, the, one, the things that we were building on. And can I tell you, that was the most life changing experience for me, meeting you and meeting Elle and meeting Bob. You know, it was you guys are just so driven and so educated and it's all like evidence based. And for me, that was life changing. So thank you. Um, obviously, one of the concerns here is about where we put these things, because I was thinking about uh, I want to build an artificial reef and I'm thinking about about maybe um, speaking to somewhere just outside Malaga because it's quite calm there and they don't have that much going on in terms of diving. But maybe if we created a reef, you've got to think about the, you've got to think about the current. There's so much to think about when creating these structures. Where do you start? Yeah, that, that was actually when I went to Cotao, the first thing uh, as an engineer, I wanted to build things. So I have even a, a, a small prototype of artificial reef that was easy to build and the materials and whatever. Uh, what I understood in Kotao, for example, people were just throwing to the ocean trash at some point because they just were trying things. Uh, I think it's very important. It's more important than building artificial reef is to understand if it's necessary the artificial reef and understand what is the the model, how the artificial reef is gonna is gonna interact with the environment. And for that, there is a lot of information that needs to be gathered, starting from water quality, as you said, currents, uh, weather. Uh, like biodiversity, because sometimes with an artificial reef, you can create a lot of fishes area, an area for fishing, and that's good for fishermen, but maybe you are not creating the biodiversity or the ecosystem that is needed. So it's just about making a super in deep study. And unfortunately that requires a lot of fundings. And that's the, the, the biggest struggle in marine conservation that finding, finding fundings is, is challenge. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So something my mom said to me actually the other day when I was just chatting to her and she knows that I want to spend more time in the sea and that I want to do this. She said that they're starting the University of Gibraltar, which is going to have one of the biggest marine conservation organizations. So I'm thinking because I'm only just outside in Malaga. I'm going to go and start harassing them. So I would love to speak to you about what I should be speaking to them about and how we can try and do something and, and make them enroll in a project that might be, you know, long term conservation goals. But the last thing I'm going to ask you, which is a bit uh, a bit negative and a bit heavier thing. So I do apologize. I'm just trying to process my thoughts is about this. Um, appalling octopus farm that they want to put, I think it's in the Islas Canarias. Could there potentially be any benefit to this? Have you been thinking about it? Could we possibly make any benefits to this at all? I wouldn't even know where to start. So within Oceana, we sign the, we are part of the, of the platform of uh, nonprofits that are against this. So in Oceana has been um, signing all the papers and whatever. Yeah. Um, in my opinion, I mean, if we do that in, in 
I, I will be very, I'm already, I'm already having issues with my country because it's the number one fisher of uh, sharks in the world. Yeah. And um, with that, we could be doing another horrible thing that we shouldn't do because at the end of the day, octopus are uh, ultra intelligent animals that we don't know anything. And doing a farm of octopus, that is something that has never been done before, is not going to bring any benefit, ethically yeah. talking, but also for the environment. So I think it's... Um, I don't think it's. I don't think it's going to happen. Thankfully, because there is a lot of pressure from all around the world. Is if this happened, they want to do it in Gran Canaria. I have a team of people in Gran Canaria that are also like like going against the government, saying, "Hey, hey, what are you thinking about here?" And so I think it's a horrible idea, and I don't think it's going to happen. I'm just, like that's the amazing, brilliant. Uh, that, that reassures me because it gives me not much in life gives me anxiety, but that the thought of that gives me anxiety. They are the most wonderful creatures in the world. So, Carlos, I will be harassing you with a lot of questions, and I just want to pick your brains about so many things. Thank you for your work. Thank no. you for your time, uh, and it's just lovely to see you and catch up. Same, we are in touch. We are in touch. Bye. Hasta luego. Oh, gracias. Yeah. Right, that was absolutely incredible and super inspiring and super motivating. Um, there's so many different things that we can do when we go to the beach, when we go to anywhere that there is water, because water harbors so much life. You know, as Luke said before, where there is water, there is life. And if you can just, you know, bring um, some gloves and just make sure you've got a couple of bags on you, just even if you go out for a walk, any litter picking that you can do. Um, to prevent any plastic from getting in any water, then that's going to be beneficial. If you can go to the beach and you see any kind of fishing lines, then just make sure that you carefully um, untangle those, but just be careful of sharks. Um, if you do go uh, diving and you're fortunate enough to, to spend some time underwater, then there's lots of things to think about, such as um, using reef safe sunscreen that's a massive one because that can be super toxic to to the water and to the environment and that's something that a lot of people don't know um, but also just being cautious that your dive equipment and that your um, that your snorkeling equipment doesn't hit rocks and things like that so loads of things that we can do to be careful and cautious um, sea explorers but please definitely get your feet in the ocean and get your hands on some conservation as well. So with that, I would like to welcome the wonderful Margaret Clotworthy, who I met, as I said, at Jane Goodall's event a few months ago. I was so blessed um, that we just started chatting. She actually said hello to me and I was so, so lucky to have that interaction because there's so much to learn from her and she's an incredibly um, inspiring, talented, educated, smart, hilarious woman um, that also cares a lot. Um, so with that, welcome Margaret. Hi, Shani. Thanks so much for inviting me. And it was wonderful to meet you. And I, I had to speak to someone wearing such an amazing red dress. And I'm so glad you turned out to be an amazing person all around. Oh, my goodness. So. <laughs> Thank you so much. It was funny because we were wearing, we were both wearing amazing red dresses. I just had the best evening with you. We just chatted the whole time and we just the whole like, time. Look about amazing. ideas. And it was so, yeah, it was absolutely brilliant. And I was actually speaking for an organization that you used to work for just coincidentally. So it was all very coincidental and all wonderful. Very small world in a strange sort of way, but it was wonderful. Absolutely, yeah. It was How are you? Highlight. Great, thank you. Yes, yeah. It's been mad busy. I'll be able to talk a bit about that, but we've had uh, lots and lots of bunnies with complicated medical issues uh, lately, etc. So it's been it's been quite difficult. So but, you've you know, got about four full time jobs, am I right in saying you've probably got about <laughs> four full time jobs? It, fe it feels like that. So yes, I've got my bunny sanctuary and I've got uh, I've got my business that funds my bunny sanctuary as well. But it's all about the animals, really, at the, at the end of the day. Um, you know, it, it, they, even the business is all very linked with that as well. So it's a uh, it's ma it's marvellous, really. But yes, definitely, definitely keeps my days pretty full. So I'm really <laughs> glad I managed to escape for an evening that day. <laughs> yeah, I know. I'm really happy that you came. And if you're ever in London, then please come and say hello. And I do plan on coming and visiting you when I've finished uh, my GP exams in a couple of months. So with that, that would you like to tell us about your work? I my screen. Turning on. Da, 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 da. Share screen. Hopefully. I will oh, make it. It's me. Oh, thank <laughs> But thank you so much for inviting me. I, I'm very chuffed to get to speak to your lovely. My pleasure. Your lovely. Yes. Let me just see. Let me try that again. I do have your presentation. Are you okay? I guess it did work. So <laughs> thanks very much. Sorry, it took me a moment to figure that out. 
there. Slide share. Can you see that okay? Absolutely fine. And oh, is that you stroking one of your rabbits? That's Carlton. That he's my soulmate. He's uh, yeah. He's uh, we adore each other. I adore all my bunnies, but he is my he's my baby. Um, he's sweet. He's, he's very devoted. Um, he he's just uh, recovered from having a uh, a sperm uh, cord a tumor removed, which is very rare in bunnies. Uh, so, but he's doing brilliantly, as you can see. He's also the bunny who choked, and I had to give mouth to mouth resuscitation to two years ago as well. So <laughs> he's been. <laughs> you couldn't make this up. I um he he's he lives in my bedroom with his girlfriend. Um, fortunately, she doesn't get too jealous. Um, she loves me as well. So, <laughs> so yeah, he's Carlton is definitely the star, uh, the star of the show, Shawnee. Um, he is he is amazing. Um, yeah, that's that's that <laughs> that's Carlton. You'll see a little bit. You'll hear a little bit more about Carlton in the course of the course of the presentation. Some of it I'll probably have to skip through a little bit because I may have been a bit ambitious. There's just so much that I want to say and there's just so many interesting uh topics to cover but maybe if something particularly piques someone's interest uh, you can ask a question and uh and i'll get back to it in the in the q a part so so yes so i'm here to talk about tanglewood warren uh, which has recently been registered as a, a charity which is really exciting and tissue for research which is doing business as accio biobank online human specimens only we're very strict about that although we do get asked for animal specimens which drives me around the bend especially if people won't accept the human version which is obviously more relevant if you are conducting human uh well research intended to benefit humans but i will i'll talk about that in a moment so briefly uh first a little bit about me so uh on the left is a picture of me when i was seven and back in 1987 with moxie my first bunny um who i got on my seventh birthday and she really ignited a lifelong passion for rabbits in particular, animals in general. And uh, I was not a great carer. I, I loved her to bits, but I, looking back, I was, I, I was so ignorant and lacking in empathy and understanding of what she needed. And I'm basically spending the rest of my life, I think, trying to make up for that and trying to educate people and rescue um, bunnies who don't have a good home to go to unfortunately the scale of the problem is epic but that's um she really started started me off down this um, trail of having a bunny sanctuary um i'm a scientist by training so i did my uh undergraduate degree in biotechnology in dublin and then i did my doctorate in cambridge uh in cell biology but i realized i didn't want to be an academic scientist to my surprise and um, while during the course of my phd so i thought well I'll, I'll, I'll look at getting into a career in conservation. Got some experience in Thailand, uh, working as a vet nurse in a vet clinic, um, helping with dog and cat neutering, um, mapping an area of jungle to be used as a pre-release site for Asiatic black bears, et cetera. But they kicked me out when I didn't want to study lab mice uh, behavior instead of bear behavior. Um, it, it wasn't run by scientists or conservationists. So it was all a little bit crazy, but it was it was valuable. Um, experience. And so I got a position uh, with a wonderful charity, Safer Medicines Trust, and they promote human biology based methods of medical research, but not from an ethical perspective, from a purely scientific perspective. And they're a wonderful charity. And I became science director there. Um, and I pitched this. I noticed during the course of my time there that we had connections with wonderful hospitals who wanted to make specimens available to researchers and also researchers on the other side who were looking desperately for the blood samples, swabs, leftover tissue samples, et cetera, that they need for all their research and couldn't find them. I thought, well, let's bring people together, reduce you know, wasted samples and improve human health and um, do it while sparing animals. But thankfully, neither uh, I spoke to a couple of charities, neither was interested. And so I set up Accio Biobank Online myself. That, that was back in 2012. And in December, Tanglewood Warren became a registered charity, which is very exciting. So why do uh, you know, why, why is there why do we need a rabbit sanctuary, another rabbit sanctuary? What, 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 what's, what's the crisis and what's causing it? Well, back in 2012, there were 67,000 unwanted pet rabbits going into rescues around the UK every year, which is mind boggling. And they're the lucky ones. They're the ones who aren't being uh, dumped uh, as strays or, or being just simply being put down by the vets. 
Um, and those, you know, so those are the lucky ones. This year, goodness knows, there hasn't been a recent survey, but the perception is certainly that it's the worst it's ever been. Um, and some people are even closing rescues due to due to the, the stress of not being able to cope with the you know torrent of bunnies that they're being asked to accept and which they just can't cope with. Some of my friends have res um, with rescues have 250 rabbits on their waiting list. And but with especially with the current economic situation, fewer people are donating, fewer people are rehoming. And so it's a perfect storm, really. You've got more rabbits coming into rescue or being asked to be taken into rescue because, uh, because a lot of people got um, rabbits during co lockdown. And this is the same, not just for rabbits, but for other pets as well. But there was a surge in pet ownership during lockdown. People didn't really know what they were doing. Vets really weren't available. There were unwanted litters. Now add in the, uh, the, 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 the economic situation and rabbits are just being given up at an unprecedented rate. And I would say, please, I'm sure I'm absolutely preaching to the choir here, but please adopt rather than shopping because every, every animal, whether they come from a breeder or anywhere else, deserves a wonderful home. But if you buy from breeders and pet shops, you're fueling a really cruel trade where unwanted um, rabbits and other animals are killed if they're not sold if, um, or given to rescues, if they're lucky and if the, if the rescue has space to take them. Uh, rabbits are the third most popular pet in the UK, but they are hugely misunderstood. They, are, they need specialist vet treatment. They're technically classified as exotics. Basically, anything that isn't a cat or a dog is classified as an exotic. Um, their average lifespan, judging by a survey of a million vet records recently, is three or four years. Actually, they should be living 10 or 12 years. So that's a pretty shocking indictment of how your average rabbit is being cared for. So uh, oh, I kind of already skipped through that. Uh, so there we go. Um, also, owners think they're going to be cheap and easy child-friendly pets, but they are, they're fragile, they're long-lived, they need companionship, they, they, you know, they, they can have very, very high vet bills, a CT scan, it costs anything from a thousand to three thousand pounds, uh, definitely get pet insurance, I think, if, if you, if you can, if you do have bunnies, they have specialist dietary needs, the number of rabbits I've rescued that have been given a muesli diet rather than the pelleted diet, which is just so much better for their teeth and guts, and being fed carrots, the, sort of the Bugs Bunny, uh, the Bugs Bunny myth lives uh, lives on. And also, there are breed problems, just like in dogs, where people think, oh, bunnies with cute with short flat faces are cuter, bunnies with lop ears are cuter than the more natural looking bunnies, and that leads to eye problems, teeth problems in particular, ear problems, etc. So just like there have been campaigns uh, at Crufts, etc. and the Kennel Club to try and uh, stop people from breeding uh, dogs who are inherently going to have breathing difficulties or other difficulties that are really bad for them, we have the same problem with rabbits. Um, so our small contribution to uh, uh, the, uh, fixing the problem of unwanted rabbits is Tanglewood Warren. And here are a few pictures of uh, some of the bunnies and some of the accommodation at Tanglewood. So um, on the right, we've got, we can't, can't really see it very well, but hang on, I think maybe, but uh, oh, sorry, going to clear that. Um, it, we've got large outside enclosures, but we've also got lots of indoor enclosures. So sorry, can you see that? That is a bit of a pain. Can you see some do, do not disturb notices on there? Yeah, I can, but it's okay. I'm so okay. sorry. I don't know. <laughs> Getting rid of it. Let me see a little rabbit face there. <laughs> just, oh, okay. I will, I will not touch anything again. Um, so this is the lay, a brief layout of the sanctuary. So um, it's a, I've got a four bedroom house absolutely filled with bunnies um everywhere we're big fans of uh of uh well uh, of uh fantasy films and books etc so we've got lots of <laughs> they're all named after after uh different places etc so we've got um so on the left it shows the inside layout and on the right we've got the the, the out, all of the outside enclosures the biggest one is probably about 26 feet by seven feet for a couple of bunnies but a lot of them are enclosures are a little bit smaller but people do frequently underestimate 
uh, how much space bunnies need. And so the minimum is 60 square feet, so 10 feet by six feet roughly. But we do always endeavor to give them a lot more than that. Uh, we've got 48 bouncing bunnies, all shapes and sizes. Uh, the Legolas and Fleur, who are on the right hand side, are the most dramatic example of that a 1.5 kilogram bunny with a 4.2 kilogram bunny. Um, some are rehomable, but most are permanent because of age or health issues. They can get the full range of health issues that you might expect from cancer, heart disease. You know, we've got one recovering from pancreatitis at the moment, all sorts of all sorts of things, anything you can imagine that can, that can go wrong, can go wrong. Uh, so there are a lot of challenges running a, a sanctuary, as you might imagine, but for the sake of anyone who might be thinking of running through it, of, of, of doing something similar, I'll just uh, explore those a little bit. So. It, you, you've got to provide, uh, as far as possible, you've got to provide all of the members of the sanctuary with companionship, lots of space. It takes a lot of time to medicate bunnies, give them attention, uh, uh, clean them out. Infection control, even in a quite a decent sized space, is a big issue when you've got, in our case, 48 bunnies, because if one bunny gets, uh, say, a, a fecally spread uh, infection, you've got to have, well, we have foot dips everywhere. So training people to use those and ensuring everybody uses those, everyone uses the hand gels, et cetera. It's, it's, a big, it's actually a big undertaking. Staffing is, is, is difficult to get the right staff. Um, many have health issues and the vet bills are, are extraordinary. I think ours, I mean, I mean I, I've already spent 30K um, just this year on, on the vets uh, at least. Um, and also there's the emotional toll uh, the, the, the trauma really of having to say no um, when you're asked to take on more bunnies because you just haven't got the room, the staff, the you know the, the, the time, the money um, to take care of them. And then you're worrying about what's happening to those, trying to help them find other sanctuaries with space and everyone's full. It's really, it's really quite stressful. And obviously there are the heartbreaks when someone passes as well and, and the difficulties of funding everything. So the funding aspect brings me on to the uh, company side uh, side of things. So we're a for-profit company, but we have a charitable arm, which is Tanglewood Warren, uh, which pre pre pretty much takes uh, takes everything. Um, and again, we're a medical research um, company, but it's for me, it's all about, it really is all about, all about helping the animals. And, uh, you know, we provide human specimens for, clinically relevant research, far better than using animals. And we work with hospitals and pathology services. We mainly work in the US actually, we're, we're completely virtual um, to reduce wasted specimens. So if you have a blood sample taken and there's a bit left over, which there usually is, or you have maybe a tumor removed, something like that, the leftover bit that isn't needed or leftover swab, et cetera, that isn't needed for diagnostic purposes, will usually just get incinerated or sit on a shelf for years in the case of, let's say, a tissue block, um, go, going to waste where it could be used for research. And so that's where we come in. We also work with body donation centers, organ transplant organizations for non-transplantable organs. We're not in any way in competition with those, with, with transplant, I mean. And every specimen that's used from a human ethically obtained is uh, one fewer animal used in labs, which has got to be a wonderful thing. And of course, my company funds my sanctuary. And uh, so the problem we're trying to address, as I alluded to, is vivisection. So studying animals in labs, which is obviously cruel, um, but it's required for leg legislate by legislation and regulations for new drugs, devices, etc., to be introduced into the clinic. So currently, but the FDA and other organizations are moving towards, well, they've already you know, accepted non-animal methods and they're moving towards phasing out as many, well, well a lot of an, um, animal um, tests. Not on a quick enough timescale, especially given the amazing human biology-based methods we have, but still progress is being made and we're trying to make it easier for people to get hold of human specimens. Another problem is that uh, the fox is in charge of the hen coop, really, when it comes to peer review of animal testing studies. So you're supposed, if you, you want to carry out animal research, you're supposed to prove that you've looked into it and there's no other way. 
of carrying out that research. But if the people reviewing your application are also people who use animals, I mean, really, how dedicated to ensuring that you've found um, alternatives wherever possible are they going to be? And also when it comes to validating non-animal methods, people, their reviewers often want the results to be validated against animal test results, like they're the gold standard. What you need to do is validate against existing human data, of course. There's also the difficulty or perceived difficulty of obtaining the human specimens you need. Paperwork, there's certainly more paperwork in countries like the UK than in other countries. But I think often it's more a perception that things are going to be difficult that puts people off rather than actually trying the process and discovering that it's uh, impossible because it's not. And also a lack of awareness of human biology based methods and their real advantages. So where, that's where we come in, really trying to make it easier for people to get hold of those specimens, because any aspect of medical research requires human specimens in order to be truly relevant as well as being obviously more ethical. So um, you've got you know, the issue that animals don't predict human responses very reliably, and you need human specimens to test new drugs. For example, if you want to take, uh, you know, if you want to see whether a potential new cancer, anti-cancer agent works on different types of tumor, you can get different types of tumor from a wide range of people. Um, for efficacy testing, medical device development, diagnostics, as I mentioned, things like COVID, and as well as basic research, educating and training um, doctors, et cetera. And I, I, I definitely don't have time to go into antibody generation. Sorry, I know I'm, I'm, I'm skipping through a few things here, but animals are still, you know, people, animals are, sorry. So we, have we, get ten, to say we have 10 minutes buffer, so don't worry, please don't rush, you're fine. Oh, okay, great. <laughs> okay, thanks. I'll talk a little bit longer then. Um, so uh, we've got the, um, it's absolutely inexcusable in this day and age that animals, including a lot of uh, rabbits um, as well as other animals are having uh, substances injected into them to generate antibodies uh, for diagnosis or in order to stain you know to, to find out what's in in, in different tissues etc um, and this is you know there, we just have so many better methods now available I really recommend looking at affability AFA rather than AFFA um, an amazing uh, EU report came out recently maybe a year or two ago now actually, um, that showed that there is no scientific justification for continuing to use uh, animal generated antibodies anymore because since the 1990s, we've had different technologies for producing antibodies and there are advantages actually to using uh, non-animal antibodies, but there's the difficulty of, in some cases, cost or perceived difficulty, even though they're faster, with scale, they'd probably all be cheaper, but there's also people go with um, people go with what they know. And uh, even if they, they you know, sort of, I suppose they think the devil they know is better than the devil they don't know. And they're familiar with the many, many problems generating antibody use, um, in, in animals involves. But there's really no excuse. Um, some of the advantages, on the other hand, of human biology based medical research is obviously you're studying the correct species. So you're going to have more accurate results. Um, samples from many different patients, which is much more realistic, can be studied. So patients are more complicated than um, lab animals. You know, they come in different ages. They've got different, you know, other diseases going on. Uh, they're on other treatments uh, rather than just the disease and just the treatment that you would rather look at, et cetera. And also you can introduce specimens from different populations and be more realistic. So from different ethnicities, different countries, et cetera. And there's also advantages in terms of speed and throughput and um, cost in many cases, although that would probably improve a lot with increased uh, adoption. And there's also precision medicine where there are companies already, if you have a tumor removed and part of it can be sent off to a company that will grow your tumor and test a battery of different uh, anti-tumor agents on that drug, on that, on your tumor, so that you have a good idea what uh, therapeutic is most likely to work for you, which is obviously going to reduce the time wasted maybe on drugs that won't work for your tumor, as well as reducing un unwanted side effects really from taking specimens that work, taking drugs that won't work anyway. Um, obviously it's more ethical. 
there is actually a precedent as well because Moderna's um, COVID vaccine went into clinical trials on the same day as they started animal tests. So that was really exciting news. Uh, they, I really highly recommend looking up uh, Don Ingber uh, at the Weiss Institute for his videos about lungs on chips and other different organs on chips. He's absolutely amazing. Got to meet him at a conference last year. He's, he's a complete legend. Um, and he's just doing such, but and many other researchers are doing such amazing research in terms of miniaturizing different organs, tissues, et cetera, and linking them with blood to get realistic representations of you know, real humans, real human results, but in a smaller, cheaper, and obviously much safer scale. Um, organoids or, and also spheroids, something we contribute lots of specimens to. So people grow cells taken from a tumor or maybe normal tissue taken adjacent to the tumor, grow it up, and uh, the cells cultured in the grown in the correct way will form uh, miniature versions of the organ that they came from. So obviously that's fascinating in terms of testing new drugs and also studying the development, for example, of the brain. Obviously you don't actually want it to go the whole, to become a whole brain, but you know, it becomes for obvious ethical reasons. <laughs> but that's, you know, it, 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 these are absolutely amazing tools. And, you know, there's a picture of a whole heart there, but you can go down to precision cut organ slices you can for testing drugs, testing contractility, testing uh, you know the, the electrical responses of the heart in response to different treatments, etc. And uh, very quickly, um, a few lessons I've learned from running a sanctuary in a business. So, as I said, staffing is the biggest issue that we faced. Um, finding find the right people, and that's half the battle. It's much easier to train people with a great attitude and a great work ethic who really care about what they're doing. Than to find fully trained people and try to inculcate that attitude and 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 that that, that value system in them. Uh, we've got a really diverse range of people working for us. We've got uh, my second in command at my business is a is an ex bomb disposal guy from the army. Not an obvious candidate for going into biobanking, but he's absolutely fantastic. One of our best uh, bunny care uh, people is a, a, a former hairdresser. Uh, you know, we've got, it's just finding the right people and, and training them the right way. But with, if people are willing to learn and really care about what you're doing, that's far more important than uh, the actual skills that they come to you with. And we have trial days and practical tests because it's so difficult to find out whether someone's trustworthy from a half, you know, half hour interview. And I, I really recommend um, getting an HR help. Um, we, we use Peninsula in case anyone's thinking of going down that route. And then in, in other terms, I'd say don't underestimate the, the you know, the, well, everything involved in, in running a sanctuary and indeed a business, you know, the time, money, energy, the, the emotional toll it can take. And don't expect everyone to understand because a lot of people, you know, just want to work nine to five and clock off at the weekend and, and they, won't, they won't understand why you're devoting your life to doing, uh, to changing the world. So, uh, you know, try and connect with people who, who are on your wavelength. And I know I'm, I'm talking, preaching to the converted here, but I'd also say if people are telling you everything's difficult, like setting up a charity or setting up a business, you know, give it a whirl yourself because people will often say it's more difficult than, than it is. Either, you know, I don't know, for whatever reason to put you off because they were scared of doing it or maybe they had a particularly hard time. But, you know, things I listened to other people who said that um, registering as a charity was a nightmare. It, you know, it wasn't a barrel of laughs, but it was a lot easier than I thought it would be. And I wish I'd done it years ago. Um, so if you're unsure about anything, I'd say get some experience. Talk to people who have done it and who you, who you trust and just start and trust yourself, really. Because until you it's all very well theorizing about things. But until you actually get stuck in and give something a whirl, you don't know really how it's going to go. And uh, thanks very much for listening. There are some links in case anyone's interested in looking at our website. Oh, oh. And there's a petition halfway back down, down the page about stopping, you know, a rabbit sale amnesty, basically, to stop selling animals, breeding and selling animals for sale until we've got the rescue situation under control. But uh, thanks ever so much for listening. Thank you. 
Oh my gosh, I could sit and listen to what you've been doing for so long, Margaret. It's absolutely incredible. And I love, because I wasn't really sure whether to ask you to present about one thing or the other, um, but you've just created an incredible fusion to explain both of your passions and interests. And I think that's absolutely incredible. So thank you so much for that. Oh, thank you. Oh, glad, glad you liked it. <laughs> no, no, it's absolutely brilliant. All right, I'm just going to reclaim that. Okay, lovely. Yeah, so can you tell us a bit about your first rabbit? How did that come oh, about? Yes. <laughs> I, I think I've been pestering my mum for a bunny for a, a while, as children often do. And thankfully, she eventually caved in. And I remember going to the pet shop and just, uh, you know, seeing Moxie and pointing and saying that one and her turning up in a box on the Saturday of my, you know, after my birthday and just being, um, and just, you know, just being tremendously excited. But I, you know, they're not fantastic pets for, for children and inevitably children, you know, it's usually the, it's the parents really who have to look after and be prepared to look after, <laughs> after uh, uh, any, any, any pet. But she was amazing. She was my best friend in what was a uh, not not really a very pleasant childhood and uh, she was just you know she was just amazing and such a sweet friendly bunny who was just she was she was really my best friend I I, I have to say she was uh, amazing oh, um, I had and then, what, did that kind of spark an interest in rabbit rehab from there or did it come from the from the animal investigations which are completely unnecessary like how did that grow I think it all grew from my love for Mopsie, really, uh, and and uh, you know the, just the the distress of of realizing that there was so much cruelty out there, and some of it you know legally uh, legal and, and legally mandated, and just how unaccept how unthinkable it was that there were rabbits and other animals, obviously, just like my beloved Mopsie, who who were who were being mistreated, and so it really really grew from there. Yeah, brilliant. And it must be very, very frustrating for you as a biologist and a scientist to see all of the unnecessary investigations, um, you know, considering you've just put it into perspective that there are so many different tissues that we can be testing on that are human, that are representative of what the medications that we want to be using are. Do you know any statistics or numbers that I could possibly give to, you know, what, what, just think about? Do you know how effective um, or ineffective rather animal testing is? Well, so for example, um, some statistics which came out a few years ago that were published um, by the FDA, I think, which is the US um, drug regulator, showed that 92% of drugs that enter clinical trials after going through animal tests fail. So, I mean, that's, you know, <laughs> that's a, and I wow. think it was 96% of, of anti-cancer agents. Wow. So, so you've got, on one hand, you've got the fact that, you know, it's a, it's a terrible, uh, new drugs are often really, are always really expensive because they're not just paying for the drug that made it to, to the market. They're paying for the, the other 96 that, <laughs> that didn't, that, right. that failed, that they spent a fortune on developing, et cetera. Yeah. And I think the more human biology we introduce into the phases before getting into people, obviously the better it's going to be. Because if you've got a, animal tests are obviously going to get it right you know, some of the time, even even a coin toss, will get it right fifty percent of the time. We start, yeah. we we share fifty percent of our genes with bananas. You know, yeah. I mean, sometimes yeah. you're going to get the correct results. Yeah. But yeah. can we do better? And we can do better now. Um. And so with animal, if you rely on animal tests, not only are you letting through drugs that don't work and maybe have bad side effects, but you are perhaps also we'll never know the scale of it because they they got rejected. But you're rejecting drugs that, um turned out to be damaging in animals but maybe would have been fine for people or for a proportion of people because as we as you know as being a doctor a medical doctor people react differently to various treatments you can't just say oh this drug passed through clinical trials it's going to be safe and work for everybody yeah that's not the case which is why you have to look you know not look in different species altogether but look in different people and try and stratify okay, what, what, what genetic signals or proteins or what, what signs does this person have that say, oh yes, based on the trials we've done, this person is a really good candidate for being helped by this drug or, oh, you know, that, that, that person's likely to react really badly. That's the way to go, more personalized medicine, not trying in different species as is the current, the current way. You have to have results in at least two different species showing that it's safe and effective before yeah. you can go into animals. 
So you're obviously coming from a massive top down approach and attacking the source, which is absolutely incredible. If we can manage to change legislation, legislation that will be game changing. Have you found that there is less and less resistance with this? Have people understand it more. What's your perspective of, of how your approach has been going? Absolutely. I think we've never we've never seen um, more demand for human specimens, which is really exciting. And we're seeing that, you know, the regulators are becoming more open to results generated from um, human biology based methods, so human tissues, etc. And some of the people who are generating those tissues are, are work now working, gen generating those assays and now working with them, the regulators in order to get those validated more quickly and more what get them more widely accepted so we're definitely making progress and I would say if you ever get a chance to sign petitions or you know in terms of cosmetics etc buy the leaping bunny um cosmetics or the or the Peter approved cosmetics etc that will still make a difference and also people don't realize that things like household detergents etc you know are, are also are, are also an issue for being tested um on animals so just just look for Look for, in terms of what you can do, you know, adopt where possible in terms of pets, but also in terms of your purchases, just try and go for a lot of, it's not all expensive, a lot of own brand um, uh, cosmetics and household products. Uh, yes, are, are own brand good. now is all vegan, not animal tested, and that's super accessible. It's all really effective as well. I think sometimes exactly. people worry about the quality of things, but actually if the same thing that you could get on eBay that doesn't say vegan, not animal tested, you can get exactly the same thing, which is, you know, um, which is equally as good. Um, so yes, that's a brilliant practical piece of advice, which I love. Um, I was going to ask two questions then. One was for me as somebody working from the bottom up as a medical professional prescribing every day, other than trying to get patients off medications and using natural or lifestyle holistic alternatives when possible. Is there anything that I can be doing in order to reduce um, how much I can be contributing towards this industry? Well, it's really tricky because it's currently a legislative requirement. It's currently legally required to test on animals. Unfortunately, no matter how little they, you know, they contributed in effect to producing safe medicines, you can't really avoid that, unfortunately, at the moment. Yeah. But I would say if you ever have the opportunity to contribute to your hospital's biobank, you know, if unfortunately anyone's ever, you know, in hospital or you as a doctor, Yes. are ever asked to help you know collect some um, specimens um, or consent patients um, for research if you can just encourage people and if people or anyone listening we're all patients eventually at the end of the day so there's always it's always likely that you will one day have the opportunity to contribute to medical research so well, every do. hospital every organization have a biobank how does that work so not all I mean we work one of the reasons we work with mainly with the U.S. is it's a lot easier there um, but, and, and also more of our clients are, are there, although we do ship internationally as well. But yes, a lot of, certainly the bigger hospitals will generally have a biobank, usually in oncology, but often sometimes in other areas as well. Yeah. One of the issues is that sometimes biobanks are just set up by individual academics. So they'll have a relationship with a, a, a one doctor or one surgeon, and it's not necessarily accessible by external researchers, which is a shame because you want to make them as widely available as possible. Yeah. But there's a lot of a lot of research and a lot of collections go on. And the, the aim is really that everyone having surgery, uh, at least, would get the opportunity to sign a consent form saying, you know, yes, I'm happy. But they may give you an opportunity to opt out of things that you don't agree with, which I think is ide the ideal situation. Yeah. Um, so you can opt out. In, hopefully you can opt out of you know, using specs because some researchers will take human tissues and implant them into mice and they're called yeah. xenografts and um, obviously you know that's that's not something that's not something you want you want to support you yeah. know just grow just grow the tissue in vitro don't, don't stick it into a poor mouse yeah. um so you know but, but I think if you do get the opportunity to please do contribute and also in terms of supporting um education and training of doctors if you think about uh you know if you, if you pass when you're too elderly or don't have the opportunity to donate for transplant maybe talk to your family about donating your body for medical re for medical training and research because uh, post-mortems aren't carried out as often as they used to be and there's really no better way as you know really of knowing what goes on inside people than being able to study um a real body so 
Yeah, that's, that's absolutely that. brilliant. I appreciate your time, your your work, your expertise, um, and your enthusiasm so much. I will be in touch with you because I will be talking for. Uh, I spoke for Safe for Medicines last year, as you know, and yes. I'll be doing a talk with Exposing Cruelty as well. So everything that I can speak to you about is going to be so beneficial in terms of what we can do practically. So thank you so Can't much. Wait. Thank, Thank you so much for the opportunity. It's been wonderful to uh, chat with everyone. Thank Absolute you. Absolute pleasure. Bye, Margaret. Bye bye. Take care. Bye bye. Right. So that was absolutely incredible, as I expected. Thank you so much to Dr. Margaret for joining us today. Now, I didn't mind overrunning that because the next session is actually a session by me, I believe. And it will be um, based on activist burnout. And by activist, I mean everybody that's trying to do something and trying to change the game and trying to improve the world. Um, so yeah, I have. Uh, as I said, um, my name is Dr. Rao. I'm a GP trainee with a special interest in mental health, psychiatry, sustainability, conservation. I've got lots of interests because the world is very interesting. Um, but I have been fortunate enough to do uh, a couple of placements in psychiatry as a junior doctor. And now I would actually say that um, what would I say, 75%, 80% of my consultations in general practice, the topic of mental health comes up and it's not an easy time for people. Um, people, you know, are struggling with depression, anxiety, and I think the current statistics are that one in four people has a diagnosed mental health problem and actually the undiagnosed levels, especially after the pandemic and especially with current financial stresses um, and lots of social issues going on, I think that that number is significantly underrepresented. So let me figure out how I can re-become a host and then I will share my screen. Thank you all so much for joining today and for sticking around. Um, it will be recorded, but that will be on a donation basis. And I really, really greatly appreciate everybody, um, everybody's time today. Now, how do I re-become a host? Mm -hmm. Sorry, bear with me. Oh, I am the host, okay. Share screen, let me do this. We will have a quick lunch break after this because I know that um, it can be quite tiring to sit and listen to so much information, even though it is absolutely wonderful. So I will be sticking around after the lunch break just to have a chat, but I do have some food that I'm gonna go make as well. So feel free to drop in and drop out today. Okay, so I'm gonna be sharing my screen now and I think everybody can see this. So I'm gonna run through this quite quickly. And if anybody wants any of my slides or if anybody has any ideas um, or if anybody's working on anything interesting, then I know you've been using the chat box. So feel free to um, just share it with us. As I said, this is a networking and connection event. I think that's exactly what life is about is to connect brilliant people. And we've been fortunate enough to be able to do that today. So I greatly appreciate it. Everybody that knows me knows that I love a good infograph. I'm very visual and I'm a little bit artsy and I like to put everything together in a, a bit of organized chaos. I think that sums up my approach to, to life and to work. But this is a really, really great infograph because it's very scientifically backed and it has a lot of really good facts in here. So the term burnout was coined in 1974 by an American psychoanalyst called Herbert Freudenberger, um, who used to work with addicts and homeless communities across the states. He said that he used to see one, their spark burnout, and two, their cigarettes burnout when they were just staring into space on the psychiatric ward. So that's apparently where the term came from. And there were a couple of papers around that time that mentioned the term for the first time. And now it's become, you know, common practice. We talk about this on an everyday basis. We know if, if, if we haven't been personally affected, we know somebody that has been affected by burnout, occupational fatigue, depression, anxiety, all of these things are significantly interlinked and it can be really difficult to work out whether this is burnout or whether this is some other form of mental health issues. So I'm going to try and chat today about what the signs are of burnout and how we can best manage this, because I do really believe that prevention is the best cure. And this is something that we really miss out on in the Western world. So this is a great slide. And the thing that I would like to highlight here that is the most important thing for me is that stress and inadequate resources and inadequate support cause burnout. 
So you might feel like you are inadequate because society and your workplace and people around you might be saying to you, you know, you can't cope with this. You can't do this. You haven't been able to do this. But actually, no, it's not about your efforts and your 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 burnout. It is about a failure of the surroundings to support you. And I think we're often made to feel very guilty about not being able to cope with the demands of everyday life and of, of your work life. But if we had better support, if we had better communication, if we had better pay, better holiday, um, all of these things, better understanding, better empathy, then um, we'd be better prepared to prevent burnout. So don't feel like this is a problem with you as organizations want you to feel. This is actually a, a social and ingrained structural issue that needs to be addressed. I'm going to use the term compassion fatigue here. I'm going to mention the term compassion fatigue because burnout can affect anybody. Anybody can be affected by the symptoms of burnout. However, compassion fatigue affects a significant proportion of people who are trying to advocate for other causes. And this has been dubbed as the cost of caring. So that could be, um, that could be, you know, feminists, that could be people working to oppose ingrained sexism or racism or um, any kind of structural issues. It can affect animal rights activists. You know, this is where my my passion is and this is where so much of, of my interest comes from. So bear with me because I just need to mute somebody. Would this person mind muting themselves? Do you mind, Kian? Is that okay? Um, so yeah, the cost of caring, essentially, and I love that term. I think that's really, really relevant and it's affecting a lot of people. What are the signs of burnout? So the signs of burnout can be really, really non-specific and really, really vague. So they can be significantly overlapping with depression, anxiety, um, OCD, schizophrenia, bipolar, or they can be significantly overlapping with things like B12 deficiency, vitamin D deficiency is a massive one. Um, one of my best friends, I'm not going to name names, but this is a little bit comical. Her vitamin B, her vitamin D levels, because she probably spent so much time in A&E with no windows, um, they were 15, which is the same as somebody wearing a burqa all year round in a country with no sun, <laughs> which is really bad. So do be aware of the physical things that can be causing this and don't just assume, oh, you know, I'm just a bit, I'm just a bit burnt out. Get proper investigations if you feel like you are getting lots of infections, if you're tired all the time, if you have any of these symptoms, because it can be the sign of a deficiency or, or something else um so go to your gp go to your healthcare professional i know that's easier said than done but get some advice about uh, whether this is burnout and um, and then we can kind of work it out from there if you do uh, think that, that that is the most likely diagnosis So this is quite crowded, but um, I'm just going to mention a few things from the Youth Climate Action Survey. I think it's really important to start with children. We're all affected by this. We're all eco-anxious. You know, we're all aware of the, the things that we should and could be doing to help the environment. But let's think about the children here because the children are the future and we need to be best supporting them and we need to be educating them and working with them to try and work out how to best support children to feel empowered and to feel prepared to take on things that are going to be affecting them in in 30 40 years um so yeah when I go into schools and I do a lot of mentoring still with schools and I have done for the last 12 years and I'll work with lots of children who feel very very anxious and when I'm working um, in my GP practice I have children as young as four and five that are coming in with physical symptoms of anxiety so headaches vomiting um, tiredness strange behavior um, and and there's some evidence to suggest that actually changes with the environment such as changes in temperature and warming of the environment can precipitate things like low mood and psychosis. So this is all massively interlinked. And 
I think there's a lot of things that we can do to try and empower children. So four enablers here are opportunities, communities, knowledge, and being positive. And I think so many of our speakers today have touched on these things. And I'm so grateful because I gave a bit of guidance, but as you all know, um, I've got a lot of ideas, but actually getting the ball rolling with my disorganization can be a little bit difficult, but I'm so grateful that we've actually managed to pull this together. And all of our speakers have spoken about opportunities, communities, knowledge, and being positive. So there's some really proactive things that we can do to try and improve not only our mental health, but the mental health of people around us and the younger generations as well. This is something that um, my wonderful dad took me to the refugee camp about five years ago. I think it was 2017 that we went to 2018 that we went for the first time. And I've since been back with an amazing group of, of professionals as well. And one of the first things and one of the recurrent themes that I learned when going into a clinic that is under-resourced, understaffed, underpaid, does any of that sound familiar? Because I've got a feeling that all of us are going to be feeling like our jobs are under-resourced, understaffed and underpaid. Um, so this is a recurring theme that they taught us before approaching a possibly stressful environment. And it is the most important person in an emergency is me. And that is, that is every single one of you. The most important person in an emergency is you. Because if you can't look after yourself, if you're not looking after yourself and your mental health and your physical health is not best equipped to look after other people, then we're setting ourselves up to fail and we're not doing our causes justice either. So really take that time, invest in that time. I think we're made to feel guilty about it often, you know, to take that to take that break or to go for that walk or to do that really mundane thing, like get your nails done or, um, or make a cup of tea or do whatever makes you feel good. But if you don't invest in that time, then you're divesting in a longer time future. So go for it. Types of self-care. So I think mental health and psychiatry and humans, you know, we're also varied and we're also different. So there's not one size fits all model. Um, but unfortunately, we kind of lose that in medicine and in healthcare because we don't have that much time and there's not that much research done about how best to equip people to take care of their mental health. It's being done now as organizations selfishly understand that they are losing people to sick days. I think the biggest causes of sick days are mental health and back pain. And um, I think that they're both really connected. You know, if you can't get up from your desk, you can't take a lunch break, you can't go for that walk, you can't get up to stretch. All of that's really connected. So, so organizations and corporations are learning now that actually they're losing a lot of productivity and they're losing a lot of money by not investing in people. So yeah, types of self-care self -care are really varied. Everybody is different. Choose that thing that makes you feel good. And it's trial and error. You know, if you feel like, oh, I really hate cooking. Like that did make me laugh just speaking to Dr. Kassam before because she's the founder of plant-based health professionals. And when I got really excited and said to her, tell us about your cooking routine, she's like, Oh, it's a bit of a chore, you know, but I know she eats very well because I've seen it. So actually, that might not be the thing that motivates you to feel good. Um, you might not enjoy a bath. That might be your idea of absolute hell. Uh, but, you know, there are so many other things that you might be able to find. And it's just about perseverance to find that thing. Apparently, it takes 21 days to make a habit. And then you've kind of ingrained that into your neural connections and your neural network. So just do it, persist at it, and you'll find that actually that thing gets easier and you enjoy incorporating that into your routine and that you can juggle more things when it might have seemed impossible to integrate one more thing by just doing that. Um, you'll find that it gets easier to incorporate it into your routine and it makes everything a bit easier in the long run. So I think I want to break the stigma with complementary therapies such as yoga, meditation, Reiki, massage, breathing, acupuncture, all of these things have scientific evidence to suggest that they can be really effective. And some of these things are 6,000, you know, 7,000 years old, and that's just documented. So these things are thousands and thousands of years old and they've been working for communities you know I'm an Ayurvedic consultant in Kerala well certified by the Indian government and I thought you know what am I going to be able to learn here that I can then give back to my NHS you know to my western community and all of this is becoming more relevant so actually mindfulness and all of these complementary alternative therapies there is such a role for them and in general the link here 
is that it is improving relaxation. And when you're relaxed, you're decreasing cortisol, you're decreasing adrenaline, you're decreasing all of the inflammatory, excitatory chemicals and hormones in your body. And you're telling your body, you know, I'm safe, I can heal. I don't have to be on the go. I don't have to be agitated. I don't have to be driving that fight or flight response. I can relax and just taking that time to learn how to do that is so very important. So as everybody knows here, I'm a very, very keen vegan advocate and I love food. It's taken me a really long time actually to, to be able to say that because I think as a junior doctor, I didn't have time. I didn't even, that was not my priority. My priority was keeping patients alive when I started, when I qualified. Um, I barely had time to think about what I was eating. And that was so bad for me. You know, I was on the verge of burnout. I was on the verge of burnout. Um, I wasn't looking after myself. I didn't have time to go to the gym. I didn't make time, can I say, to go to the gym. Um, and all of that kind of caught up with me. And I realized this is not sustainable, this way of life, this constant fight or flight, this constant on the go, this constant not relaxing and not looking after myself. How am I going to look after my patients? I'm going to lose out on a whole lifetime of looking after patients if I don't get on top of my own mental, physical, social um, health here. So it took me some time to figure out how to do it. And now I'm so healthy and happy and relaxed and I feel amazing. And I just want to put all of my energy into helping people, but also looking after myself. And I've realized that you need to have that balance. And one of the fundamental things here is food, you know, what we're putting into our body that is changing to all of these chemicals and to all of these neurotransmitters that literally affect our brain. And then that is gonna affect our output. And the British diet, oh my gosh, I can't, I, I could speak for hours. It makes me really stressed when I go on a home visit or every day I'll say to patients, you know, do you eat enough fruit and vegetables? I've been saying that, but I wasn't quantifying it. Now I quantify it. I say, well, how many portions of fruit and veg do you eat a day? Patients will say one or two portions of fruit and veg a day. I'm thinking, well, no wonder the rates of colorectal cancer and the rates of cancer and diabetes and obesity and inflammatory diseases are so high. And no wonder you feel depressed and anxious and heavy and you've got back pain and you've got rheumatological issues and joint issues. You know, food is so connected to our mood. And when we're not feeling good physically, we're not going to feel good mentally. So if we break it back down to basics and start putting in a whole food plant-based diet, which is anti-inflammatory, got a really, really good um, antioxidant profile, got really good, um, got really good, just got really good kind of like peptides and all of these tiny little molecules that make up proteins and make up all of the good things, then we're bringing it back to basics and we're setting ourselves up to feel really, really good despite the stresses of external and everyday life that we can't change sometimes. So I'm just going to focus on a few things, a few pathways in here, because the gut brain axis is fascinating. And there's more and more evidence coming out to suggest that it is a key player in mediating how we feel. So a couple of um, pathways here are that the gut literally has a direct connection with the vagus nerve and the vagus nerve is the key component to the parasympathetic, parasympathetic nervous system. So that is the thing that opposes the sympathetic. So it opposes fight or flight. So it causes reduction in blood pressure. It causes a lower heart rate. It causes um, you to feel really, really relaxed. And it causes, um, it, it causes you to feel like you can sleep, like you can chill. Let's call it the chill nerve. So there's a direct link between the stomach and the brain mediated by the vagus nerve. So that's really cool. What we put into the gut can literally um, stimulate that chill response. Another part of this here, which is really exciting, is that the nutrients at the bottom right here, the nutrients and the microbiota can cause literal metabolites such as 5-HT, which is serotonin, neurotransmitters, NTs, and GABA. And GABA is essentially the drug, the 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 chemical that drugs release, such as alcohol, ketamine, benzodiazepines. So if we're putting in good foods that can make GABA, that's a natural way to chill and a natural way to wind down all of the overstimulation of the brain. And the last thing I'm gonna speak about here, even though there's absolutely loads, is the top right here, there's cytokines and B cells, and they are actual components of the immune response. So when we're putting in small building blocks to stimulate T cells, B cells, cytokines, the immune response, 
we're going to reduce our risk of infections we're going to improve our immune response which can actually be anti which can be anti carcinogenic and it could be anti infectious so when we're controlling what we eat to stimulate the immune response we're going to feel a whole lot better when we're cutting down the risk of things like tumors and infections so yeah what we put into our gut is really really valuable these are some things that I do, which is just really personal again. Um, but I've had to think about which things make me feel better. I feel really good all the time. I'm very happy unless, you know, I get frustrated by um, things that maybe I feel like I can't control or things that I'm trying to change and that I feel like I'm not really getting anywhere. So these are things that I'm trying to use to try and decrease that stress response if I ever feel frustrated by things going on around me or if I ever feel anxious about, you know, the state of politics or the state of the environment. Then these are some really amazing resources which you cannot feel bad when you are really focusing on a National Geographic podcast. It's just impossible when you're listening to the calming voice of Joe Wicks or Rangan Chatterjee um, or Jay Shetty or Rich Roll. You know, these are amazing motivational, inspirational speakers that have a lot of scientific evidence-based podcasts. So have a listen to them if you feel like, you know, I don't know what to do with my time. I'm feeling a bit anxious rather than just binging on a kind of like mindless Netflix thing, then have a listen to them because they're so, so inspirational and you learn so much and you just feel so good. Um, in terms of TV, I don't watch any TV. Um, I watch First Dates. I think that's really funny and I'm going to apply to it soon. Um, but I do watch um, Water Bear, which is an amazing network and app and it's free and it collects lots of activist and environmental documentaries such as my favorite film which I've put here Racing Extinction um, and there's also a docuseries called Eating Plants TV and I'm going to be having a screening so my second bucket is a lot of screening later on in the year the wonderful um, producers of it have said that I can screen that and that's a really really cool docuseries which is really educational and informative about plant-based diets as well. I've completely collated my social media, so I don't see any news, I don't see anything negative, I don't see, um, you know, all of these skinny people with plastic surgeries that so many people seem to be affected by. My social media is full of cooking and birds, I do a lot of bird watching, <laughs> um, you know, ocean conservation stuff, uh, really positive news. So I've had to sit and go through every single page and make an effort to just control what I'm exposing myself to. And I find that, you know, when I sit on my Instagram now, it's just full of, you know, positive, amazing projects that people are doing and and books and, and articles and science journals and just really cool things. But it took me a while to sit and collate that. So if you do, um, feel like you're being negatively influenced by social media then either get off it or um sit down and just kind of curate it so that it's only exposing you to things that give you like such a good endorphin buzz and make you want to go outside and make you want to um do arts and crafts projects and things like that so this is specifically with regards to any kind of people that go out and do activism um and it can be really difficult and i have so much respect for for you guys that go and have these peaceful calm conversations with other people to try and change people's perceptions you know it's really like a one-to-one -one approach and i think that's absolutely incredible so just skipping through that quickly that um, I'm quite aware of the time that everybody might be getting hungry. Uh, remember your breathing. So there's some really good techniques to do with breathing methods. So there's one that is two, four, eight breathing, and it's really, really brilliant. And the yogis do it naturally, but you kind of breathe in two seconds and then you hold for four and then you breathe out for eight. And again, that X, that expiration directly stimulates the vagus nerve and it naturally lowers your heart rate and your blood pressure and you know it gives you that time to just think is this really important enough to to raise my blood pressure is it really worth it or shall i change my tactic or my environment empathy is really key so i'm trying to change my perspective of why why do people abuse animals why do why are people racist why are people sexist um i'm trying to change my perspective of these people haven't been fortunate enough to be as educated as I am about these certain things. And I know I have a lot to learn from other people and I am still so ignorant and I must irritate other activists with regards to things that I do. So I'm trying to have that level of self-awareness and try and have that level of empathy to try and realize that, you know, this is just about what I have been exposed to and try and understand that there are lots of other things that I need to learn as well. 
pick your battles because you only have a, a finite amount of energy. The one thing that is certain in this life is death and also the energy is um, energy, your, your energy levels are not exponential and they're not unlimited and you've got to conserve that because that gives you the energy to to do all of the things that you want to do so pick your battles you can't fight everything and sometimes you just got to say fine well you know today's not my day to have that conversation and the most important thing here for me and that has changed my life has been to remember how many other people do agree with you and to find your people and to find your tribe and to have conversations with, you know, if I have so many difficult patients that are saying to me, you know, I don't want to exercise. I don't want to eat plant-based. I don't want to stop smoking and I'm getting really frustrated and I'm getting really stressed because I'm just thinking I'm trying to help you here. Then all I have to do is pick up the phone and message on. We've got so many WhatsApp groups, message my friends who uh, who agree with lots of the things that, that I am trying to advocate and just think, you know what, there's so many people that agree with me here and there's so many different communities and niche networks that I'm part of that actually it's okay. I just need to have a conversation with those people that make me feel like I'm not crazy. This is so important. And I actually stole this book from one of my best friends. So uh, I don't know if you're still here, Anna, but um, I stole your book and I don't regret it because it is one of the best books in the world. It really fascinated me to see that the ex-surgeon general of the United States, he's a, he's a surgeon, he's a, he's a, he's a physician, he's a hands-on doctor. He wrote his book about, not about surgery, not about medicine, not about politics, not about the states. He wrote it about connection. And it's such a brilliant book. And it talks about different communities and the issues that people have and why we might feel so disconnected as a world when we have so much connection available you know you can pick up the phone at any time and speak to somebody in a different time zone and you can call anybody or just have the access to drive to somebody's house but so many people feel so disconnected and it's trying to identify why and to bring people back together to form that connection so that we can improve our mental health but also improve collective mental health as well best ways to do that are to support other people around us if you feel like you are you are good you've got that energy you can support other people around you, you're, 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 you're able to do that, then talk, share, build, speak, work together and give. So I think they are just some amazing, amazing life principles that we should all be living by. It doesn't have to be a massive thing. I mean, did you see Ashton Kutcher and Mila Kunis the other day? What did they donate about 275 million? That is goals. But if you give somebody a portion of food, an extra portion of food that you've made for dinner and just check on your neighbor and make sure that they're okay. You give somebody a call, you know, it doesn't have to be massive. If you can do that, then brilliant. If you can donate to charity, then brilliant. If you go out and work for charity, then brilliant. If you can't just send somebody a text, say, are you okay? Just check in. You don't know how valuable it could be to somebody. This is an amazing resource, which I think should be publicized more. Um, it is available to everybody so you can just type in hub of hope and what it does is it's jake mills charity and he's he's a presenter xtv presenter and he tried to kill himself uh, a few years ago and he fortunately wasn't successful and he's since turned his life around in terms of his mood and what he does and he's used all of that energy to create amazing resources for people um, that might be struggling with their mental health and this this is such a good website you put in your postcode and it tells you all of the resources around you, whether they're open, what kind of services are available, and it gives you their contact details. And it's so, so good. I can't even tell you the resources that we have in the NHS are not even as good as this. Um, so just use this. I've started using this to just check and see where based on where patients live. So just go ahead and give it a go because you never know when you might, even if you don't need to use it, you never know what, when it might come in useful. Here's an article that I wrote about mental health and plant-based diets, which are two of my favorite things. And if anybody wants a copy of this, I'm more than happy to, to send it out. It talks a little bit about what I've talked about today, which is the benefits of whole food plant-based diet, also the benefits of finding your tribe and the benefits of community connection as well. It does also touch on the difficulties that activists might um, experience when you feel like you're constantly pushing, pushing, pushing in a world that often opposes change. So there's a lot of themes touched on in that. And now I'm a regular author for Vegan Food and Living magazine, which is the best selling magazine in the UK. So I hope to do a bit more work about that. 
I was going to go into loads of science. Everybody that's seen my talks knows that I love to go crawl through PubMed and through the literature and through the scientific data. Um, and I started, but one, there's not a lot of evidence about activist mental health. It's really new. And some of the studies are just um, very small sample sizes and are quite like anecdotal. So I thought this was so funny. I thought this was brilliant because it is it's published, you know, it's, a pub it's published in the sociological forum, which is very high impact. So I love this. And you can skim through this abstract now, but it's essentially a scientific paper entitled, when ignoring the news and going hiking can help you to save the world, environmental activist strategies for persistence. And long story short, it just means take take your break, find the thing that you enjoy, make sure that you make time for your hobbies, make sure that you still do the things that make you feel excited to go back to your job, motivated to go back to activism, because if you burn out, then we lose a lot. <laughs> This um, I've popped in because one, it's a really cool photo and two, it made me change my cognitive perception of something that I initially found to be immensely distressing and negative and stressful. And I had to, to transform that into something that is constructive and proactive. So it's less about the picture and more about the brain tools, which I've had to use and I've had to learn and really ingrain because your brain is, you, you, you have to train your brain, your brain, you, these, these neural connections don't just come naturally. You have to build them and reinforce them like a muscle. So that changing a negative and stressful environment and, and a, a negative and stressful experience to something positive in long, long story short, has been something that I you have to work on and you have to, to train your brain to do that. So this was a photo that I took while I was pre prepping for Vegan Camp Out 2022. Um, it's a view from my window at home, beautiful, beautiful home in Spain where my parents are. And I can't wait to go back next week, but we've always had the the, the threat of wildfires um, being very, very close on the mountains. And um, this year was the closest that I've ever seen them. And I was so upset, you know, I went downstairs and I was crying and it wasn't because I was scared. It was because I was sad about the loss of biodiversity. I was sad about the people that would be displaced. And I was sad about the environmental impact of the carbon emissions of the fire and um, I was thinking about the fact that this is not just, you know, a one off for lots of people. This is the reality that lots of people go through every day and that lots of people have to endure. And that this is happening on a mass scale, not just this small, relatively small fire. I mean, it doesn't look small, but compared to the grand scheme of things, this is something that people go through every day. And this is a fact of life now. And it's about accepting that. Right. Um, this is happening. This is happening. And. The ball is rolling with climate change, but the ball is also rolling with our knowledge and with activism and with connecting with people that also care about things. And it's about trying to recognize what we can change. And it's about accepting that there's things that we might not be able to change and we can try. I'm not saying don't try, always try. But sometimes there's things that are, are so big that they might seem out of our control. Um, so just try and focus on the things that you can change that are within your sphere of influence and that you can think, okay, how am I gonna approach this constructively? Because this is already happening. So there's no point in me focusing on that. Just what can I do? And how am I gonna approach today to make the world a better place? So I'm just gonna wrap up with a couple of minutes. I know I've overrun, so just, I know hopefully people are just going off and making your cups of tea and making your food and stuff. And I'm just gonna go and make, I've already prepped a lunch, but I'll just go and heat it up in a second. I just wanted to run through a quick guided mindfulness practice for activists and for people who are working towards their own projects and their own goals. So if you could just, Bear with me for a couple of minutes and we have a little bit of a wind down because I know it's been quite a heavy morning and it's been full of amazing people and facts and full of really brilliant questions, which I'll have a look at in a second. But I'm just going to do a mindfulness practice because I truly believe that there is so much to be said and just taking that time to be still 
and taking that time for you. So take a deep breath in for two seconds and then hold for four. Now close your eyes and breathe out for eight. Relax and notice your body releasing tension from your forehead, your neck, your shoulders, your arms, your hands, your stomach, your hips, your legs, your feet, and your toes. Anywhere that might store unnoticed and built up muscle stress. Feel the connection between your body and the space around you. Accept any warmth, any cold, any smells, or any sounds. Let the excitement and adrenaline of today fade away as you become grounded in the present moment. You are exactly where you need to be right now at this point in time. You are focusing on yourself, on any thoughts or sensations that you're experiencing. And that's completely okay. You've been focusing so hard on helping other people on other tasks and other challenges, maybe on helping the environment, maybe on helping the animals, but it's time to bring attention to your mind, to still your thoughts and to find a sense of calm. Focus again on your breathing with slow and deep waves that will naturally reduce your heart rate and your blood pressure and your cortisol levels. Find appreciation and gratitude for all of the incredible things that your body and your mind does. For all of the difficult conversations, for the environment that we're helping, for the animals, for all of the people that might not even know it yet. Bring yourself back to your breathing to allow yourself the calm that you deserve in this busy life. Promise yourself with each breath, a little bit more time for you to find this calm again. Promise to approach challenges with fire and love and laughter and to allow yourself to rest when you need to. I thank you for your work and for joining me here today and invite you to bring yourself back to the present and to open up your eyes whenever you feel ready. All right, so that was a little mindfulness meditation that I wrote as a token of my appreciation for all of you guys and for all of my speakers today. So yeah, I greatly, greatly appreciate it. And I will now be uh, heating up my lunch, which is a plant-based chili if anybody is, uh, anybody is curious. So yeah, I'll stick around, but anybody can pop what you want on the chat box. And um, yeah, the next talk starts in about 15 minutes. So let me just check these new messages. Oh, there's a heart from Sally. So I greatly appreciate that. Uh, will there be a recording of this event? There will, but it will be um, for donation. So a donation to Sussex Seabird Restoration Project. And I appreciate you joining today. If you've joined today, then please, um, yeah, I'll just send out the recording as well. And Sally says, love that meditation. Carlos has sent some amazing resources to Inoceana and um, his Inoceana video. So please definitely give that a watch. I think I've got a message here from Claire, who's an amazing, amazing human activist who says, I used to live in great white shark country. Sharks don't he eat humans. If they bite, um, they will have made a mistake and they spit you back out. They thought you were a seal or a turtle. That's true, isn't it? Um, Michael says, I'm just going to talk, touch on this. I have concerns about how vegans are promoting their messages, such as disrupting sports events and cancelling speakers who disagree with them on, so, on different media. How can vegan communities discipline those who did not toe the line when it comes to advocating veganism? Um, I don't think it's the, the job of vegan communities to discipline anybody other than non-vegans, to be honest. I think we've got to recognise the intention that everybody has. And what I've said here is that it's very complex. 
Um, it, it, it's very controversial, I understand that. Uh, the intention of these activists is to raise awareness of events such as the Grand National, which are full of animal abuse, and to highlight injustice as well. So um, I see it the kind of the same way as I see Just Stop Oil or Extinction Rebellion uh, protesters in that, yeah, it annoys some people and it might uh, pose an inconvenience to some people, but that is their goal. Um, I don't join it because uh, I feel very anxious about losing my job. I work so hard to be where I want to be and I can't jeopardize that in any way. Um, but I also fully support, it makes me uncomfortable, you know, seeing just, just seeing a animal rebellion pouring the dairy over everything. It makes me uncomfortable because, you know, there's people that are starving. I understand that it's a waste, uh, but I understand what they are doing. And I could never say that I wouldn't support it because what am I doing that, um, what, what am I doing instead? If I'm doing something that's better and more effective, then fine, educate them and discipline them. But if I'm not doing something that is more effective and that's more impactful, then I'm gonna take a step back until I have something more constructive. What is the name of that book? Which is the book? Um, I read you Mindfulness Meditation, which I wrote. Um, so I can always, I'm going to probably put that in a YouTube video separately to this. So that was um, my mindfulness meditation adapted from the one that I did for animal activists for Extinction Rebellion. And um, right, what's coming up this afternoon? I don't know the order, but I know we've got wonderful Hattie, one of my best friends, and she's absolutely incredible. She's absolutely lovely. And she's going to be talking. It's a little bit different, which I'm really excited about. And it's about um, her book projects and about how we can uh, look at sustainability, sustainability within literature and within books. And also, um, oh, yeah, it was my mindfulness meditation. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to do that probably a bit longer in a YouTube video and send that out to all activists and probably do a series of it as well so that maybe we can try to do something weekly or you know I'll just send out more regular ones so that we can check in with ourselves so we've got lovely Hattie talking about uh BT Batsford Bookshop and about her work as a book publisher we've got amazing Dominic Thompson um who is one of my best friends as well and he's going to be talking about his work with the German Federal Police Organization so this is a uh, very random but also very relevant we've all got a shared interest in conservation and in making the world a better place and then the final speaker of the day before we wrap up buckets of love information is going to be the incredible Steve Allnut, who's going to be talking about the Sussex Seabed Restoration Project. So if you haven't, then please, please donate to the Just Giving. The links are all over social media. They're all over my Facebook. They're all over um, the Eventbrite page. So yeah, if you can afford to, then please do donate and uh, share this as well with other people that might be interested in donating. And uh, when this day is done, then I will figure out how to upload this to YouTube and I will be sending it out. So I know everybody's super busy, feel free to pop in and pop out i appreciate your time and i will see you in about 10 minutes
Hi, it's just me. Hi, we're having a break for five minutes. Are you okay? Dominic. Oh. Hi, are you okay? Hi, yeah, I'm good. How are you? Oh, I'm so good, thank you. Um, we've just wrapped up the morning, which has been amazing. I hope, I think the speakers have been absolutely incredible. And I'm just going to pop my food in the microwave. Um, um, <laughs> yeah, so no, I'm really excited. What time me? is your talk at 1.30 or is it at 2? No, it's at 2. Um, Hattie is in the next, I think. Lovely, amazing. Yeah, I've just kept the med I've kept the chat up. Everybody um has been really lovely here on the chat. So keep it's like so it's like a breakout session. I've just kept it on in case anybody kind of wants to contribute or right. touch anything yeah. like that. It's just a break. We were supposed to do one till one thirty, um, but um, I overran, so I am currently having a break, but just keeping everything up. But I'm just going to mm -hmm. mute it for like a couple of minutes. Okay, I'll be back in a couple of minutes. Yeah, sure. Tati here. I'm here. Hi. Hello. Hi. How are, How are you? you? 
I'm so good. How are you? Yeah, great. I've been really enjoying this. Well done. Thank you so much. It's been, the speakers have been amazing, as are you. I can't wait to hear yours because it's so different, isn't it? Absolutely. It is different. But um, I think that there is a lot that we can thread into what's already been said. Like when you said earlier about um, children being the future and how we need to educate children about sustainability from a really early age so that they are, so that the, those um, habits are ingrained into them. Yeah. Uh, I could definitely continue along that thread. Yeah, so that's what you're doing. Like, what better way than children's books and things that are going to be stimulating for them? It's all very well us coming in and doing lectures and being like, you have to do this, you have to do this. But actually, what's the best way to engage and educate like younger generations? It's amazing. Absolutely. So, are we ready to start, or shall let's, I um wait to be able to eat eat your food? No, no, no. I'll be eating. Are you like my uh, my favorite cinema? Yeah, cool. Okay, I'll just share my screen. Oh, host disabled participant screen oh, sharing. That's me. One second. No problem. Here you go. Thank you. Can we all see that? Yeah. Okay, is it on full screen mode? Not quite. I'd say about four fifths screen mode. It, um, okay. it, oh no now you're back yeah yeah how's that that's brilliant perfect amazing okay hi yes so i'm here to talk about sustainability and environmentalism within books so it's about making sustainable books but it's also about sustainability throughout the process as well so i'm going to talk to you a little bit about printing books, shipping books, and selling books, as well as making them uh, initially. So that's me. Hello. My name's Hattie. Um, I work for Batsford Books at the moment, um, which is one of the oldest continually open publishers in the world. It opened in uh, 1843. And Recording is progress. Is now independently run um, by a woman, which is obviously great. Um, so what I do day to day is that I write books, I edit books, and I also sell books. So I have quite like a holistic um, perspective on the whole process. So um, I'm going to tell you a little bit about each of those before I go into the bigger picture. Um, so here is a book that I wrote for children. So I mostly do children's books. That's what I specialize in. Um, this is a sound book um, that encourages children uh, or teaches them about classical music. So, oh, that's my water bottle. So there's a, there's a button that should, should work. It doesn't seem to be working. Um, so that's a book that I've written. This is a book about sustainability that I edited and also ghost wrote. Um, it, it was written by one of the founding members of Extinction Rebellion Youth. Um, and it's a manifesto for how young people can help to save the planet by questioning everything about modern life and acting upon their conclusions. So it asks ch it, um, teenagers and older children how to challenge government by protesting and taking peaceful action when necessary, um, about challenging business, so deciding who you want to support and deciding who you want to boycott and why, and about challenging yourself and your own personal habits. So I think we can all agree that it's, it is important to um, offer books like this to children who are um, activist minded. Um, so here are a bunch more books that I have edited over the years, uh, along with the different publishing houses here on the top right, uh, who publish them. One of my favorites is this book on protest. There's a bit of a theme going on here. Um, here's a, a good spread in here, which shows an extinction rebellion protest. Um, and I also do, so that's non-fiction and that's for older children, but I also do picture books for very, very young children um, in order to just very softly and slowly introduce them to concepts like littering. 
um, food, um, all sorts of things like that. This is the blue giant. So this is for um, three to six year olds. And here we have a spread which shows rubbish in the sea. So it's, I think but at the end of the book, there is a sort of um, an action list of ways to reduce single use plastics. So that's done very, very well. Uh, I'm also a bookseller, as I mentioned before, I have my own tiny little bookshop in Hackney Road. Um, we sell our own books that we made, but also um, books that we're interested in from other independent small publishers only. Um, a lot of books about environmentalism there, a lot of books about gardening. Um, and downstairs, we also have secondhand books, which, of course, is one of the most sustainable ways to get your books ever, uh, which I'll touch upon a bit later. Um, so this is the process of making a book from writing it up here. Can you see my cursor, by the way? Yeah. Okay, cool. Um, from here is um, writing the book. And then here is selling the book. And it's a long, long process, which involves editing, which I also do, as I mentioned, designing, pitching it out to different bookshops. But this whole process take, can take up to two and a half years from the time a book is written or is pitched to when it actually arrives on the bookshelves. And it's an extraordinarily long time, as I think we can all agree. But what takes up so much time? And it's actually mostly here. It's the printing, the binding, and something which isn't on this chart, um, the shipping. So the shipping takes can take up to four months depending on where you decide to print your books. So you say you're working in a small publishing house and you've got an amazing book about environmentalism and about changing the world and it's very um, inspiring for children. But then you have a choice about where you're going to print it. Are you going to adhere to the values in that book in the manuf manufacture of it? So we've got choices. We've got short distance printing, we've got medium distance, and we've got long distance. And say, I'm just going to assume that the publishing houses in the UK for this example, we could find a local printer in the UK who will print our books for us and ship it for us. They will, um, they will tend to take about two weeks from when everything's approved to go to when your books are arriving in your warehouse. Then you've got medium distance, and this is somewhere usually somewhere like Italy or um, Eastern Europe. There are also a number of printing houses there, um, and that tends to take about six weeks. Then you've got long distance, which is, of course, um, dominated by China. Um, but then you've also got some in Singapore, Malaysia and various other places. That is where it will take you four months because the books have to go via ship and it takes a very, very long time. Um, so naturally, one would assume the further away, the worse it is for the environment, right? The worse the CO2 emissions are. Um, but it's a little bit more complicated than that. So... There's, this is a container ship, which is where all the, how the, most of the books come to us from the Far East. Um, I tried to find um, some figures as to how many books that are published in the UK are printed in China, and I couldn't find it. But I, I, colloquially, what I know from just working in the industry for almost 10 years now is that it is upwards of 95%. That's what I would estimate at printing in China. Um, there's a number of reasons for this, of course. Um, a lot of it is to do with cost. It is a, a more or less half the price, to, half the cost to print a book in China as it would be in the UK. Another factor is that 
they have specialist printing houses over there that can make books like sound books, um, lift the flat books that we just don't have in the UK yet. Um, there are some interesting little um, printing presses sort of springing up, but at the moment, the, the capabilities of printing color books, so picture books, art books, um, novelty books, we pretty much only can only print them in China, um, which obviously is not ideal. Um, there are, there's another factor to take into consideration in that if you get your books printed in China, they have to be audited <laughs> by the Chinese, um, I'm not gonna say government, but essentially we cannot print books in China that have any political messaging at all. So we couldn't print this in China. It was printed in Singapore because um, it's about protest and obviously it's got um, a spread about Tiananmen Square in it. So I don't think they would have liked that. Um, no books about religion can be printed in China. And bizarrely, no books with maps in them can be printed in China because of the issues around, um, along the country's borders and that I'm sure we're all aware of. So, I mean, it's absolutely fascinating, but there is, there is a slightly, um, it's not all bad news. Here is a graph which shows the carbon emissions of moving a ton of cargo over 5,000 kilometers. Here, of course, by far the worst is um, air, air freight. Um, so when you get advanced copies in, once a book's been printed, the publishing house will receive about 20 or so advanced copies so that they can send them out to bookshops to promote them, send them on to the author, etc. Those always go by air because it's a, it's, a, it's a time sensitive thing. But the bulk of the books, say you're printing 3000 of them, they will either go by container ship, train or truck. Now, container ship actually, because there's so much of it, is quite low on the, as you can see, is, has got the least amount of carbon emissions over that um, distance. And this means that if we choose to print our books in a sort of, um, in the UK, that's obviously the best solution in terms of carbon, because um, the distance is much, much smaller. Um, and especially if we move them around by train. Um, even printing the other side of the world, as long as we use container ships, still isn't that bad. The worst thing, actually, is to print them in the middle range zone, so Europe, let's say, and then truck them over. And I don't think many people are aware of that. Um, so it's, it's, it's much more nuanced than one, than one um, thinks. Um, so our books have been printed wherever um, the publishing house has decided to print them, uh, and they are now at a range of different. There are a range of different shops where you can buy them. You've got independent shops like mine. You've got W H Smith. You've got um, supermarkets, um, which increasingly is where a majority of people buy their books from. Funnily enough, um, you've got um, the big chains like Waterstones, pretty much the only big chain nowadays. Um, and then you've got Amazon, of course. So then you've got a choice of how you're going to buy a book. Um, and this is not the end of our sustainability issues. Um, there is a, there's, um, there's something called sale and return, which means that booksellers are able to return unsold books to the publisher 90 days after they've ordered them if they have not sold. So they can just send the books back to the publisher and what is the publisher likely to do with those books? Um, there are a few things that they can do. They can remain to them. So this little mark on a book, if you find a book in a secondhand shop and it's got a little mark on it, that means it's been remaindered. That means that the books haven't sold through normal channels um, and then they end up being resold to secondhand bookshops. So that's the ideal situation, of course, because we want them to get into hands. The, the situation that's the, that we don't want is for them to be pulped. This is books being pulped, um, a lot of 
new books are sadly pulped. They're recycled, they're turned into egg cartons and things like that. But still, you obviously want to avoid that. Um, so, I mean, I've got some figures about the, um, about the sale and return policy. Um, WH Smith is the worst. Over 50% of books that WH Smith buy are sent back to the publisher to either be remaindered or more likely to be pulped. So I do not recommend buying your books from WH Smith if you can avoid it. Supermarkets, also around 50%. That's not great. Um, Waterstones, 5%, which is pretty good. Um, and independent bookshops between 5 and 10%. Um, I'd also like to mention, I have not sent any books back to the back to any publishers in my bookshop. I make sure that I buy small quantities and cleverly so that I know that they can sell. And then also rotating stock in and out as the, as the year goes on. I'm also fortunate enough to have a secondhand bookshop in within my bookshop. So I can always sell them in that way. Um, I think it's, it's, in, it's more, it, more important to get books once they've been printed and once the, the cost um, environmentally and also financially has gone into making those books, it is important to get them into the hands of people that will want to read them, of course, even if it means that you're making a loss, even if it means that you're giving it to someone for 50p. Um, absolutely. Um, Amazon actually don't send a lot of books back. It's less than 0.5 percent. So that's that's good in some ways. But uh, Amazon, of course, has its own issues with regards to labour um, and also cut pricing. The cost of books so that it means that um independent bookshops like my own can't afford to keep going because then people go to amazon if they can find it for a third of the price and that means that local communities are therefore being destroyed um which obviously we do not want um so i don't recommend you buying your books from amazon either um so back here again um yeah so that's what i was just gonna say so we've got a couple of other alternatives. Um, ideally, if you want a new book, I say go to your local independent bookshop. Of course, I would say that um, because you want to support your local communities. You, you want to. Um, local is always best, right? Local is always best. And you'd rather line the pockets of someone that you may know um, in your community than some rich guy who lives in New York or wherever. Um, so we've got uh, some other alternatives of where we should get our books sustainably. Number one, number one, number one is libraries, of course. Um, libraries are is the most sustainable way that you can get your books. Um, I know that some people might be concerned or might, they may never have thought of this, or maybe they have. Um, they may think, if I get a book out from a library, surely the author isn't making any money. Because normally um, authors get royalties of about sort of ten percent or something when you buy a book from, from a bookshop, um, a, a new book that is not a second hand book. But libraries are so great because there's something called the UK Public Lending Right or PLR system, and the government, who knew, actually supports libraries in this one way, which is um, by every time you take a book out of the library the author tends to get about 9p. So they get paid, which is great. So it's a win-win situation. Um, the maximum amount anyone can receive from, from a library is like just over £6,000 and the minimum is £1. So, so even if someone's only taken out your book once in the whole of the UK in the whole year, you still get a pound. So that's great. Um, so, I mean, the thing about libraries, of course, is that funding is a problem. Um, libraries are actually more and more popular every year. Um, what that says about uh, there's probably an element of the cost of living crisis in there as well. Um, I've got some figures here, but um, if, if people want them, I can send them to you. Um, I'm not going to sit down and go through all of that, all of that. But just know that libraries are perennially popular year on year. Um, the number of books borrowed has increased by 60% between 2019 and 
2020, 2021, and 2021, 2022. I mean, you've got COVID to consider as well, but still, that's great. Unfortunately, in the same time period, the spending on libraries in, in by government and local authorities fell 17%. Um, so, yeah, um, campaign to keep your local library open. <laughs> if you've got one thing to take away from this, please. Um, there is another alternative way to get your reading material where well, I'm talking of course about ebooks um they're quite controversial within publishing um we were all very very worried about ebooks about 10 years ago when I started uh, working in the industry funnily enough though sales of ebooks and ebook re readers such as Kindles has plateaued um, from about five years ago. So it's not on an upward trajectory. I think people who are interested in ebooks already have a Kindle and that's, yeah. So there's not really a new market for it. Um, so in some ways you're replacing a huge amount of physical stuff like books um, with one thing. So in that way, that could be considered good, but then also books are infinitely regiftable, recyclable, etc. Uh, an ebook for either a tablet is not. So that is going to end up um, yeah, in, um, in a rubbish pile for the rest of eternity. Um, there are also some types of books that don't work very well on uh, ebooks. You've got children's books, like how I work on. Um, children, I, I believe that children need something tactile and physical um they they learn better through doing to, even just getting them to turn the page um is better than swiping um and of course lovely big coffee table books um uh which are beautiful pieces of art in their own right and as i say i think they can be um if a book is looked after it can be re-gifted resold infinite amount of times until it falls apart essentially um so i mean I'm, I'm selling books in my bookshop from right in the 1930s um so i think that's pretty cool um so but what what is one thing that the publishing industry can do to make to make what we do more sustainable and that what i believe we can do is to choose our books what we publish better so when you decide to make a book at the very beginning of the stage in the meeting um it is important to think what are people actually going to want what are people going to buy why would we put all this money all this time all this energy all of this um environmental cost by printing and shipping the books which i've talked about before if it's going to be crap and no one's going to want it then that will just end up being pulped so you have to think smarter when it comes to the beginning of the process as well um i wanted to highlight a really cool um new publisher or imprint as we say in the business that means a sort of micro publisher within a macro one um this is ivy kids they're based in brighton um and they print they they do children's books um and picture books for ages between three and six and um non-fiction books for slightly older here are some of their books um and they have found a printer the only printer in the uk that can print picture books um very very locally so it's incredibly local they um their books are carbon balanced they're on 100 recycled paper made from post-consumer waste um which has been it says it which has been milled in order to avoid wastage through off cuts but i don't really know what that means but anyway it's all great it's all great stuff um and the printing press um is run through renewable energy in the uk they also do um, books in the US as well, and they've got the same the same setup with a local printer there as well. Um, so they've got really going above and beyond. And of course, the stories that they're choosing to tell are um, environmental and um, important. Um, this book by these two books by Isabella Tree, 
at the bottom here, um, she set up the NEP Wildlife Park in, I think it's Sussex. I still haven't been, but it's so exciting what they're doing. So you should definitely check them out. Um, they are, uh, yeah, yeah. So it's just like a local rewilding park, which is taking the UK back to what it looked like um, before humans basically arrived in the UK. So thousands of years ago. So it's really, really exciting what they're doing as well. Most um, publishers in the UK do print on FSC paper. This is a logo, a logo that you can find inside your books on the imprint page. So I encourage you to check um, next time you want to buy a book, a new book that is, check if they've got this logo on, on the inside because that will prove that it is more sustainable. There are three different levels of FSC certification. You've got Pure where it's from an FSC uh, certified forest. Um, is it the... And what is FSC's now called? Forest Sustainability Council. That's it. And they have, um, they manage forests all around the world um, that are, I don't know exactly how it's done. Um, that's not my area of expertise, but um, they're, they're growing the, the trees in a more sustainable way. Um, so you've got Pure, which is, um, which is um, virgin trees, but um, they're replanted and looked after properly. Then you've got FSC recycled, which is recycled paper. And then you've got a blend, which is 50-50. So um, do check your books for that logo in the future. Um, yeah, so that is, that's me. Uh, thank you so much, Shani, for letting me speak. And um, yeah, I hope I've given you guys some food for thought. <laughs> Yay, thank you so much Hattie, that was absolutely incredible, that was so interesting and just absolutely perfect for, for what I think what the demographic wants to hear today and you covered so much and there were so many things that I've not even thought about or known about um, and I'm sure lots of people didn't either so thank you so much for educating us on your area of expertise, that was wonderful. Ah, thank couple, you. No, thank you. I've got a couple of comments. Um, this public lending right amazing that's an incredible do you know when that started is that something that's been long standing since the the invention of libraries what is this do you know any history with that i don't have a date but it's not new okay. like, i know it's been going on for a couple of decades that's brilliant isn't it i mean we've got to keep a close eye on the government though who knows when they're going to pull something like that yeah, i was going to say that's one thing that the government is sounds like they're doing right so that's brilliant and yeah that does kind of reduce any of the anxiety about well actually you know this is just a circular process with books in the library yeah it should be anyway but then that's really nice to know as yeah, well yeah and it's not just authors that get paid as well it's illustrators and editors and um, all the people that have, you know, put their love and care into making the book. That's fantastic. Then the second question that I have is, is Isabella Tree a pseudonym? Am I missing something? <laughs> no, that's her name. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's so funny. I wonder which I wonder which came first, you know, and just has sustainability. Probably from a young age, you have to go into something like that then, don't you? Absolutely. <laughs> that's funny. And then, yeah, can you tell us the name of this Brighton publisher? Yes, it's Ivy Kids. Can you pop it in the chat when you can? Yes, yes, I will do. Amazing, that's absolutely brilliant. Okay, and just a quick one. How did your, I mean, I kind of know the answer to this, but how, when did your interest in children's books, not as a child, when did that start <laughs> and when did you fall into that and how? Um, so I, I've i been, obviously, um, yeah, as I said, been into books as a, as a child. Um, but it's also the family business. So my mother works in book publishing, but not in children's. Um, so she, so I've been around books my whole life. Um, I started working, um, I, I started work experience in her company when I was about 12 years old, um, sorting out the archive. And then I moved on to reception when I was like 15. So it's just been around me my whole life. Some of my earliest memories are of book, uh, of book launches. Amazing. And how are you finding being the manager for the shop? Oh, my gosh. Um, stressful, but amazing. Uh, I don't know about you, but um, after so much time in lockdown, 
not really seeing anyone, not really conversing with people, just to be out and customer facing and to talk to people. And it's really um, renewed my interest in making books as well. Sometimes I find that if you're just working in a dark room on books, you forget about the final, the final reader, where they're going. Um, so it's really nice to have that human element back mm. into what I do. But it's also it's also tiring. So it's finding that balance, isn't it, of you time and customer customer it service. It very time. much is. So at the moment, I'm working um, ed editorially in the business, like in the office, Tuesdays through Thursdays. Then Mondays and Fridays, I'm supposed to be running the shop and, the, and an art gallery. There's an art gallery underneath as well. Um, so I recommend you guys check it out if you're ever in Hackney. Um, and then I often um, work there on Sundays as well. I share it with my fiance. Oh, so, I mean, it's at the moment, it feels like it's a six day a week <laughs> job. I think you are doing a six day a week job. Okay, well, I'm going to move over to Dominic. I appreciate I appreciate you. You know, I love you so much. Um, I thank you so much for your time today and for sharing something that's so new for so many of us and so interesting and so incredibly valuable. Thank you for your work. Thank I will see you. you after Easter. Um, we've got a dinner planned, haven't we? So I'll chat to you soon. <laughs> Bye. Do we have Dominic here? We do. Hi. Hi. How are you? So good. How are you? I'm so good. Thank you. It's been an absolutely nice. lovely day. Um, I know you've just seen yeah, Hatties as well. So no, I'm so I'm so lucky to have so many people that have been interested in helping out with today. So I appreciate your time. Yeah, so cool. There. So many different topics as well. It's like yeah, so, it's been nice. so varied. I hope people are yeah. enjoying it. Um, everybody's been really engaging in the chat box and you know, any ideas, anything like that is always appreciated. So let's hear about your area of expertise and your background. I can't wait to hear your presentation. Yeah. Yeah. Um, would you pass me the host uh, right so I can share my screen? Yeah, here we go. Thank you. Um, all right. Um, wait a minute. Doesn't. Hmm. I have your presentation if you need, but you got a couple of minutes. I don't see it showing. Can you see anything? I can't see anything. Um, you are now the host. So if you share screen, you're on your laptop, aren't you? Oh, you yeah, am, yeah. Do, 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 bear with me. All right, I see. You okay? Well, right, it seems like you're going to have to share it because it's actually, it's not my Mac, it's my boyfriend's and I uh, can't give the permission because I don't have the password, so. That's fine, yeah. bear with me. Let me just see where I have put this. Yeah, well, I can just, actually, I can just pop the link into the chat so then you can. Perfect, yeah, if you could do that, then that's absolutely brilliant. Let me do that. Just chat here. Right. I've got a message, okay, a comment from Claire saying, I need to get in touch with the Brighton publisher, whose hat he said is Ivy Kids. I want to see if they will join us at the National Animal Rights Day. Yes, doesn't that sound absolutely perfect? Hattie's introduced us to a whole new world of publishing that it sounds like we should um, all be thinking about how we can best use them and support them. So I know we've got a lot of... Uh, projects going on so it might be worth us reaching out and seeing if uh, we can work together thank you perfect now I'm going to re re crown myself as the host <laughs> yeah yes please do <laughs> if I can do there you should be able to yeah no no I can do I can do it's just um this is loading yeah so right, how long have you been working for this job now? Because it seems like time is flying by. Oh yeah, well it's only been half a year, but lots have happened since then. <laughs> yeah, I can imagine. Okay, lovely. Now I'm going to share my screen. Can you see what I see? Yes. Perfect. Do you mind just pressing slideshow at the top right so you can put it on the screen? I don't see where the slideshow is. 
Oh, yeah. Just on the top of the right side. Yeah. Brilliant. <laughs> right. Thank you. Um, so um, I would like to talk to you about environmental management. So um, basically, it's not the opposite of conservation per se, but, you know, we all say charity starts at home. And that is also very true for sustainability. Um, and I want to give you some insights from someone who works, uh, well, kind of in the back uh, office of all these things and behind the lines. Um, yeah, you can put on the next slide, please. Um, but first of all, I'm going to um, introduce you to who I am. Uh, yeah, my name is Dominic Thompson. Um, I live in Berlin because that is where I am based also work-wise, working for the government, obviously. Um, I have a master's in sustainable tourism management. So I actually come from a completely different background than um, what I am doing now. Um, it's quite interesting because um, I never pictured myself working for the state. Um, I started out in an industry that is not really sustainable, obviously, with people flying around and big hotel chains, cruise ships, whatnot. So um, lots to do there, which is also what sparked my interest in sustainability in the first place. You know, seeing all of these impacts was really saddening and I wanted to be able to change something about it. So, yeah, then there was this job opening with the German Federal Criminal Police Office. That is not very nice to say, but <laughs> um, that's the best translation you can get. Um, I think it's roughly equivalent to the NCA, the National Crime Agency in the UK. So we are the highest police authority in Germany. Um, we deal with things like cybercrime, counterterrorism, international crime, um, everything basically that exceeds the borders of just one state or just one province. Um, and I am responsible for implementing an environmental management system and a sustainability strategy for the entire ministry. So that is about 9,000 people that I am responsible for as well as three cities. Um, so quite a lot of things to do. Um, I'm gonna to talk to you about the depths and the details of what I'm doing. Uh, but first I wanna to talk to you about what environmental management is and what its goals are. Um, could you put on the next slide? Thank you. So, yeah, when we talk about the environment and climate protection, the most obvious thing that comes to mind is the reduction of emissions, um, most notably carbon emissions. Um, but it entails a lot of things. There's also, you know, water consumption, electricity consumption, the amount of paper and waste you're producing, and also how much soil you're sealing up with your buildings, uh, whether you use the space that you have effectively. There's lots of things to take into consideration. And um, yeah, obviously many of these things um, have been going wrong uh, for a lot of time now, which is why conservation is needed. So yeah, I am uh, trying to make uh, all of these nice people working in conservation jobless. <laughs> um, no, but it's, um, it's really important to uh, start and environmental management mostly is done in companies and organizations that haven't really had any business in sustainability so far. Um, so yeah, the first thing that you do is kind of a monitoring. You have to do an audit, a review of what your numbers are. How much carbon do you emit? How much water do you use? How much paper? How much waste are you producing? All of these things, you need to know what you're working with. So um, that is one thing that's really important. And um, also, uh, obviously, one of the aims is just the prevention of these things. But in order to do that, you need to know what you can do and which are the most important factors in your company, in your organization. You can even do that on a personal level. You know, you can environmentally manage yourself uh, by looking at your lifestyle and what you can change about it. So it's not always it doesn't always have to be um, like big things that you do. Um, and that is one of the ways to integrate sustainability into corporate activities. Obviously, sustainability is more than just the environment. It also contains social and economic aspects. But yeah, without a functioning environment, the rest kind of doesn't really matter, um, which, is, which might be a bit of a radical take. But um, yeah, ultimately, that's what it comes down to. And uh, could you do the next slide? Yeah, so... As I said, 
people mostly focused on the reduction of carbon emissions. And when I see these things being discussed on the news and politics and media, it's kind of sad that many, many people don't really know how this is done and how it should be done. Because what we're confronted with and what we see is, you know, big, big companies buying CO2 certificates and saying, well, that's it, we're done now. But that should actually be the last thing that you do. So there are three steps that you take when you want to reduce, and it doesn't have to be carbon emissions. It can also apply to water, electricity, paper, anything really. Um, the first thing that you do is to eliminate anything you don't need. That is a bit like that's kind of the most uncomfortable step because you have to really question yourself, your behavior and the entire way your business or your organization operates. All of these things, you kind of want to keep them, but you just have to really see if the positives outweigh the negatives. Um, examples are reducing heating periods. So obviously you need heating, you can't not heat in the winter, but once temperatures reach a certain degree, a certain amount of degrees, you can question if it's really necessary to leave the heating on all day, all night and whatever, especially in office spaces where heating normally isn't regulated as much as in private households. You know, it's not your money that you're spending when you turn up the heating at work. So you don't really care as much. Um, and two other really prominent examples are cars, company cars. So many companies I see have hundreds and thousands of cars that are never really used because they're just there for employees to drive around and they never really use them, especially in big cities like Berlin or London. Um, you don't need too many cars as a company. Um, and the same goes for space. Obviously, it's modern and it's something that you can, you know, get really good um, applications with. If you say we've got a really spacious modern office and you've got loads of different areas, but you really have to ask yourself, do we actually make the most of the space that we rent out or could we use co-working spaces? Could we just have a smaller office because some of our employees are working from home all the time anyway? Um, these are the things you should do first. And after that, you have a look at the things you cannot cut out because they are necessary. And you think about what can I do to make them more sustainable? And that can entail the use of renewable energies, minimizing plastic packaging, minimizing paper, which is something, especially where it comes to uh, the workplace, um, where I've seen a lot of different opinions between older and younger generations. Um, older people tend to print a lot more than younger ones do. And even in my place of work, there's so many discussions about people printing emails because they think if they're important and they pin them to the walls and whatnot. And yeah, it's a process, but these are the things that you can start to think about and hint at with your colleagues. Um, and the third step, that is where you should say, well, I have done everything that I can. We're still emitting CO2, obviously. Um, and now we can start supporting initiatives like WWF, buying compensation or donate to charity, like the one that we're at right now. Um, and that is the last thing that you should do instead of just spending some money and leaning back as a company and saying, well, um, our CO2 is compensated for, but we're still emitting the same amounts we did 10 years ago. So we're fine. Um, that's just not, yeah, not going to make any progress at all. Um, yeah. Next slide, please. So um, a few tangible examples on this slide and the next about my work in a federal institution. Obviously, it's a very special context to be working in, and it's also um, a topic that is not really that present in the public sector yet. Um, but luckily in Germany, we do have the legal framework for it, which I'm very thankful for. So um, the German sustainability strategy aims at net zero carbon, for the entire federal administration by 2045. Um, that is a really ambitious goal and um, it's not known if we're gonna achieve it or not, but I think it is important to set yourself goals. Even if they are not attainable, you still can spark the thought of doing something with it. You can still try and achieve something good, even if it doesn't mean ending up 
with the goals that you originally set out to achieve. Um, and what I was actually cast for is to implement a strategy of how we can manage our environmental impacts because we need to by 2025. Um, and the German government said, well, we can't do the same things that the public sector can. But what we can do is lead by example, because we are the government, we are funded by the taxpayer, by every single person every day who's out on the streets working eight hour shifts, 12 hour shifts, whatnot. And obviously not everyone agrees with the green agenda. And there are people out there who deny climate change and it's all their tax money that we're using up as well. But by setting an example, we hope that we can inspire many people to think about what they can do themselves. Um, but that's the essence of what makes this job so interesting because it's always this tiptoeing around, on the one hand, we need to achieve these goals, but on the other hand, we've got limited resources. I don't know if it's, uh, it's, a, it's a thing you say in English, but in Germany, we've got something called the principle of parsimony. So we need to spend as little money as possible to achieve the things that we're tasked to do in the government, obviously, because it's tax money and you're you know supposed to use it wisely and not throw it out the window. Um, and there are aspects of our work, especially that might never be carbon neutral. Police work, you've got firearms, you there is no way of producing firearms without emitting carbon or with sustainable materials. There is no way of doing cars that are specially secure to transport politicians um, and making them completely electric. Some things just don't work, at least not as of yet. And um, that is where I need to take a look at what can we do and how can I make up for the things that we cannot achieve with the ones that we can do. And finally, um, we are also cooperating with the London Metropolitan Police, um, something that I was quite um, interested in because they sent out a survey to many, many police institutions in Europe um, to gain insights into how they can be more sustainable and then how they can achieve carbon neutrality by 2030, which is seven years from now. And I think it's quite ambitious, especially in a city like London, but, um, yeah, I just thought it was quite interesting to share that because uh, with most of you being in the UK, um, you might see some changes with the police work in London in the future. Um, can you do the next slide? Right, now I've got some examples of the measures that we've taken since I've started my new job. So as I said, it was half a year ago. So it's not been too long, but we've actually achieved some really nice things already. So um, starting now is the implementation of that management system. So we're right now, we're starting to evaluate what emissions do we have, where, and what can we do about them? But we didn't want to wait until we're finished with that because it takes a long time. So the first thing that we did was we implemented a sustainability day. And that means all employees of our um, institution can take one extra day of annual leave if they do something sustainable. So that can be picking up rubbish in a park, that can be reforestation, conservation. It can be to do with social sustainability. So feeding homeless people or working with children, anything that is related to the sustainable development goals. Um, and they can get an extra day of annual leave for that, which is something that I found really, really great and a really good idea to, yeah, just, you know, strengthen engagement and get people to think about sustainability. Um, we did a clear out um, because public servants mostly have been in their jobs for 30, 40 plus years. There's not much change that has been going on. They're really comfy in their offices. Some of them had fridges in their microwaves, electric kettles, radios, even TVs. It was like the living rooms. Um, but with the Ukraine war and the resulting energy crisis, we decided we can't, with a clear conscience, use tax money to pay for electricity caused by over 250 fridges, microwaves and electric kettles that our employees use in their offices. So we put them all out, we send them all, put them all to recycling and um, 
it was hard because many people really resist it. But in the end, we got everyone to see the benefits of it. And that's something that we're really proud of. Um, and then there's small things, you know, we reprogrammed our motion detectors in all of the buildings so that the lights don't stay on for as long. Um, and we also donated over 2000 trees to uh, compensate for the police vehicles that we cannot make sustainable, that we cannot make electric, that cannot be run with sustainable fuels. Um, and that was that was something quite nice because we actually went to the woods and planted these trees um, together with uh, with local authorities. Um, and last but not least, I know we had um, someone talk about plant based diets earlier, if I remember correctly. Uh, we also um, implemented a mandatory baseline for plant based lunch options in all of our um, cafeterias throughout the entire ministry. So all 9,000 people now have at least one veggie day per week, and um, there has to be a vegan option in all cafeterias every day. Um, yeah, so these are a few of the things that we did. Uh, you can put on the next slide just for... Uh, if you've got any questions, feel free to ask right now or reach out to me later. Uh, I hope it was something new that you learned and uh, seeing... Someone work behind the lines was interesting as well. Um, and yeah, thank you for having me on. Thank you so much, Dominic. Can you hear me? Yeah, I can. Amazing. That was so very interesting uh, because it's so interesting to see what government organizations are doing and the initiatives because most of the talks that we've had and most of my experience with things is what kind of more grassroots bottom-up things um bottom-up projects have been enrolled but actually what you're doing uh, with large-scale organizations is so fascinating how do you a thing um your organization compares with for example i know you mentioned working with the london met you've lived in london how does it compare in terms of accessibility to sustainability Ooh, I think um, that, you know, countries are so different in that um, the goals and sustainability, they haven't really been on the political agenda for that long. Well, Scandinavia aside, but they do everything better than us, so we're not looking at them. <laughs> um, I think uh, especially uh, London is a very interesting example because there are so many projects going on but they're just not visible to the, to the general public as much because they're not focused on like central London and the places everyone goes. Um, but the same is true for Berlin as well. You know, there are so many places with so many people going there every year, but all of the good projects, they're just outside in the outskirts of the city and you really need to make an effort to get there, um, right. which, is, which is quite sad. But I, what I am going to say is that in terms of renewable energies, Germany is, I think at a very, very good spot right now because basically anyone can just change their energy provider and have sustainable energy in their homes. Um, so that's something that I really like. And is it at a similar price to non-renewable? Yeah. Yeah. yeah, sometimes it's even cheaper, actually. Wow, that's brilliant. Yeah. And do you think that the government has more initiatives to incentivize people to kind of use public transport or bicycles or maybe vegan food compared to here? Or is it, does, is it similar in comparison? Mm, I think it is more because, I don't know, here it's very common for um, your employer to participate in the cost for like public transport to like um, give you money for it every day. Mm -hmm. um, and also, I think the entire de debate around health has got to do with it a lot, you know, because obviously plant-based diets are healthier as is moving out and exercise, moving and exercising regularly. Um, and these things are quite, quite important in Germany. So I think it might be a bit better than in the UK, um, although I'm not quite sure what the UK actually does. So, um, yeah. So uh, we've got a couple of questions here. Um, let's see. So Michael, who's been very, very uh, interactive, engaged today. So I really appreciate that. Thank you, Michael. Um, he says, given the Ukraine war, do you think Russia would try to sabotage renewables infrastructures and what cyber cybersecurity infrastructures would need to be established to prevent such occurrences? I don't know. What do you think about that? That is quite a question. Um, well, first of all, it might be 
that Russia tries to sabotage these things because obviously they've got an interest in selling their gas and their oil throughout the world. But well, right now they've got bigger fish to fry. And um, then again, I think that it's not really on their agenda as much because they don't really engage in the entire climate, you know, debate. They're not part of the Paris Agreement. They're not part of Kyoto as far as I know. So they don't really care as much. And cybersecurity wise, that's not really my area of expertise, but I know that um, with the Ukraine war going on, we have upgraded our department, um, especially when it comes to Russian cyber attacks, because we are obviously um, helping Ukraine and we are trying to get away from gas and oil and everything. So yeah, it's interesting to see how that's gonna play out in the future for me as well. Oh, well, I'm so glad you had a brilliant answer to that because I don't <laughs> even know where to start. Um, Charlotte says the strategy with extra leave for sustainable work is great. Such a good idea to such a good idea to get people thinking about it. Yeah, yeah. that is so true, isn't it? It's kind of like um, what is this? The equivalent to A level that the European people do, the IB. And um, they've got yeah. extra hours, don't they? They have to do about 42 extra hours of something community yeah. or something voluntary. And it's the same with having, you know, your G, your um, CSR, corporate social responsibility and things like yeah. that. Like it's so, it's so valuable. And I think this should be mandatory for so many people. Uh, things like motion detects sensor lights must make such a big difference. I wouldn't have even thought about. Great to hear. Then um, I think it might be my mom. I'm not sure. It says iPhone. I think it might be my mom. It writes like her. Um, wonderfully motivating, Dominic. These things can be put into practice on a small scale and large scale, and hopefully what there will be better guidance and implementation in all large organizations. Yeah, I think that's so right, because you yeah, said, absolutely. oh, it's just a small thing. But actually, when you're thinking about doing it in every single building every day, that's such a massive thing. So don't downplay yourself. No, no, absolutely. It's, um, you know, it's a small thing effort wise. Um, but the impact is great, you know, because the light, usually it's, I think it was um, 20 minutes or so, like when you walked through a room and it was dark and the motion detector went on, the light would stay on for 20 minutes, even after you'd left the room. And now we've shortened that to five minutes. So mm -hmm. just imagine how much time and how much energy you can save by that. And it's not a big deal. You can just go to whatever person runs the, the electricity in your building and have them program it. Um, yeah. it, may, it may cost a hundred bucks, but it's totally worth it. Yeah, well, my work has taken it too far because if I sit still on the toilet for more than a minute, I have, <laughs> yeah. to, I have to do that. <laughs> yeah, <I know. laughs> no, but it's such a good initiative and things like that, you know, turning the computers off, making everything automatic, automatic taps, all of these things um, make such a yeah. valuable difference when implemented on a bigger scale. Um, and then I think we've just got a couple of minutes. So I just wanted to ask you a bit about, um, I know you've done lots of work in the past about eco-tourism and yeah. you've done some projects. Can you tell us a little bit about what's happening in Berlin at the moment what kind of movements are there and what are your interests in it yeah well um the entire thing is is so interesting because um it's still such a niche market you know the entire sustainable and ecotourism thing is still very niche because um Germans obviously with a with a travel I think we're even worldwide with the people who travel the most um but unfortunately the the you know, average German couple, and especially if they're like older than 40, no offense, but their idea of a holiday uh, is usually to fly into Turkey, stay in a big hotel for two weeks, go to the beach, maybe see something of the city they're at, and then flying back home. Um, and then saying, I've seen Turkey. And I go, no, you, you haven't, because you've seen a hotel and not the country. But anyway, um, and that is the thing, because ecotourism has to do a lot with, you know, staying in small places, staying in owner run businesses, um, not being in big hotel chains. It might not be as luxurious as the vacation that people usually tended to go on, but it can be so enriching because you actually get into contact with the people. You can see the people that live there. You know where your money goes. And um we, you know, when I go on vacation, I try to do as many trips by train as I possibly can. Um, just last week, I was on a business trip and it was only, I know it was like three hours that the appointment took and I took a train back and forth that was like seven, seven hours for each tour. 
Um, but you can make use of that time, you know. I think going by train is so much more relaxed than having to go through security at the airport and all of these things. Um, so it's really about changing your attitude towards travel and what you want from a vacation. Do you want just a quick relaxation at the beach? You don't have to fly to Turkey for that. You can go to Brighton or I don't know. Um, and if you really want to see another country, then why would you not, you know, take the train and go to different places and speak with the people that live there? Um, yeah, yeah. And it's about su su supporting local, small yeah, uh, businesses, absolutely. communities, restaurants, hotels, all of these things, because our yeah. money as Westerners can fortunately go so far when we go to these places. And I think we're so lucky to be able to have that and, and that can make a big impact. So thank you for your work. It's been amazing to see you. I can't believe it's thank taken you, this yeah. for us to have a catch up. Um, but... I know, I know. <laughs> I'll see you, see you, see you next conference. No, I'm joking. I'll call you soon. Thank you so much for all of your work and for your help today. You. <laughs> bye, bye, bye. I love you. Love you too. Have we got Steve here? Yeah, can you hear me and see me? I can hear you and see you. How are I'm you? Right. I'm all good. I just want to make sure that you can actually see me today. So, you know. <laughs> <laughs> No, I can see you great. I can hear you great. We had our first uh, run through a couple of days ago. So I got through a couple of teething problems then. We had a few this morning, but it seems to have settled down. So I'm very happy with the way that the day is going. How are you? Um, how's it going for yourself? Because you're a little bit nervous to begin with, but has it been all right? Has it been quiet? Yeah. I was nervous because you know what I said about I hate technology and mm. uh, it's not my friend. If I could do all of this in person, I would. But one, I wanted to make it accessible for people. And two, I wanted to reduce the carbon emissions with travel to a to a conference. So I thought this was a great way to do it, but it's going very, very well. So this is how I introduced you this morning, mm. um, which was described last week by The Guardian as the NHS worker single-handedly rewilding kelp forests, forests in Sussex. Originally a phys physiotherapist, Steve has taken on the responsibility of growing kelp and planting it back onto the seabeds using its own incredible and unique system which I hope we will be able to have a look at today does that seem yeah. accurate yeah and there's my id as well just to so, say you know to back up the whole <laughs> nhs page so uh really know, yeah so I, I forgot to id everybody else so um <laughs> so I'm glad uh you've proven your identity just bear with me while I just open up your presentation because I'm going to be screen sharing it aren't I yeah, that's right. But no, thank you so much for everyone that's donated and supported the Sussex Seabed Restoration Project because, I mean, um, we, we got to know each other a little bit, probably from finding me on Facebook to begin with. And um, and from that, it's kind of progressed quite a lot. And um, and very, thank you very much today for your donations for the for the Cat Restoration Project. Yeah, it's so kind of everybody. And we've just got a message to say from Boone, who's been here today, saying um, that they've just donated. Um, that's really, really kind. We appreciate it so very much. All right, let me pull this up. Now can I slide show? Lovely. I'm going to share my screen now, if that works for you. Can you see my screen now? Yeah, there we go, yeah. Brilliant. And now from beginning. Cool. Perfect. Bear with me while it thinks. So you're going out and planting this weekend, aren't you? Yeah, I'm going out tomorrow. So um, yeah, I'll be filming it all. So if anyone following this and wants to watch the kind of cat restoration project, I'm on LinkedIn, Instagram and Facebook. So it's just literally just type in the Sussex Seabed Restoration Project and uh, you'll hear me or get my videos or see the restoration project going. And, um, and basically what I do is just keep the story going, keep all the updates going along. So like at the beginning of this presentation, one, I heard the chap in the last chat talk talk about going to Brighton to go and, you know, head down to Brighton and that. Well, the logo of the Sussex Seabed Restoration Project was made by Brighton Beach Lifeguard. So um, she's very passionate about marine biodiversity. She does a lot of snorkeling. So when I said about the restoration project itself, I just said, can we get a nice quirky logo? So obviously in that image there on the right hand side, that kind of represents the kelp and the biodiversity that the Sussex Sea bed once had in the old baseline. 
Go and then go, yeah, go on to the next slide. And in the 1960s, if you play the video, um, my granddad and a lot of his diving mates used to go off the Sussex coastline and actually film what was once uh, intact um, seabed. And like the lady that was writing books and she was saying about what would Sussex once look like if human activity hadn't impacted on the seabed itself, you, you get this kind of whole perfect seabed where it's, it's full of marine biodiversity and all the different plants that are native to the area. I don't know if it's uploading or not. I think it's Seems... Oh, there we go. And filming this kelp bed itself is actually off um, a town called Worthing, which isn't that far away from Brighton. But it shows in this video, it doesn't matter if it doesn't play, but it shows in this video the laminaries, which are kind of the old oak trees of the seabed. Um, and these laminaries would last up to about 15 years and, and supply an awful lot of um, support for the marine biodiversity around it. You can go to the next picture if you like, because that one doesn't really seem to be loading up. And then basically what it was is back in the year 1994, I was going through school and I joined a snorkeling club. And at the time I was always interested in like, what does the seabed look like off my local beach? So um, my granddad was into free diving. So I thought to myself, well, I'll get some gear and see what it's like. So the age of 94 or 1994 I was 12 years of age. And um, this photo was taken outside my grandparents' house and um, off my local beach was a massive kelp bed. It probably disappeared a few human uh, destruction from trawling and dredging and lots of other issues with the seabed. And around nine, 1999, uh, 2000, somewhere around there, we lost that kelp bed. So over all these years of 29 years, I just thought I'd take it upon myself to start doing kelp restoration. And the benefits of kelp restoration is massive. I mean, if you look at these two pictures here, um, one's about the fact that kelp itself can offset carbon five times quicker uh, than tropical rainforests. So basically Sussex has lost 97% of 300 square kilometers of kelp beds. Now, if you think of that per hectare, that's five times more for offsetting carbon than the Amazon rainforest itself. So you, when you think of these great big forests, you think of the tropics, well, the kelps actually need to be in the water. They, they act as such a big absorption of, of CO2. Um, and also they can help um, with depleted fish stocks and, and basically support the marine biodiversity around them. And off Portugal, there's a company called Sea Foresters, and it's a bit like everywhere. We built up our lands and our towns and built on hills and all the rest of it. And it's kind of looking at blue space. So blue space is barren waters that we've destroyed from our own human impacts and actually kind of turning these sea waters or these blue safe spaces into kelp restoration. And in the pioneering days of like my own sort of like techniques or methods or how I was going to do it, I used some of the kelps that we still got, the beds off Sussex, and, and put them back out to the grounds where they've been depleted for like the last 30 years, just to see how well the kelps would take. And if you go to the next slide, this is how they look underwater. So straight away on the left-hand side, we had over 14 different species on a kelp bed that we made, made out of sheep wool last year. And on the right-hand side, we had cuttlefish eggs, placing their eggs within the kelp lines that I put out to sea. So straight away, when people said, oh, climate change is the answer why the kelp doesn't you know, survive off certain spots of Sussex any longer, these, these kelp beds are still out there, these kelp lines, and, and the kelp grew. In some places, the kelp almost tripled in size. So it just shows what the possibility is of actually doing kelp restoration. It's not some sort of myth or can't be done any longer because of climate change. It's basically just going, 
right, let's just get on with it and do it. And that's kind of how my approach is to all of this, just kind of eat a few Mars bars and get in the water and get on with it. So um, yeah, next slide. <laughs> um yeah it's quite actually quite funny doing this on online because you can be a bit more cheeky but uh, normally i'm doing this in front of lots of people um so this is the community of like where i live and the councils also wanted to kind of support it so we did a sort of promenade garden uh the, ma the mascot of the kelp is actually uh undulate ray so one of the girls that wanted to be part of this designed this undulate ray the work itself is on Worthing Pier, um, and that's been brilliant because thousands of people go on Worthing Pier and they can see the display. So it's nice to kind of interact with with people locally as well as like online. So it's good. And then talking about online, I've worked with Oceana Europe, ITV about three times, and the BBC, and being in like you just said, like the local national newspapers and. I think is a bit bizarre that I've got myself to that level because all I'm trying to do is a cat restoration project, but the fact of nobody does anything and just sits around chatting about it, I'm just kind of getting on with it. And um, and because of that, it's been really good to, you know, get that message across on the on broadcasting all my sort of information and reporting it to the BBC and ITV and that because. Um, you know, I had I not used social media, I never would have got to this point uh, today. So it's really good to use social media in a more beneficial way. And then the other thing is I, I do a lot of is I go on tour. I've got like a cinema set up in my car um, where I've got like a big screen and I go around all around Sussex to schools, to surf stores or to restaurants or whatever there is, like old cinemas and that sort of stuff. And I do presentations to the general public to kind of inform them about the importance of kelp and kelp restoration and the benefits it can bring back to the Sussex seabed. And now here comes the educational bit. So I'm going to sound like your science teacher now, but you know, get, I'll give it a go, see, see, see what I kind of get across. But um, yeah, so the next slide. Um, the nice thing about social media again is um, like that seahorse on the left-hand side, uh, isn't from an Attenborough video. It's actually um, taken from a free diver friend of mine. And he took that picture of the seahorse off Selsey, which is in West Sussex. And, and that picture let alone got 40, 24,000 uh, people saw that on, so on my Sussex seabed restoration site. So it just shows you just how much one page can influence society. In the middle picture is from a college or a school in Sussex, and they did a, uh, some artwork to kind of present on their art display along the seafront. And it just highlights the fact that if you get the community behind you or engage with you, it just shows you just how much a little project run at my house can then turn into something so much bigger. And then we come on to the Attenborough video. And in 2019, uh, so Sir David Attenborough also uh, backed the Kelp Restoration Project and uh, it was part of the Sussex Wildlife Trust um, to kind of do the same thing, get across the importance of why kelp restoration is so important for Sussex. And, and it's really nice that this story was made because it actually uh, demonstrates just the right story, not about how it's been twisted this is like exactly what happened to the Sussex uh, coastline and, and I can kind of back that up because I've been in free diving now for 29 years so I've got a good baseline history of the Sussex seabed I hope it works it does. there are magical underwater forests a world of giant sea known as kelp. These underwater forests are among the most productive places on Earth, supporting a huge range of marine life. The forests are vital nursery grounds 
giving sanctuary to the young of many commercial fish as they feed and hide among its fronds. And if you're lucky, you might glimpse a common cuttlefish or the exceedingly rare short-snouted seal. In fact, these forests are so special that they're one of the most biodiverse environments on the planet. Home to thousands of species, from spider crabs searching for food on the forest floor, to lobsters hiding beneath the canopy. Every part of this remarkable forest is used by the creatures here. Bronze are home to tiny animals like these sea birds, filtering plankton from the water. And a place to find food for grazers, like this top shelf. Like coral reefs, the forests create an oasis of life, wherever it grows. It's the perfect place to lay eggs. This mermaid's purse has a baby cat shop growing inside. This is a squid nursery. Each finger-like capsule has more than a hundred young squid inside. We are discovering these underwater forests like, not just for sea life, but in climate change. Reaching up towards the sun, the kelp fronds lock up vast amounts of carbon as they grow. Ian Hendy is an expert on kelp forests. Globally, kelp forests will draw down more than 600 million tonnes of carbon. That's roughly twice the amount of carbon that the UK emits per year. What that's doing is reducing climate change. They stabilise the sediments. They can actually mitigate or reduce wave energy by up to 70%. And as a consequence of that carbon being drawn into the kelp, the kelp will pump out lots of oxygen. So it oxygenates the water and creates a whole biodiversity for lots of wildlife to survive. Once these magnificent forests extended all along the Sussex coast, from Selsey to Brighton. Today, only pockets of this life-generating kelp remain. Casualties of changing fishing practices, which have damaged the kelp's habitat. And other factors, like dumping sediment close to shore, which block the kelp's light, limiting its ability to grow. Now, an exciting plan to regenerate the Sussex kelp forests, led by the Sussex Inshore Fisheries and Conservation Authority, is getting started. The kelp forests along the Sussex coast, and particularly the West Sussex coast, used to be very extensive and very dense. And that's changed in the late 1980s, early 1990s, to the point where today there is almost nothing left. And it's taken place out of sight. And that makes me feel sad. What we're trying to do is, is, is bring that back. There's a huge reduction in presence of fish in this area. And we think some of that can be attributed to the loss of this important habitat. We see it with cut on fish, see it with lobsters, and over the last few years we can see a reduction in black sea bream catch as well. If we want to see the kelp come back, 
is what we want, then we're going to have to give it a chance. So our plan is to push trawling away from the coast out to four kilometres where the kelp forest used to be. We really need these nearshore habitats to be thriving so that the fish can thrive. And we think this will give the kelp forest a chance to regenerate, to regrow, to restore it. If we are successful with this restoration project in Sussex, the amount of marine wildlife that's going to generate again would be just fantastic. We need these kelp forests. We need them to purify the water. We need them to have the nursery function back. And we need them to reduce localised areas of climate change as well. To do something as dramatic as this, as, as far-reaching as this, would, would make me feel very proud. Yeah, so can you hear me now? Yeah, yeah, we're good. Yeah. So basically what happened was I watched that video and that was made in around 2019, so four years ago. And although like our local authorities decided to put this trawling ban in place um, and allow the kelp to naturally rewild itself, because you're talking the space of 300 square kilometres, I thought overnight or over a couple of weeks after watching that video, um, well, that's all good, but I would like to kind of do my bit and get into kelp restoration itself to actually learn how to grow thousands of these plants and get them back in the sea and actually create these micro habitats or kelp restoration. So um, where are we now? So basically two years ago, I started collecting tanks and getting donations from lots of people and on the left hand side in this video um that's one of my dogs and um <laughs> the dog wasn't cleaning the tanks but basically just running around with a sponge all the time um and um and so this sort of project of the sussex seabed restoration started and i registered it with the cic so it's all kind of set up with the accountant and everything like that to and it's a uh, non-profit CIC so it's basically loads and loads of community hours just trying to get community engagement and to build the kelp hub off a crowdfunder is is fantastic it just shows you what you can do on a small budget and I've always been kind of quite positive about trying to achieve things that the government talk about and don't do much about and here I am doing a, a quite a big um, kelp restoration project basically run off of crowdfunders and obviously like donations today. So it just shows you how little things like this can be so possible and so vital for our local environment, especially in the marine and blue space world. So uh, yeah, next slide. And going back to my science head, um, basically to learn kelp restoration, I was, I was we were chatting about this in the week that most of the stuff I learned was from the Americans and the Canadians because their advance with kelp restoration is so uh, broader than the English sort of version. So most of my lessons I learned was online in the evenings after the NHS. I'd get home, chuck a pizza in the oven and then uh, sit there listening to the Americans and Canadian kelp farmers just teaching me how to do kelp restoration. On the right hand side is, is one of my seeded oyster shells. I'm using all biodegradable materials. So nothing that goes in the sea is plastic based or anything that's going to harm the sea. So everything's natural. It's nothing that would actually upset the environment. And you're just basically grafting it back onto the substrates and the seabed to create these new kelp beds. And here's a quick kind of demo of, um, of what kelp does. So on the top left hand side, um, this is the cycle of kelp plants. So they produce sauroid tissue. Those sauroid tissue then releases the spores out of the kelp. Uh, they turn into gametophytes and then turn into sporophytes. And then they basically at the gametophyte or even at the spore stage, they start to settle on the seabed. 
and then at that point they grow into these young kelps which looks like the beginning of the of the first picture and the one below it just shows you the graph so uh, in the winter time is the highest density of spore release in sussex so when the weather's cold or gales or you know you're just sitting in a coffee shop catching up with your mates and whatever like that um the kelps are doing their most active things in the middle of the winter time um and they're throwing out loads and loads of spores because we've only got three percent of kelp left in sussex the density of spores are so low and that's why i built the kelp hub to basically get some of the spores into the kelp hub and then start growing uh these these vital kelps for the seabed and on the right hand side is a map of i've mapped out of sussex at bogner this is our last basically kelp bed it's protect it's protected from a natural reef um so the trawlers could never trawl it all up and for that reason it's the last spot along the sussex coast that holds all our native kelps it's the last spot that actually holds our last four species of kelp which is the hyperborea, the sugar kelp, the laminarias, and the fair bellows. So all those kelps are, are only exist in Sussex on this reef, and they only exist there because human destruction never managed to get onto the reef to destroy it. So it just shows you just how much we've we kind of like destroyed our own seabed. And when you get the saw eye, it kind of almost looks like a cheetah print. It's kind of speckled across the plant itself. This is in my kitchen. And what you do is you basically get those spores out of the kelp by dehydrating the tissues to stress them out and then the spores release. And then behind that picture on the right hand side is a microscope. And what I'm looking for down the microscope for is the spore density to see just how many spores have released out the tissues. So then I know what sort of batch I've got, how many thousands of spores I've got to kind of then mix with other spores and then grow them off cotton lines. So again, nothing plastic based or polyester. It's all natural um, that will biodegrade over time when you put it into the sea. And then in this video here, it's, someone said to me the other day when I was doing a chat, they said, I thought I was looking out a window flying out on holiday because it looks like um, I mean, if you sit next to the passenger window on a plane it kind of got that look to it but if the video is playing i'm not too sure if it's playing or not but basically this is underneath the microscope and it, this is showing the spore release so if you look carefully um next to the brown sort of bit which is kelp um the little white things floating around uh, aren't UFOs, they're um, just tiny little spores. And what they do is they're, they're swim around. Uh, they're actually live. Um, so they're, they're like zooplankton or phytoplankton. They're actually go around trying to find another spore to kind of connect with. Um, and that's the whole cycle of kelp restoration. I film this like I film most of my stuff in the garage. So it just shows you, you know, you don't have to have a massive space. You just need to kind of set it all up and, and learn how to do cat restoration and all of a sudden you're kind of well on your way to doing restoration itself and then the next video and basically from from um the kelp itself the spores this is um sugar kelp which is actually quite a pretty plant i think because it's um it's got quite long fonts um, and this just shows you, this one here is a sheep wool um, kelp bed we made last year. This is the one that had over 14 different species of marine life. Um, these are those little sporophytes in the garage and um, just showing you just how dense the kelp restoration project in my garage is coming along, just showing you the coverage of kelps on, on the oysters themselves and on the biodegradable lines. And so far, they've been in the tanks now for about eight months. So this coming summer or spring or even tomorrow, uh, I'll start deploying them in the water to kind of create these kelp beds. And then go to the next slide. 
And in the chili, I think it was in January, actually, I swam out to a ground which has got a mussel bed underneath it. And I, I've got so many spare plants, like so many spare kelps or sporophytes that I've already been releasing them in the sea over the winter time just to get rid of some of them because like a greenhouse, if you're growing loads of tomato plants in a greenhouse, sometimes you've got to thin them out a bit so the plants grow a bit more. So all the spare ones I've been taking out and putting into the sea just to kind of allow them to rewild themselves. Um, they actually graft onto substrates quite easily. So I'm hoping to see some of this evidence in the water this summer. And I think we're at the end of the, uh, the actual presentation, which is quite good because I was, have been uh, clock watching because I knew that we had to get this all in in 45 minutes with some questions and showing you all the kelp pub as well. So there we go. That's brilliant. Is there anything else there? I think that's it. Yeah, that, that's a wrap. What good tiring to the minute. <laughs> yeah. I did say to you, um, I, I just whiz around and uh, yeah and then I was just looking at it to make sure that we hadn't gone over time so you know so it's good that's absolutely brilliant thank you so much for putting that together is that a presentation that you made for us or is that one that you generally show uh what I do is that's like the backbone of it and then I whatever new updates I've kind of ping out a few of what I think's not relevant now and then put the new the new ones in so I'll kind of keep the Attenborough video because it's quite important to kind of tell you the history of it and because it's got that Atterburn effect, then it feels like people are going to take more note because everybody knows what his, his voice sounds like. Um, and then the rest of it, yeah, me as a kid or whatever it is. And then whatever I've got new, like a new cow bed, like that sheep wool one, I'll put that in there because that's my latest thing I've done in the seabed. So the more I can kind of get across and the more it kind of shows what the project's all about. Yeah, and how do you feel about putting them out tomorrow? Like, how does that whole process make you feel? Oh, yeah, it's always good. Like, I spend most of my evenings fiddling around on free apps on my phone, just trying to put the latest video together. And what I wanted this project to be uh, with, like, say, 8,000 followers is the fact that, you know, when you hear this, like, chat, oh, we're going to now give someone or some company three million pounds to do something, and you never hear anything? What I'm always about, like probably being an NH work, NHS worker, is that I'm like on the ground floor. I've got to kind of start doing stuff to make a change. So I look at this cat restoration project as the same as Mikhail work. I try and actually physically do something and then show people the response of actually doing something so they can go, oh, okay, we donated that money to him. I can now see where that's gone, what's happened, and it's all evidence-based and that's how I've kind of put the project together. Yeah, yeah, it's absolutely incredible, isn't it? So, I, because I found you on Facebook because I am an avid Facebooker, as you've probably seen all of my spam. Um, how do you engage volunteers? Because so many people do want to get involved. How does that work? Yeah, that's my hardest bit because obviously it's the kelp restoration in the sea. There's so much health and safety to get people into the sea. Um, so what I've what I'm trying to do is say to people, if you want to go snorkeling on the grounds that I'm basically making, um, I'll tell you where they are and you go in your own time because running a CIC is so difficult to kind of get people that are so desperate, like kids and all the rest of it, to, to go and do it and you're kind of liable for their safety. So yeah. I've always said, like, follow it online because it's basically, you know, the story of it going along. I do community engagements all around uh, Sussex so people can kind of catch up and and kind of feel like they're part of part of all of it. Mm. But the actual physical bit of getting in, people into the water, um, I did loads of it last year, but there was just too many different, uh, like we probably did about 10 different snorkeling engagement days, but it's easy to just say to people all oh, their different levels, just go and do it when you want to go and do it and, and come and visit the, the, the sort of kelp beds. And what are they doing then when they go out? They literally go and do that. You know, if I say this year with kelp restoration, like there's going to be a lot more doing, like a lot more kelp restoration this than, than last year. Um, so people can literally just go to the spots that we're, we're doing restoration sites on 
and um, and actually go and have a snorkel and see the marine biodiversity over it. So amazing. Yeah. Have you thought about doing any kind of um, like sampling projects based on the life? I know you get your footage, so you'll be able to give us a kind of gross idea about what kind of things there are there. Mm. But obviously, it's getting really big now. So have you thought about maybe getting the schools or local marine? see people who like to go out to do any kind of sampling or like identification and stuff like that is that anything that you've thought about or that you do yeah so like uh kind of in the last sort of answer like if people wanted to do like say eDNA to, to see what might have been in the kelp bed um or if like say the university students if they wanted to do their dissertation on it or whatever it might be um they could literally go all right okay well this is new to this area let's go and kind of take some baseline statistics of what's going on in that kelp bed so basically it can kind of unfold in that way obviously i haven't got enough time working in the nhs to kind of help their their sort of studies or cultures or whatever it might be but at least i'm kind of putting something back so people can benefit from it more than just kind of the actual kelp restoration itself yeah, yeah, yeah. It might be worth 100%. You, you can't take, I don't know how you uh, manage to juggle so many things, um, but it might be worth maybe spamming the university. They've got such a good marine biology department. Say like, can you sample, can you ID, you know, and just do like, we when we go out and do our diving sampling, um, it's literally about, you know, when you're going out and doing a snorkel or having a dive, just about counting numbers of things, telling yeah. people what to count and telling people what to do and putting it into a database. Yeah, I've donated some of those sporophytes to Sussex University. So oh, yeah. they're they're doing at the moment these tests with the sporophytes. I feel so sorry for them. Um, but um, <laughs> they're trying to work out how much uh, sediment would block out the light for the kelps not to grow. So basically they're smothering them in all sorts of different, uh, yeah. I don't know, water qualities That's just to see, yeah, yeah. see which ones they might grow best at. So then they, so if they did start to kind of learn how to do cat restoration, what, what areas of Sussex where there's high pollutants or whatever it might be, sedimentation, where would they survive and where would they not survive? So they can kind of get a bit of an idea of where these plants would establish themselves. Brilliant. And looking at where to put them on a bigger yeah. scale. That's absolutely incredible. Um, and are you able to show us your setup? Is that possible? Yeah, I'll, I'll take this off Wi-Fi. This is the Kelp Hub and uh, like if I just talk through it, like these ones are all ready to go. They're all um, oyster shells with the kelps growing on them. And you can probably see the plants actually attached to the actual oysters themselves. The setting is on the same as what the sea temperature is at the moment. So it's like 8.1 degrees. And all, all of this has all been paid for from the crowdfunder or donations. And then here is the biodegradable lines that I mentioned before. So if I say, for example, Cotton move that the way, you can see the actual plants all on the lines. Wow. And then on, um, and then on this set of uh, tanks here, we've got green gravel. So it's all been grown on uh, gravel. And then new oyster shells, like the larger ones for the reefs of Sussex. We've got lots of reefs off here. So the bigger the shell, the more plants I can get back onto the reefs. So you've got all the different substrates for the different grounds. So, and then the, in these nets here are loose uh, sporophytes, which are just basically just be deploying them just to kind of like disappear into the muscle bed so they can kind of reroute themselves out of the muscle beds. So yes, yeah, so there's quite a lot of uh, work all the time going on in here. And that's why it's difficult to do this as a community thing because it's basically in your garage and uh, there's only so much time you can kind of get people over here. So I try, I try and do a little bit with the community, but obviously it's very difficult when it's in your garage, if that makes sense. 
yeah 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 this is such an insane setup it looks absolutely perfect and it looks so technical but you make it look so very easy and you've got an overabundance of spores that you're literally having to give them away and put them away yeah I don't, I don't know how it has actually been so easy because um I'm not a very good plumber but that doesn't leak <laughs> so I got I don't even know how it even like works so well um I it's not something I would ever get this much luck doing something like this so it, it's kind of worked out really well if that makes sense so I assume because it's sea temperature you don't need any heaters or filaments or anything yeah you uh you filter out the water you need down a to yeah you get rid of all the muck in the sea water so you take it down to one micron uh then you uv blast the water so you kill all the other bacteria in it so you're basically just got the nutrients left in the seawater and you have to change it every week so like say tonight when when it's high tide i go and get a load more seawater it takes me about to do all those tanks it takes me about 12 hours just to clean those tanks out every every week um to to purify the water to carry on giving them enough nutrients for the plants to grow so yeah so i'll probably take 18 hours a week just to kind of do that kelp hub so that yeah. makes and yeah. keep it Plus going. you're working full time as a physio. Yeah, so I just do it little and often all the time. Just, yeah. So I don't have like the end of the week I'm thinking, oh my God, my whole weekend is now going to be out restoration. And you can't sleep either because you've got to be rechanging the water. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I try, I've, I've worked it out. But now we've gone to the restoration bit. I beat those tanks will slowly start emptying themselves out and I'm trying to deploy all of it out of all those tanks by middle of July so wow. so the kelp hub will be empty by middle of July come September October the new batch of spores are ready and then you do the next cycle does that mean so, you go on holiday in July then <laughs> yeah it means I get 18 hours of my life back each yeah, week exactly. after that. well actually probably yeah it probably will be after july because obviously i'll be deploying it all between then so yeah be very busy the next couple of months so yeah, yeah. It sounds it it's such an incredible job are you enjoying it yeah um as it's progressing um i'm not doing so many more tv stuff because it just takes too much time up but um but yeah at grassroots level i love it oh you just do um, the guardian and itv and the news now <laughs> yeah yeah, but this week I got asked to go on Country Far and I just said I can't. I was literally too busy. Do you know what I mean? So, yeah. um, so this is more important because everybody wants to seek out restoration. If yeah. I'm a bit too busy doing all this media stuff, yeah. then I'm going to be my worst like person to not actually carry on doing the work that everyone wants to see. So, yeah, so basically I just said to everyone, I'm not doing any more evening chats or kind of taking the 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 presentation on the road i'm just going to literally get on with cat restoration now for the next four months yeah fair enough it's all very well having the publicity i mean it's, yeah. a, it's kind of a double-edged sword isn't it because it's all very well having the publicity but actually you're already doing the maximum that you can with yeah, the funding yeah. that you have but also yeah. sometimes those opportunities can get the funding so i guess it's trying to balance that out as yeah. well how do you do it? I know that you said about donations and things like that and the uh, fundraising through crowds, um, through Kickstarters and stuff like that. Is there any other way that you apply for funding through larger organisations or do you leave it at um, individual levels? Um, yeah, like I've gone to Fatface because they've got quite a, a big uh, sort of proposal for the marine environment and they're doing seagrasses at the moment with Hampshire Wildlife Trust um, down at the Isle of Wight and in the Sodent. Um, so they they put quite a lot of money into this one percent to help with rewilding projects. Um, yes, yeah, so I'm hoping to get connections with them, and I'm meeting up with the Sussex Wildlife Trust at the end of next month. So I'm going to see how we can collaborate, work together, and maybe do more citizen science stuff to try and get this to work for them and for me, if that makes sense, and see how it progresses from there. So yeah. Yeah, of course, because there was a nice slide in there where you obviously take your projector out and show uh, organisations what you're doing. Is that through schools as well? Are you doing any engagement with schools? Or Yeah, I filmed with the uh, 
was it the National Farmers Union, and we made a film that went out to a hundred and eighty thousand school kids. So, um, oh so yeah, so <laughs> I'm definitely working with the schools. <laughs> <laughs> that's brilliant. Well, link us that video if you have it. And then the last thing yeah. I want to um, want to ask was there was a lovely infograph on there which had a cartoon of your face in the middle of it, and then a bit about your work. Oh yeah. Yeah. Who, who made that? Somebody that did that artwork um, from one of my presentations in Brighton um, at okay. Philistair. Um, did one at Philistair and she she was just there. And I was actually looking at her because she was like, well, I know this stuff down. I was thinking, what's she doing? But she was kind of like just kind of thinking about her art and how that was going to link up with stuff. And yeah. other people have done like portraits of Sir David Attenborough um, and then sold them to give me the donations from their profits sort of thing so there's lots of different things because it's an Attenborough campaign yeah. um, it's amazing how much people will creatively think about what they could do to try and get this cat restoration project going yeah that's brilliant so it's been really good publicity for you guys but nothing that you have to add an additional workload I guess yeah um, just people's just creative mind of how they could want to help yeah, so, yeah. And then the last thing that I wanted to say just before I start the last presentation of the day, which is just talking about buckets of love, is um, yeah, you mentioned you were just coming home and uh, after your day job and then just watching kind of videos from the state. And that must be because there's a huge kelp forest. And obviously we've got kelp forests, but we're a very small island comparatively to the states. And they've got the Florida Keys and stuff, which have a lot of kelp forests. Um, are they similar in terms of biodiversity and stuff like that? Is it similar to, to use that as a model? I think the thing is what England doesn't know or doesn't deal with the fact that, yeah, fair enough, the California coast right up towards Alaska is full of, of kelp and the rest of it. But because of their government policies, their governments will pay out to do active restoration because it's our it's their heritage. It's what what they want to re rewild their seas. Yeah. And in the UK, um, because of ours is run by the Crown Estate and the Marine Management Organization. There's no money from government to help this grassroots level to do Cape restoration because from Newcastle all around the all around our UK waters, we've lost so much of these biodiversity kelp beds. But there needs to be a sort of platform in place from government to say, right, seagrasses, kelps, or or any sort of native species that need uh, rescuing, basically, and rewilding, there needs to be some sort of policy out there to actually be able to get money to help this whole massive issue of climate change and that sort of stuff so uh, the americans and the canadians are a lot more advanced with all of this yeah and, and we are so far behind yeah because i guess they are kind of renowned for having the kelp forest and their lobster farms and things like that but it's not anything that england specifically has ever been famous for is this kelp when actually we've got so mm. much of it that needs to be preserved because if you yeah. go to Scotland when I've been doing basking shark conservation the conservation groups are very 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 heavy on their kelp restoration because they recognize yeah. the benefit of it as a carbon sink so there's a lot yeah. more emphasis there yeah. not seeing anything about it in England but Scotland seems to be quite yeah. proactive so and also Scotland doesn't they're not the their rules are a lot more softer because it's not run by the marine management organization whereas in the UK or sorry in England we've got to get through all this red tape and and then that's what's the that's what's the blocking point of when we talk about our country and how much we want to bring back marine biodiversity yeah. these these are basically uh things in in place that basically don't allow us to do so much work because it's not set up correctly yeah 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 and charlotte and uh, let's end on there charlotte has just said amazing looks so great and such good work so that's to you that's some cold sea uh, <laughs> yeah you've got to get your whim hop on i imagine and then speaking of attenborough there's a new program wild isles on at the moment wonder whether any of those episodes will feature something along those lines yeah and hopefully it will do and hopefully that will raise some more awareness about the benefits of us conserving the kelp forest so thank you so much steve i think we've just actually reach 420 pounds and um, so hopefully uh, we can add a little bit more to that today thank you to everybody that's donated thank no, you thank, so much, thank you so much for all your donations and follow the pages because i make sure i keep everything up to date because of what people will donate it's important to them it's important to me yeah of course of course thank you so much for your work no bye. worries thank you see you later bye bye bye, bye.
All right, thank you, everybody. So that was a little bit about what we are going to be um, contributing to today and amazing projects that people are doing um, have been showcased today. And I greatly appreciate that. So at the moment, I'm going to be sharing my screen again and pulling up uh, Buckets of Love um presentation about what we're doing and how we help other small charities so let me just figure out how i can share this and where my things are and this will be sadly actually because i've been enjoying the day so very much this will be the last presentation of the day so thank you to everybody that stuck around and here is buckets of love presents conversations in conservation part three so here we go so buckets of love and it's my baby and so many of you do come to the events and donate to the events and share your um time and your talents and your energies and it's just been such a fun journey so actually buckets of love was started on a family holiday to India is when we started uh, brainstorming, when we were all sitting in the back of a bus and just chatting about how we can um, best put together some ideas that had been brewing and make it a little bit more formal. So my mum and I ended up taking out um, just scarves and, and bottles of water to the homeless and some snacks and things like that uh, in India and Delhi. And it was chaos. It was absolute chaos. And then that made me think about how best to make projects culturally congruent which is really very difficult because you know we want to be helping so many different communities and we've got all these amazing ideas um and it just goes to show that sometimes you need to think about what the needs are of the locals in that environment as we've discussed so frequently today so then buckets of love developed through that and it started originally with red buckets in schools and hospitals and in unis to pop just non-perishables and small items that we could take out and wrap up to the homeless and it started off with just a few presents here and there and we were going out um doing let me share this a bit bigger can i do that slideshow yeah, lovely. So it started off with just us taking all out coffee and things like that to the homeless and then started uh, bringing out presents and socks and gloves and scarves. And then we branched out into other fun things. So inherently, I want Buckets of Love to be a community organization that we all work towards to try and just do small amounts of good regularly and to bring us all together and for that purpose i think it's been doing an absolutely amazing job and i'm super happy with it and i'm very grateful for everybody's time and efforts what do we do so this was a little uh, poster that i made in december so i published it on my social media things on buckets of love on the 1st of January, just as a thank you. And this is a little wrap up of what's been happening over the last few years. And actually since then, we've probably got to about, uh, so we did 850 for Forest uh, last month. And then now we've got 400 and something now. So we're over 11,000 now. And I think with regular events, so we can keep doing, you know, I, I'm as if we raise the thousand each time, I'm happy with in-person events um, online. Uh, you know, I'll take, I'll, I'll take, I'll take whatever we can get. So anything like this is absolutely amazing. Raising over four hundred pounds just from us sitting and coming together and having a really chill day is amazing. But we're on about eleven thousand pounds now, and um, that, and I think that's amazing considering we've just been having loads of fun. So what have we done? We've taken about. 150 presents out to the homeless. We've provided clean water to 1,300 people in South India. We've had over 15 brilliant acts for our music fundraisers. We've got a grant from Veg Fund for our first film screening, which was sold out um, over 60 people. And people were, you know when people scam people for tickets, for fake tickets? That was happening online, which is mental, you know? <laughs> People were trying to get tickets for it because it was sold out. So, you know, that's something I need to be wary about. That's something I've never had to think about, but that I think that's the sign of a, of a, of a popular event. 
we had a day of yoga, acupuncture, massage, meditation, personal training, and lots and lots of yummy food at our first wellbeing day. We've cleaned up three nature reserves with what about 20 big bags of rubbish now. Um, I pre presented at over 10 conferences and festivals, but actually now that's coming up to about, since the start of the year, that's coming up to about 20 conferences and festivals. By the end of the year, it should be about 25. And um, we've had loads of speakers today for conversations and conservation, which is just, hopefully you think it's gone as well as I think it's gone. And I think it's just been an absolutely magical day. We've had my brother and my sister helping me out so much with technology because I hate it. And uh, we've worked together hundreds of people um, to, to do these activities. So I couldn't have done it without you. These were the little homeless burritos and they've got, you know, a toothbrush, toothpaste, um, vegan cereal bars, a juice, and some plasters, sometimes like a painkiller or something like that, and just some snacks. So yeah, just cute things, and they're warm socks, and we take them out all of the time. Oh, I've got a few here, actually. Yeah, this is one. If I go into Central, then we always take these out, but you know, they're a the nice scarf, um, and everybody just donates amazing things. So if you've got anything like this, then just let me know, because there's always a purpose for it, and we can always take it out. And yeah, these are our list picking walks. We had so much fun. That was such a good day. It was really, really wholesome. This was uh, rain and marshes. And we've also been to a couple of other RSPB reserves around. So that was a great day. Actually, I should have just got some funding from Johnson & Johnson through Maidstone and Tunbridge Wells. They wanted me to write a uh, proposal about bringing staff out to do litter picking walks and they said that they would give me funding for food and stuff afterwards so hopefully that's something that's going to be a regular thing and I'm going to actually get some funding for our bits and bobs. This was our first charity wellbeing day which was magical and um, some of you guys did workshops and it was lovely and I've got my second one coming up this summer so I can't wait for that it was a lovely day. This was a book that I wrote with one of my best friends, Dr. George Whitaker, um, and we've donated £1,500 to charity so far just by collecting stories, and that's really great. If you want to buy a copy, then it is through Just Think Eco, where all of the money goes to NHS charities, so that was a fun project as well. And this is so special to me. This is the well build in Tamil Nadu through Drop for Drop, and it just looks so magical. They've sent me so videos, so many videos of it. And it, there was nothing there, you know, they had to walk 10, 20 kilometers to just have a clean water source. So I'm really excited about this project. And this is the little plaque that they put on the well. And this is the little tribute they did on the opening day where everybody was throwing petals and things. So yeah, this was really magical. And this was probably our biggest project yet, but um, I hope to do some more. This was our sold out charity film screening where we showed Carnage by Simon Amstall. It was hilarious and brilliant. And it was a very successful evening at the beautiful independent world cinema. World as in to world, not world as in planet. So just coming back to why we are doing this and why things like this are important and why, you know, I'm so invested in this in this project and in this this whole experience of bringing people together is because mental health is such a big issue um, at the moment. And I think external stresses um, with, with everything are making things so much worse for people and it's difficult to know where to find help and it's difficult to feel connected and you know there was so much social isolation for people and even though we're so together people can often feel very alone in this and you're not um lots of people know what you're going through so just feel free to reach out to people and say you know I need to go for a walk or I need to uh have a phone call or I need to just go out and do some litter picking or go out and volunteer you know it doesn't have to be anything big but just connect if you feel like you need it in order to uh preserve your mental health and just check up on each other as well so this is something that I've seen massively among the elderly in this country, and it really shocked me after having worked in Spain in nursing homes and in Sri Lanka in hospitals and orphanages, because it is a massive problem in this country, which is actually growing as we westernize other countries. Traditionally, lots of countries and societies have used uh, grandparents, parents, children, kind of living close together as a kind of like communal 
um, as a communal atmosphere and as a communal kind of lifestyle, but we are, we seem to be losing that. And that's something that's really affecting elderly people because I see a lot of old people that don't have any families that come and visit. They, they, they often, this is a bit bleak, but they often die alone in hospital. Um, you know, I've done so much work in geriatrics and it's something that I will never forget is that lots of people are alone. But we've got amazing organizations like Age UK and, you know, Mind and lots of charities that are doing things about this. Um, but is there any way that we can connect our communities and bring people together in order to reduce any risk of social isolation and loneliness? And as I said, I love a good infograph. It's always colorful. It does the work for me, but I always make sure that they're reputable. So this is produced by the WHO. So this is a pandemic that they are really concerned about because loneliness can have physical health implications and physical health consequences as well. So I think what I want to wrap today up with is to go out and do that thing that scares you. If you've been thinking about starting a project or joining a group or um, starting a movement or registering your organization for something, um, then just do it, just go for it. You know, what's the worst that could happen? Just um, just, just take the opportunity, make the most of it and, and try the course that you wanted to do or the class that you wanted to do because the worst thing that could happen is just that you don't go back or that you don't enjoy it and that you try a new thing. Um, so yeah, it can be really scary to join a community group full of strangers, but actually the best way to make friends is to, is to, is to meet people and to go out and connect with people that are like-minded as well. And so I just really want to encourage you to go for it because it can be life-changing. So I love this photo. This was from our recent uh, gift wrapping for the homeless. And uh, we had a great evening and we just went to the pub for a few drinks. This is the Woolwich Equitable and they always let us use their upstairs area. So a big shout out to them. And yeah, we wrapped up about 30 presents this year, which wasn't as many as last year, but I'm finding it really difficult to take them out in the evening. Uh, so if anybody wants any presents for the homeless, then you know where to find me. And upcoming events that we've got so please save the dates I mean I've got one confirmed date so far so that's our fourth annual drum and bass fundraiser they're always so much fun they always bring amazing musicians and people together everybody always helps out um, and it's just it's always an incredibly magical day and that's on Sunday the 16th of July at the Fox and the Firkin which is another pub which always lets me um, use their space and I swear I make them a loss but they don't mind because they are so kind and we've got a second well-being day coming up in September where we'll have yoga, massage. I'm hoping that somebody will do some Reiki, some acupuncture. We'll have some painting and I'm going to get the hot tub sorted. Uh, secondhand hot tub on Facebook Marketplace. I'm going to get that sorted um, again for the season um, in a couple of weekends. So that should be a good job done. We've got a second film screening coming up and I'm going to use the world cinema again because they were absolutely brilliant and Mike who um, owns it and runs it was so very helpful and then coming up later in the year we've got a couple of events uh, litter picking walks obviously and then the social and charity auction which is going to be a new one for me but I'm very much looking forward to that. So yeah, feel free to reach out, to get involved, to say hello, to let me know what kind of projects you're working on. Feel free to network with anybody that's spoken today to see if you guys can collaborate or if you want to rack anybody's brains. I know I do, so I'm going to be spamming everybody with a lot of questions and help seeing if um, you guys can help me on my career in conservation as well. So thank you so much coming today and if you haven't then please um just do drop us some money in the just giving that will all go to the sussex seabed restoration project thank you so very much for joining today i can see about 11 comments here now in the chat so i'm just going to open that up before we wrap up Let's see. Ashton Brett, yay. Buckets of love for life. Yeah. Um, oh, thank you. Thank you. That's very kind. Congrats. Lots of hearts. I have many partners that can help you in the projects that you're doing. Let's have a private session together to explore this further. Yes, please, Michael, let's do that. Let's have a chat. Um, I've got a big GP exam in on the 24th. So I'm just going to try and spend the next couple of weeks getting through that. But then after that, hopefully the rest of the world on the kelp, um, on the kelp idea, the rest of the world will be my oyster. And 
Lovely. See you all again next time. Bye. Thank you so much. Great talk, Ashani. Thank you, Jambi. I love you. Thank you for the event today. Impressive lineup of speakers. They were, weren't they? They were incredible. Everybody has been brilliant. Charlotte, thank you. Thanks with gratitude. Thank you so much. Thank you, Shani. Dominic, keep up your work. You too. Amazing human. You too. Thank you so much. Such an inspirational day. All right. Thank you so much, guys. I'm going to stop sharing my screen. And I will end it on that. Thank you so much for joining everybody. It's been an amazing day. I hope you've enjoyed it as much as I have. And um, buckets of love. Bye. Happy Saturday. <laughs>